irrationality. I remind you of the, of the myth of the statesman, where it is explained that human rule over men, human government, is necessary in that period in which the God has withdrawn from the government of the world. That is to say, in a period in which reason does not rule. Now, will this beginning be characterized by complete irrationality? But the Athenian looks at the beginning in the light of the grievous effects of human life as we know it. Viewed in that light, the beginnings appear to be rather good. Now, this is in conformity with the view which suffuses the conversation of the three old men, that the good is the old, and hence the best is the oldest. That's to say the opposite of what I suggested shortly before, complete ir irrationality or the best. We must see how the Athenian overcomes this difficulty. And so let us, um, let us turn to the text. Unless you, I have not succeeded in making clear the fundamental difficulty underlying this whole, whole um, section we are going to read. On the one hand, the suggestion of complete irrationality and the other of being best. What is the true situation? Now, Mr. Sh uh, Sh uh, Mr. Gary, will you begin to read this? Athenian, so much for that then. Now what are we to say about the origin of government? Would not the best and easiest way of discerning it be from this standpoint? What from standpoint? this, then, from which he will go with the text, which he will go, is going to explain. Yeah? from the following standpoint, I might say. Yeah? Cleinias, what standpoint? Athenian, that from which one should always observe the progress of states as they move toward either goodness or badness. Cleinias, what point is that? Athenian, the observation, as I suppose, of an infinitely long period of time and of the variations therein occurring. Cleinias, explain your meaning. Athenian, Tell me now, do you think you could ever ascertain the, t the space of time that has passed since cities came into existence and men lived under civic rule? Cleinias, certainly it would be no easy task. Athenian, but you can easily see that it is vast and immeasurable. Cleinias, that I most certainly can do. Athenian, during this time, have not thousands upon thousands of states come into existence and on a similar computation, just as many perished? No, let us stop here for a moment. He did not say, say unambiguously that there is an infinite time, but surely be, it is m much longer than any man can count, and also the human race is immeasurably old. But cities have come into being and <coughs> perished and undergone other changes to our knowledge, as we have observed. And therefore, cities are not always. The human race and time is always, at least as far as we know. Yeah. And have they not, in each case, exhibited all kinds of constitution over and over again? And have they not changed at one time from small to great, at another from great to small, and changed also from good to bad, and from bad to good? He does not, he mentions all kinds of changes, of course, with the exception of local change. Ordinarily, a city, if it changes its place, is no longer the city it was before. 
it could happen, but it's unlikely. But qualitative, quantitative changes, as well as coming to beings and perishings, different way of then we know. Yeah. Pliny's necessarily Athenian. Of this process of change, let us discover if we can if we can the cause. For this perhaps would show us what is the primary origin of constitutions as well as their transformation. Yeah, that is a hard sentence, isn't it? That we want to discover the cause or the ground of this change coming to being, getting smaller, getting better, and so on. And if we know the cause of that change, we will know what the beginning of a political life is. Yes? Cleinias, you are right, and we must all exert ourselves, you to expound your view about them, and we to keep pace with you. Do you consider that there is any truth in the ancient tales? Plinius, what tales? So, in other words, the ancient tales to which he had not referred hitherto are not said to be simply true. They may contain some truth, and even Plinius agrees with that, that they are not simply true, which is very important in the light of what we have seen at the beginning. The Lord. Yes. But the world of men has often been destroyed by floods, plagues, and many other things, in such a way that only a small portion of the human race has survived. Pioneer. Yeah, this is not, in, in other words, the human race is always, but there are catastrophes from time to time in which almost the whole human race perishes. Why the human race doesn't perish as a whole, that is not stated here, and it is uh, not never explicitly stated by Plato. And in, in other ancient doctrines, it was the opposite was assumed, and in, on the basis of this argument, if almost the whole human race can be destroyed by a catastrophe. Why should not be the whole human race in this way be destroyed? It's not quite easy to give an answer to that. But Plato and Aristotle assume that there will always be a, a small remnant. Yeah? Plinius, everyone would, would regard such accounts as perfectly credible. Athenian, come now. Let us picture to ourselves one of the many catastrophes, namely that which occurred once upon a time through the deluge. Yeah, we are to a flood. So in other words, there are many through various kinds of causes, and now they will consider a single one, and the one which has occurred through a flood. Alternatives are not considered here. Not any flood, but one particular flood, which is of which they know through the ancient speeches, ancient logo. Yes. Plinius, and what are we to imagine about it? Athenian, that the men who then escaped destruction must have been mostly herdsmen of the hills, scanty embers of the human race, preserved somewhere on the mountaintops. Plinius, evidently. Athenian. Moreover, men of this kind must necessarily have been unskilled in the arts generally, and especially in such contrivances as men use against one another in cities for the purposes of greed and rivalry and all the other villainies which they devise one against another. Aquinas. It is certainly probable. Athenian. Shall we assume that the cities situated in the plains near the sea were totally destroyed at the time? Fine. Let us assume it. Now, one could perhaps translate somewhat more literally. Let us posit that. That is one particular assumption because there is an alternative that is discussed in the Tamils where the destruction 
happens through a fire. And then where the people living on in mountains or mountains are destroyed and those living in the plains are preserved. Why the Athenian concentrates on the destruction by a flood that must appear from what follows. He has not given an explanation. Only has indicated that this is not necessary to begin with the flood. It could also be a catastrophe of a different kind. Yes? Athenian. <laughs> Shall we say that all implements were lost and that everything in the way of important arts or inventions that they may have had, whether concerned with politics or other sciences, perished at that time? For supposing that things had remained all the time ordered, just as they are now, how, my good sir, could anything new have ever been invented? Plinius, do you mean that these things were unknown to the men of those days for thousands upon thousands of years, and that one or two thousand years ago some of them were revealed to Daedalus, some to Orpheus, some to Palamides, musical arts to Marcius, an Olympic Olympus. and Olympus, lyric to Amphion, and in short, a vast number of others to other persons, all dating, so to say, from yesterday or the day before? I think, are you aware, Aquinas, that you have left out your friend who was literally a man of yesterday? It is Epimenides, you mean. Yes, I mean him, for he far outstripped everybody you had, my friend, by that invention of his, of which he had the actual, of which he was the actual producer, as you Cretans say, although Hesiod has divined it and spoken of it long before. Mm -hmm. so the, the fact that we know of the first inventors of the various arts proves that there, that there was a time in which no arts existed. Um, and then he mentions altogether seven such first inventors. And in the center we find um, Marcius, who as is not said here, as we know from elsewhere, who contended with Apollo for wisdom and was indeed defeated by Apollo. But still, Apparently, Marcius was the first inventor. This is of some interest to the view what to what we have heard about Apollo in the uh, in the first two books. Yes, Aquinas, we do say so. Athenian, shall we then state that at the time when the destruction took place, human affairs were in this position: there was fearful and widespread desolation over a vast tract of land. Most of the animals were destroyed, and the few herds of oxen and flocks of goats that happened to survive afforded at the first but scanty sustenance to their herdsmen. So that seems to suggest fear, solitude, scarcity, almost like a Hobbian state of nature, that we must wait. Yeah. Um, Phineas, yes, Athenian, and as to the matters with which our present discourse is concerned, states and statecraft and legislation, do we think they could have retained any memory whatsoever, broadly speaking, of such matters? Phineas, by no means. Athenian, so from those men in that situation that has sprung the whole of our present order, states and constitutions, arts and laws, with a great amount of both evil and of good. Yeah, much wickedness, but also much virtue. So if this much wickedness and much virtue has arisen later, then in the early stage, there will be without any virtue or vice to speak let us see whether that is correct. Aquinas, how do you mean? Athenian, do we imagine, my good sir, that the men of that age 
who were unversed in the ways of the city life, many of them, uh, many of them noble, many ignoble, were perfect either in virtue or in vice. Aquinas, well said. We grasp your meaning. So, uh, uh, they were neither good nor bad against both Hobbes and Rousseau. Yeah. Athenian, as time went on and our race multiplied, all things advanced, did they not, to the condition which now exists? Aquinas, very true. Athenian, but in all probability, they advanced not all at once, but by small degrees during an immense space of time. Aquinas, yes, that is most likely. Yeah, that is stated more than once, that it took a very, very long time. And that is the important ingredient of the argument, as we will see later. Yes? Uh, Athenian, for they all, I fancy, felt, as it were, still ringing in their ears, a dread of going down from the highlands to the plains. Plinius, of course, Athenian, and because there were so few of them round about in those days, were they not delighted to see one another? But for the fact that means of transport whereby they might visit one another by sea or land had practically all perished along with the arts. Yes, intercourse, I imagine, was not very easy, for iron and bronze and all the metals in the mines had been flooded and had disappeared so that it was extremely difficult to extract fresh metal. And there was a dearth, in consequence, of felled timber, for even if there happened to be some few tools still left somewhere in the mountains, they were soon worn out, and they could not be replaced by others until men had rediscovered the art of metalworking. So we see at any rate this, these early men were not so filled with distrust of one another as they would be according to Hobbes, but precisely because they were so solitary, they were glad to see other human beings. Yes. Um, Plinius, they could not. Athenian. Now how many generations do we suppose that had passed before this took place? Plinius, a great many of the death of Athenian, and during all this period, or even longer, all the arts that, we, that require iron and bronze and all such metals must have remained in abeyance. Finally, of course, Athenian. Moreover, civil strife and war also disappeared during that time, and that for many reasons. Finally, how so? Athenian. In the first place, owing to their desolate state, they were kindly disposed and friendly towards one another. And secondly, they had no need to quarrel about food, for they had no lack of flocks and herds, except perhaps some of them at the outset. Yes, that is not an, a not unimportant a clause, except some of them at the beginning, perhaps. Now, there might have been great scarcity at the beginning, and with the consequence, of course, that they would fight one another for this handy means of livelihood. Yes. And in that age, these were what men mostly lived on. Thus they were all well supplied with milk and meat, and they procured further supplies of food, both excellent and plentiful, by hunting. They were also well furnished with clothing and coverlets, and houses, and with vessels for cooking, and other kinds. For no iron is required for the arts of molding and weaving, which two arts God gave to men to furnish them with all these necessities, in order that the human right, race might have means of sprouting and increase whenever it should fall into such a state of distress. So uh, God had given them the arts of weaving, and forming, but they also had fire. Apparently, the fire was not given to them by the God or by a God, 
whether this is an allusion to Prometheus' theft of fire, one cannot say, but it is strange that the, the origin of the fire is not indicated by the origin of the two other, by the two other arts is. Yes? Consequently, they were not excessively poor, nor were they constrained by stress of poverty to quarrel one with another. On the other hand, since, there were, since they were without gold and silver, they could never have become rich. Now, a community which has no communion with either poverty or wealth is generally the one in which the noblest characters will be formed. In it, there is no place for the growth of insolence and injustice, of rivalries and jealousies. So these men were good, both for these reasons and because of their simple-mindedness, as it is called. For being simple-minded, when they heard things called bad or good, they took what was said for gospel truth and believed it. Gospel truth is, of course, an addition of a modern translator. <laughs> For well, none of them had the shrewdness of the modern man to suspect a falsehood. For they accepted as true the statements made about God and men and ordered their lives by them. Thus they were entirely of the character we have just described. Yes. So they were rather good people. But perhaps we should now first consider how the Athenian knows all of these things. Especially also that it took such a very long time to develop them. Now, uh, the men of Plato's age, or the men of Socrates' age, had made, had experienced very profound and very quick changes, which had taken place after the Persian Wars. You find this described, for instance, in the first book of Thucydides. The enormous, the quick change in naval warfare and other matters in this period. And a comparison between present-day Athens and ancient Athens, or between present-day Athens and old-fashioned Sparta and other retarded places in Greece. Please, they are the starting point for the argument which says that the much slower changes in former times must have required much longer times for the emergence of cities in general and of Greeks as Greeks and so on. Yes. Aquinas. Certainly, Megillus and I quite agree with what you say, Athenian. And shall we not say that people living in this fashion for many generations were bound to be unskilled as compared with either the antediluvian or the men of today, and ignorant of arts in general, and especially of the arts of war as now practiced by land and sea, including those warlike arts which disguised under the names of lawsuits and factions are peculiar to cities, contrived as they are with every device of word and deed to inflict mutual hurt and injury, and that they were also more simple and brave and temperate and always more righteous. And the cause of this state of things we have already explained. Yes, yes. now uh, there is a um, a statement about their moral superiority to present-day men. They are more, they, and all the four cardinal virtues are, in a way, mentioned. They are more courageous, more moderate, and more just than we are today. But they are not said to be wiser, instead of wise or more prudent. They are called simple-minded, good nature, a word which easily comes to mean silly, but which we can translate simple-minded or good nature. So they have no wisdom of any kind, no good wisdom, 
or evil wisdom. Now, from this, we can draw an inference that these early men did not live in the Golden Age, in the age of Kronos, as it is described in the myth of the statesman. For there it is said that the judgment on the age of Kronos depends on whether men in that stage philosophized or did not philosophize. It is implied they could have philosophized. Men in the state of, of in the golden age, in the age of Kronos, could philosophize. Whether they availed themselves of this opportunity is another matter. These people could not have philosophy. And therefore, they did not live in the golden age. Yes? Pliny's quite true. Athenian, we must bear in mind that the whole purpose of what we have said and of what we are going to say next is this, that we may understand what possible need of laws the men of that time had and who their lawgiver was. Yes, now we must watch Gilman. Hmm? Pliny's, excellent. Athenian, shall we suppose that those men had no need of lawgivers, and that in those days it was not as yet usual to have such a thing? For those born in that age of the world's history did not as yet... The world's history doesn't, of course, exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did not as yet possess the art of writing, but lived by following custom in what is called patriarchal law. Yeah, ancestral law. Yeah. Uh, so there was no legislator there. That's an answer to the question raised by the Athenian immediately before. There was no, no lawgiver. Yes? Aquinas, that is certainly probable, Athenian. But this already amounts to a kind of government. Aquinas, what kind? Yeah, the word which it translates government mm -hmm. is polytheism a political order, a regime. So they, there was already a political regime, a regime there. A regime without laws. Yes. I think everybody, I believe, gives the name of headship to the government which then existed. And dynasteia in Greek, from which the English dynasty comes and which uh, a term which is used also by Aristotle in his politics for designating a certain kind of oligarchy. But um, I would leave it as the word dynasty after, because it will become clear from the context of it. Uh, and it still continues to exist today among both Greeks and barbarians in many quarters. And of course, Homer mentions its existence in connection with the household system of the Cyclopses, where he says, no halls of council and no laws of theirs, but within hollow caves on mountain heights, aloft they dwell, each making his own law for wife and child, of others wreck they not. Uh, Finance. This poet of yours seems to have been a man of genius, we have also read other verses of his, and they were extremely fine. Though in truth, we have not read much of him, since we Cretans do not indulge much in foreign poetry. McGillis. But we Spartans do, and we regard Homer as the best of men. All the same, the mode of life he describes as always Ionian rather than Laconian. And now he appears to be confirming your statement admirably when in his legendary accounts he ascribes the primitive habits of the Cyclopses to their savagery. Yeah, so, um, Megillus hadn't spoken for a very long time, as you may have observed, but here he comes in because Homer comes in, and the Spartans know Homer better than the Cretans do, that is it. And what is the, the point which he makes is this, that Homer, has traced the antiquity, the old-fashionedness of the Cyclopean life to their savagery. 
So this first stain was one of savagery. And if one reads the context in the Odyssey, one sees easily, if one doesn't remember it, that the, these were not the Kiklopas, were not people who liked to see strangers because they lived in solitude. And they were even cannibals. So this is a, a very clear statement about the very hard and uh, not a non-moral non character of the early life. The Megillus and the, uh, the Athenian agrees with Megillus' understanding, of course. Yes? Athenian. Yes, his testimony supports us. So let us take him as evidence that polities of this sort do sometimes come into existence. Plinius, quite right. Athenian, did they not originate with those people who live scattered in separate clans or in single households owing to the distress which followed after the catastrophe? For amongst these, the eldest holds rule, owing to the fact that the rule proceeds from the parents, by following whom they form a single flock like a covey of birds, and live under a patriarchal government, and a kingship, which is of all kingship the most just. Yeah, this, this kingship, what is that? This seems to be post-Kiklopian, but that is doubtful, as will appear from the secret. At any rate, here we have a clan, ruled by the elders, and uh, they are a kind of natural herd. Kobe is, in, uh, in Greek, that is herd. It's a kind of natural herd, as distinguished from the herds of cows and goats, the composition of which is determined by human beings, which is not here. And there is the, the rule of the oldest is kingship, and of all kingships, the most just. This is in accordance with the principle, the best is the oldest. We must keep this in mind, how it could be so good in these circumstances without wisdom, and that remains to be seen. Yes? Aquinas, most certainly. Athenian, next, they congregate together in great numbers and form large gro larger groves. And first they turn to farming on the hillside and make ring fences of rubble and walls to ward off wild beasts, till finally they have constructed a, a single large common dwelling. Aquinas, it is certainly probable that such was the course of events. Athenian, well, is not this also probable? Aquinas, what? Athenian, that while these larger settlements were growing out of the original small ones, each of the small settlements continued to retain, clan by clan, both the rule of the eldest and also some customs derived from its isolated condition and peculiar to itself. And those who begot and reared them were different. So these customs of theirs, related to the gods and to themselves, differed being more orderly where their forefathers had been orderly, and more brave where they had been brave. And, and, and no, that is not quite right. More orderly when they had been, or, uh, had been more orderly, and more brave when they had been brave. So they were, in this early state of time, they were brave people, a plenty. But there were not people who could be said simply to be orderly, which, which orderly cosmiotis, that is, covers almost the same ground as uh, moderation. This one could not expect. Yes? And as thus the fathers of each clan in due course stamped upon their children and children's children their own cast of mind, 
these people came, as we say, into the larger community, furnished each with their own peculiar laws. Cleinias, of course, Athenian, and no doubt each clan was well pleased with its own laws, and less well with those of its neighbors. Cleinias. So in, in the clan, the same kind of laws is always is preserved. They know of no other law. And if they had known of them, they would have rejected them. Hmm? What? Uh, Cleinias, true. Athenian, unwittingly, as it seems, we have now set foot, as it were, on the starting point of legislation. Cleinias, we have indeed. Athenian, the next step necessary is that these people should come together and choose out some members of each clan who, after a survey of the legal usages of all the clans, should notify publicly to the tribal leaders and chiefs, who may be termed their kings, each of whom usages please them best, and shall recommend their adoption. These men will themselves be named legislators, and when they have established the chiefs as magistrates, and have framed an aristocracy, or possibly even a monarchy, from the existing plurality of headships, they will live under the constitution <coughs> thus, thus transformed. Plinius, the next steps would certainly be such as you describe. Now, what uh, kind of regime do we have here? There are a number of clans which have settled together. And then, um, since this is inconvenient that each clan has its own customs, there must be some, at least some common laws. And what do they do? They um, select some men who should choose the best from the different customs of the different clans and propose them as code for the whole community. And then, if they are adopted, if they are adopted, that is, by the fathers, and then they will become the law of the community. And that means that at the same time a regime is established in which no, there is no longer a single ruler, as it was before, but the fathers united are the rulers. Patres conscripti, as the Roman senators they are called. The fathers call together, they form the rule, and therefore it is an aristocracy, and when he adds it may, may also sometimes also kingship, uh, kingship, but then the king would simply be a magistrate and no longer the ruler of this of the community as he was in the earlier stage. Yes. Um, the whole development here sounds a lot like the the development of the United States from the time of the first settlers who lived as Hobbes. Them in a state very close to savagery. Well, that's the time no, when they they there was no cannibalism, was it? No, but the elders from each state came together in a constitutional convention. And yeah, but there was, were they not, did they not have a charter? Was there not a well, king or queen of Great Britain behind that whole thing? I mean, in other words, if we abstract completely, from Great Britain, and think that the, the North American colonists uh, they are not subject to any government, and look at the arrangement they made among themselves, one could find some features which were minor of this. All right. Um, yeah? So that would lead us to the question of why is it that we talk about aristocracy and monarchy, and we don't talk about a republican democracy? as one of the possibilities arising from this kind of 
coming together. To yeah, but that is, I mean, if you uh, want to uh, speak of a republic, this is a republic. Because the, uh, by republic, I believe, you, you understand, a regime in which power is in the hands of more than one. Or to use my Scobian formula, a body of man, not just one man. Yeah? Uh-huh. If it is one man, it is a monarchy. If it is a body of man, it is a, it's a republic. Is this not what you mean? Yeah. It's a body of man. No. It is a republic. But um, he says aristocracy because there is a great difference between an aristocracy and a democracy. And here there could not be a democracy in that state. It would be chaos. Uh, you know, he, well, no one would have dreamed of that. Uh, they were all brought up in obedience to ancient custom and obeying the elders. Uh, they would not, they couldn't imagine that um, a declaration of independence of the younger brothers. Yes. Yeah. This which city? Of pigs, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's all right. Uh, there is a certain a subtle difference, I know, but um, I always hear that we hear it called city of pigs. Mm-hmm. But but where is there a Socrates and Glaucon and a diamond as is found? Here. That's one difference. Yeah? And there are some others that they they have lived in perfectly peacefully together. No war. And so if you consider only the nice side of the Kiklos, you could say there is something which reminds of the first city. But you be able also to consider the other side, although the other side is only intimated, not explicitly presented to Yeah, but in the city of pigs there is no government. And here there is, they live together as a fraternity and without a government. Here they have a government. So the, 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 the Kiklops rules the, his children and wives. Yeah? Uh, he quotes a verse from Homer in uh, 680b. But uh, we will take up the question of um, the Republic a little bit later. There is something, uh, so, uh, of course, a connection between what is said here and what is said in the Republic. Yes? Uh, I just wondered if uh, the Athenian had dropped the search for the cause of this process No, it, it is in a way that comes up later more and, and uh, goes to the whole book. But he has already answered it. He has already answered it, I believe. What is the cause of the change? Pardon? Yeah, but what does he presuppose as a cause of the ch- of these changes of this development? Well, he says more of the things that change. There are actually uh, new orders. The old orders have to uh, disappear over the. No, he's. What does he say? Um, 
about the first stage. Well, they, they were rather poor, were they not? And they, um, they lacked every art and every wisdom, didn't they? Well, except for the ones that did not Yeah, even they had only, in, in a very limited arts, these two arts mentioned, they were not wise in any serious sense of the word. So they were very imperfect. Does it not make this clear? And is this imperfection not the cause of that change, of the changes you discussed, and of all changes which take place at any time and in any place? If they had been perfect at the beginning, then it would be hard to understand how they could ever left that blessed state. Well, that may be a necessary condition, but is it sufficient? It seems that's a necessary condition for change, but it doesn't seem to me to be a cause. The lack of and need for the arts and virtue that is the cause of the change, which he, I think, suggests. I didn't hear you. That's what he meant by condition. Yeah. And yeah, that uh, is effective as long as uh, that is an implication here, as long as there are human beings, there will be no progress in the arts or in virtue in which this imperfection is not still present, perhaps rendered invisible for considerable time, but still uh, smoldering and uh, breaking out in unexpected quarters. Justice is not necessarily the best, but all right. Um, let us say the justice. Hmm? Because in all other cases, there may be uh, doubts of the legitimacy, as we say. In all other cases of kingship, or later cases, there may be doubts of legitimacy. Well, look at the, at the Shakespeare's histories. Here you have cases of usurpers, obviously, you know, like Henry the Fourth, uh, uh, Richard the Third, and as so on. Or if they are legitimate, not as usurpers, their legitimacy can be questioned on the ground, on other grounds, as in the case of John. Yeah. In the Middle Ages, they made a distinction between tyrant because he lacks a proper title, or a tyrant on account of the exercise of legitimate government, you know, the tyrannical exercise of government. So both grounds are there, always there in. Um, the Shakespeare's history, uh, which forces us to question the legitimacy. And if one would go beyond this few hundred years of English history, still in the Shakespearean place, I believe one would, would ultimately arrive at something like Tempest, like the Tempest, in which 
you have an unquestionably legitimate religion or a rule, the rule of Caliban, I'm sorry, of Prospero, of uh, Caliban, and of course also Miranda and Fabian. But this is not an early king. And what I think what Plato has in mind is that in all later kingdoms there is something questionable. It's less unquestionable as in this primitive uh, kingdom. Correct. They they know uh, only one of the members of the clan, and justice consists in doing um, well by them. Uh, those outside, uh, that um, is a matter of indifference in this sphere. I mean, there may be some uh, clans which are nicer and or, and chase foreigners only away, and others may be less nice and may kill them. But this does not affect the whole political structure at this stage. And now they soon, the clan soon finds out, or after centuries finds out, uh, that it is too weak uh, to defend itself, say, against two a particularly um, large clan, you know, there may be a family as someone who has generated many more children than the patriarch of another clan. And so they think it is better to combine. And if they combine, they, they insist, of course, that each retains as much as, as possible its independence. And that means that the, that the headman of the clan is a member of the sovereign body. And then you have, uh, say, N clans. The sovereign body will consist of N members, the senate. Yeah? These are not so completely strange things. I mean, in the foundation of, the, in, of this country, the preservation of state rights is, of course, a certain analogy to this. Yeah. Shall we go on? So, Mr. Gary? Uh, Finally, the next steps would certainly be such as you described. Athenian, let us go on to describe the rise of a third form of constitution. Yeah, that are... is always regime, yeah, uh, uh, politeia. Yes. A third form of regime, in which are blended all kinds and varieties of regimes, and of state as well. Finally. Yeah, the, what's, what's the distinction between um, regimes and cities here is that it's not quite clear. It's, it, surely it is not made clear. So we come now uh, to the third. We had uh, the di dynasty, that is the Kiklopian rule. We had the aristocracy. And now we have the third. And what is that? Uh, the same that Homer himself mentioned next to the second, when he said that the third form arose in this way. His verses run thus. Dardania he founded when as yet the holy keep of Ilium was not built upon the plain, a town for mortal folk, 
but still they dwelt upon the highland slopes of many fountains of Ida. Indeed, these verses of his, as well as those he utters concerning the Cyclopses, are in a kind of unison with the voices of both God and nature, for being divinely inspired in its chanting, the poetic tribe, with the aid of graces and muses, often grasps the truth of history. No, oh, the things which actually happened. Huh? Often grasp the things which actually happened. Yeah, which truly happened. Truly happened. Plinius, it certainly does. Athenian, now let us advance still further in the tale that now engages us. For tale is here the Greek word mythos, myth. That's of some importance. Yeah. For possibly it may furnish some hint regarding the matter we have in view. Ought we not to do so? Plinius, most certainly. Athenian, Ilium was founded, we say, after moving from the highlands down to a large and noble plain on a hill of no great height, which had many rivers flowing down from Ida above. Plinius, so they say. Now let us see here. Now we have the third city, and the third city is and not defined by any general characteristics, except that that it is in the plain. That is that is general. But otherwise it is not defined. It is um, defined only by the identification with Ilion, with Troy. Here is where Homer comes in, of course, with particular importance. Troy means also the Greeks, and the Greeks will become the theme of the rest of the book. The chief Homer makes possible a graceful transition from men in general to the Greeks. The Greeks are from a certain moment on presupposed. And nothing is said about the genesis of what we can call Greekness. Homer dispenses that opinion from any such uh, consideration. But the whole uh, presentation is, while graceful, uh, not fully clear and true. Therefore, he calls it myth. Yes? Yeah. This what he puts now, that is the fourth stage, not the third. What, what we are 682 A at the end in mm -hmm. English. Now let us advance the third. Yes. That is now stage four, not three. Yes, it's stage three. Now let me see. That is still. That is no. No, that is stage three. Yeah. Stage three. First. Pardon? No. 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 The three stages are. Settlement on mountain tops. Yes. That stage two, settlement on mountain slopes. Yes. Three, settlement in plains. I thought that when it falls too much, yes. Yes. Now let me see. The first is the kettle of tea. And this, uh, and what is the second? Well, the combination of plants. Yeah, but this is also, uh, Homer has something to do, because he says that which Homer too may intimated after the second. So Homer must have intimated also the second. But for the second, there is no Homeric Quotation. There is only one for the first, and for the 
for uh, for this one. For yeah, but could one not understand this? That's a, that's a reference here. It's not by what what in these verses is said. Yes, is spoken immediately of the foundation of Dardani, Dardani, and not of of Ilya. But is that the main point is Ilion was not yet founded in the plain, and hence that is the third stage, the founding of Ilios in the plain. Yeah, I, I mean, and mountain slope, mountain slope. So this, this quotation then would have both the second and the third. Yes, that is good. And therefore, he doesn't have to have a special homeric quotation for number two. Yes, that is true. Yes, and that is also that Homer mentions together after the second. And because he has mentioned here, mentions in these verses quoted here, both the second and the third. But it is, but it is, he found it down there, da, 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 it's mentioned in Aeneas' speech. And that, I think, yes, I think what, what this gentleman said is an explanation for the difficulty that we have no call. We do have Homeric references for all three. But the references to number two and three are given by one and the same quotation. Yes? Or is there any difficulty regarding this one? No, I'm not clear about that. I think that when you say letters are found, you sort of draw elements to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that is with the further progress of the myth, with the further progress which has already taken place, our risk. Um, but which has just now taken place, yeah. which has just now taken place through the, through the reference to, uh, to stages two and three. Yeah. Yes. Arclanius. So they said, Athene, and do we not suppose that this took place many ages after the deluge? Arclanius. Many ages after, no doubt. Athenian. At any rate, they seem to have been strangely forgetful of the catastrophe now mentioned, since they placed their city, as described, upon a number of rivers descending from the mouth, and relied for their safety upon hillocks of no great height. Aquinas. So it is evident that they were removed by quite a long interval from that calamity. Okay, so that, in other words, the earlier men, the savages on the mountain tops and on the mountain slopes, had still some recollection of the calamity, of the flood. But then gradually the the flood is forgotten, and therefore also the fear is forgotten. And then, therefore, they are able to descend in the plain. And I believe that it means also something more. When men live in cities, they must have a faith in the fact that the city, the city will last, last forever. As in ancient times, at any rate, cities regarded, or nations regarded themselves as lasting forever. And now what the Athenian does here is to question this tacit premise of ordinary political life the everlastingness 
of this one city by enlarging the horizon, by thinking of that infinite, immeasurable time before this city or any other city we know of has come into being. And this enlarging of the horizon is necessary if a profound change in the city is to be made there one can no longer be satisfied with this desirable view and desirable faith in the everlasting character of one city. And such a profound change will take place within the course of the laws, as you will see at the end of Book 3. Yes? Finance, the fourth. Athenian, and these cities also made a tax on Helium, probably by sea too, as well as by land, since by this time all made use of the sea fearlessly. Cleinias, so it appeared. Why he says, um, um, perhaps uh, also by sea, it's not easy to see, because after all the, the Greeks came to Troy, uh, via the sea, whether he... Um, I do not understand that. If the story of the Trojan War is true, there must have been um, a seafaring at that time. Yes? So, uh, so it appears, Athenian, and after a stay of ten years, the Achaeans sacked Troy. Finius, very true. Athenian, now during this period of ten years, while the siege lasted, the affairs of each of the besiegers at home suffered much owing to the seditious conduct of the young men. But when the soldiers returned to their own cities and homes, these young people did not receive them fittingly and justly, but in such a way that were that there ensued a vast number of cases of death, slaughter, and exile. So they, being again driven out, migrated by sea. And because Darius was the man who then banded together the exiles, they got the new name of Dorian instead of Achaia. So, in other words, there is, the Dorians have not migrated into the Peloponnesus. Uh, in the so-called Dorian migration and came in as a new people. But the Dorians were always there. They are autochthonous. That is Plato's version here in, uh, of uh, the history of, um, of the early history of Sparta. The Dorians were only the formerly expelled Achaeans, not a new nation. Yeah. Isn't that sort of a swear on the Dorians? No, it's a compliment. That was regarded in, in ancient times as a, a great privilege to be autochthonous. And on what ground? Then one, then one one's ancestors had not conquered the land from other people, you know, and therefore the possession was altogether just. That is said somewhere in Plato, I believe, I, but I don't remember now where. But this is the reason why autophony was regarded as such a great thing. Yes? But as to all the events that followed, you Lacedaemonians relate them all fully in your tradition. Yeah, in your myths. Yeah. So that from a certain point on, the, the myth based on Homer is continued by the myth told by the Spartans. Yes. Uh, Megillus, quite true. So now you will see that Megillus comes in quite naturally and um, is very much in the foreground throughout Book 3. Naturally, because Sparta is discussed.
Yes. Athene, and now, as it were, by divine direction, we have returned once more to the very point in our discourse on laws where we made our digression when we plunged into the subject of music and drinking parties. And we can, so to speak, get a fresh grip upon the argument. Yeah, now, that, um, uh, yes, no, it's okay for one. We have come back uh, to this subject of legislation from which we have digressed for so long by discussing music and symposium. And uh, according, as it were, according to a god, if formerly, when he spoke of Homer in 482a, I think it was, he said that Homer spoke according to a god and according to a nature. Here it is not said according to nature. Uh, one can say it is um, according to a special providence. But he says, as it were, according to a god. The special providence is exercised by the Athenian stranger in the interest of the interlocutors, he wants to bring back, uh, bring them back to the subject of legislation. Yes? Um, now that it has reached this point, the settlement of Lacedaemon, about which you said truly that it and Crete were settled under kindred laws. Yeah. The... Yes, but Crete will be completely forgotten. They will speak only of Sparta. From the wandering courses of our argument and our excursion through various polities and settlements, we have now gained this much. We have discerned a first, a second, and a third state, all, as we suppose, succeeding one another in the settlements which took place during the vast ages of time. And now there has emerged this fourth state, or nation, if you so prefer, which was once upon a time in course of establishment and now is, is established. So now let me enumerate again. There are four cities. The first, the Cyclopean. The second, the aristocracy. Or the city on the mountain slopes. The third, Troy. Or the city in the plain. And the fourth is Sparta. Now, what the peculiarities of Sparta are, uh, we will see very soon. But one of you mentioned the Republic a short while before. In, the, in a way, in the Republic, there are also four cities. If one considers the fact that the Timaeus and Critias are the sequel of the Republic. Then we have in the Republic first the city of Thebes, then the super Sparta, and then finally the city in which the philosophers rule. And the fourth is ancient Athens, as it was according to a tale of an Egyptian priest. And here we have also four cities, but the fourth is not ancient Athens, but ancient Sparta. To that extent, I believe there is a direct connection between the arrangements in both worlds. But there is not this simple correspondence that you could say the first city is like the Cyclops and so on. It's not that. Yes? Well, there's a city, the Critias, I mean, the Atlantis, which is the Atlantis. But that is not, they belong, but here, but it is said for the sake of, say for the sake of Athens, isn't it? Athens defeated Atlantis. And that uh, for, for some reasons of his own, uh, uh, Plato uh, presented Atlantis more fully uh, than ancient Athens, of which he had spoken briefly in the in the Tamil. That's not a matter. Yeah, well, 
No, no, no. No, ancient Athens, as presented by the Egyptian priest, or Critias, <clears throat> is meant to show that the best city of the Republic is, has been Athens. And since Athens was so wonderful, she must be shown, her grandeur must be shown in the greatest imaginable deed, and that was the defeat of Atlantis. Now, that is a kind of super Peloponnesian war, and um, super um, Sicilian expedition, you know? Also a big island in the west, but that big island is much, much bigger than Sicily, you know? And uh, that is, I think, the connection. <laughs> yes? Now, if we can gather from all this which of these settlements was right and which wrong, and which laws keep safe and what is kept safe, and which laws ruin and what is ruined, and what changes in what particulars would affect the happiness of the state, then, O Megillus and Clinius, we ought to describe these things again, making a fresh start from the beginning, Unless we have some fault to find with our previous statement. Megillus, I can assure you, stranger, that if some god were to promise us that in making this second attempt to investigate legislation, we shall listen to a discourse that is no worse and no shorter than that we have, which we have just been listening to, I, for one, would go a long way to hear it. Indeed, this would seem quite a short day although it is, as a matter of fact, close on to midsummer. You know, wait a moment. <laughs> the Athenian say, says now, uh, has said in his last speech that they will examine the Spartan arrangements and distinguish what, which are good and which are bad. You know, that was a great question formally, whether one could criticize these venerable institutions. But there is no longer any opposition now that has been um, um, that right to blame Spartan institutions has long been granted. Now, the McGill says, um, speaks of the fact that this day now, and they are walking to the cave of Zeus, is almost the longest of the year. But later on it will appear that the Athenian sketches complete legal code for a new for a new colony to be founded. Therefore he needs a very long day in order to elaborate the code. But on the other hand, a single day is sufficient if the day is sufficiently long, for elaborating a complete code by a competent man, as I think in stranger must be supposed to be. Yes? Athenian, so it seems that we must proceed with our inquiry, Megillus, most certainly. Athenian, let us then place ourselves in imagination at that epoch when Lacedaemon, together with Argos and Messene and the adjoining districts, had become completely subject, Megillus, to our forefathers, they determined next, according to the tradition, to divide their hosts into three parts and to establish three states, Argos, Messene, and Lacedaemon. You see, he hit first the theme on Argos, Messene, and now he changes his to Argos, Messene, Lacedaemon, and that he preserves also in the next speech. Messene is in the center. Does this make sense in such a context? Is it between uh, Lacedaemon and Argos? And no, no, Messene is to the west and Argos to the north. Oh. No, but Messene is the most important in the context. What happened to Messini? 
that was conquered by Sparta, and the, the Mycenaeans became the famous healers. You know, the, deprived of all rights and they are kind and uh, treated in a rather, rather nasty manner by the Spartans. The Athenian, in his delicacy, doesn't say a word about this unfortunate happening, but uh, we are uh, reminded of it by this arrangement. Yes? Megillus, very true, Athenian. And Timinus became king of Argos, Cresphontes of Messene, and Procles and Aristenus of Lacedaemon. Of course, Athenian, and all the men of that time swore that they would assist these kings if anyone should try to wreck their kingdoms. Megillus, quite so, Athenian. Is the dissolution of a kingdom or of any government that has ever yet been dissolved caused by any other agency than that of the rulers themselves? Or though we made this assertion a moment ago, what we happened when we happened upon this subject, have we now forgotten it? Megillus, how could we possibly have forgotten yeah, it? Where, where did they say it? That is a question which, which is very, um, which is in a way impossible to answer. They had not discussed it in these terms that every kingship or every government is only destroyed by intrinsic causes right? and not from the outside. And that is a thesis which occurs in the Republic and also elsewhere, but it hadn't been mentioned here in the laws and surely not a short while ago, unless one will say that the discussion of the symposia implies that the rule is that the symposium will function if a sober man rules the drunkards and the symposium would degenerate only if the ruler of the symposium would get drunk himself. Um, and this is, there are perhaps other possibilities. But another point which the translator doesn't bring out is that at the beginning of this speech, of the Athenian. The Athenian swears and calls on Zeus. He, I think he didn't bring that out, did he? No. Yeah, that is interesting because it is here that we, you have seen there are very few oaths hitherto in the laws. This is the third one. And there were two in the second book. But in this context, one, one could say this reference to Zeus or to the gods in general has this function that no god, to remind us of the fact that no god presided at the establishment of that Peloponnesian confederacy of which he speaks now. And I believe that can be proved because the next oath occurs in 691b where the Athenian swears by the gods and shortly thereafter in 691d the Athenian says some god seem watching over you, Spartan, has established the dual kingship among you. So here there is apparently some connection between the oath and the, the presence of God as the establishment of Sparta. And therefore I'm inclined to believe that the earlier oath here in 683e, has something to do with the absence of a god at the establishment of the confederacy, of the, of the general Peloponnesian confederacy. Is there any point you would like to raise? It's a pity that there is no, no uh, uh, 
a book in which you can look, I have find complete lists of the oaths that would, well, of course, well, even if it were, one could not trust it implicitly, uh, even if it had been made by a computer, but uh, it would be of some help. So we wait until we come to the other oath. Hmm. who came to live together, and that they, for each clan, followed the, its ancestral custom. The guardian gods themselves of the Cyclops, because the Cyclops believes, of course, in God, and so they believe in God, it's already there. This belief seems to have survived the loss of all art. But, as the story of the cyclone shows, there was no respect for God, or worship of God, in that early stage. That respect emerged only with the decline of the original subject. The fact that belief in God is, is all there from the very beginning. This is in agreement with what we learn from the Republic. In the so-called city of pigs, which is the first city there, they sing hymns to the gods. Whereas in the final city, the beautiful city, a city of beauty. They sing hymns to the gods and praises of the virtues. There are no praises of the virtues in the city of pigs because there are not yet virtues met. And uh, so this is in a full agreement uh, with the law at this point. Now I think we should now turn to the beloved of last time. And this is 683E7. It was 196. So this was, what he discusses here is the Peloponnesian Confederacy. That was the fourth stage. And the first was the city on mountain top, the settlement on mountain top, then settlement on the hillside. Then the settlement in the plain, Troy, as an example, and fourth, the Confederacy, the uh, Confederacy, Argos, Messene, and Sparta, with Messene in the center, uh, because that is the tender spot, as far as Sparta is concerned, what she did, what she did to Messene. And here, shortly before, in 683E3, there occurred the third oath of the Athenians. And I think the meaning of that will become perfectly clear from this sequence. So let us now begin there. Magellan, how could we possibly have forgotten the Athenians? Shall we further confirm that assertion now? For we have come to the same view now, as it appears, in dealing with the fact of history, so that we shall be examining it with reference not to a mere abstraction, but to real events. So now, well, the fact of history is, of course, a, a, a preposterous sensation. Why, why are facts not enough? What, what is added if you say facts of history? And uh, that is, of course, not there. And also abstractions, isn't there? We, we have not, we shall not uh, uh, seek uh, the same speech regarding something vain, something insubstantial. Now, what, what happened? What were these facts? Now, what actually took place was this. Each of the three royal houses and the cities under their sway swore to one another, according to the laws, binding alike on ruler and subject, which they had made. 
the rulers, that as time went on and the nation advanced, they would refrain from making their rule more severe. And the subject, that so long as the rulers kept fast to their promise, they would never upset the monarchy themselves, nor would they allow others to do so. And they swore that the king should aid both kings and peoples when wrong, and the peoples aid both peoples and kings. Was not that the way of it? Magilla, it was. So in other words, there was something like a contract of government between the government of the, and the people. But here it's a bit more complicated because three different states were involved. And so, the, they say, the Spartans, kings and demons swore that they would come to the help of the king or people, say, of Messene. If anything, if their king uh, or perhaps an outsider had wronged them. Yes? In the book, legally established, whether by the kings or others, in the three states, was not this the most perfect principle? Magilla. What? Athenian. That the other two states should always help the third, whether it disobeyed the, whenever it disobeyed the laws laid down. Magilla, evidently, Athenian. And surely most people insist on this, that the lawgivers shall enact laws of yeah, most people, that let us translate into many. It's more little. Mm -hmm. And surely the many insist on this, that the lawgivers shall enact laws of such a kind that the masses of the people accept them willingly, such as one might insist that trainers or doctors should make their treatments or cures of men's bodies pleasurable. Magilla, exactly so. so. This means, this is important, this demand made by the people, the demon, is that the laws should be acceptable to them. And that is about as reasonable as if someone would impose on gymnastic trainers or physicians that they should tend and heal the tended body in a way pleasurable to the men in training or to the sick. And that is, of course, none, because cutting and burning cannot possibly be pleasurable. Now, this did not exist, it seems, at the beginning of the Tribunation Confederacy. How does he go on? Athenian. But in fact, one often has to be content if one can bring a body into a sound and healthy state with no great amount of pain. Very true. Yeah. So uh, uh, that explains uh, fully what I'm thinking. We yeah. understand from here the somewhat cryptic remark that Athenian made earlier that the very first kingship, which is later on identified with that of the Cyclops, is the most just of all. The reason is there was no demon. And therefore, king, the ruler, did not act unjustly however he behaved towards his subject. There was no demon. In Amstel's politics, in the last two books, when he presents his best regime, the characteristic of that is precisely also the absence of the demon. There are two gentlemen who rule and own all property and so on, and have the arms, and then there are uh, medics or slaves, but no demons. And that is from the point of view of Plato or Aristotle, of course, an, an ideal solution, because the great troublemaker is a demon. And if it doesn't exist, that's fine. But they, that must be taken with a uh, tongue in cheek. But um, it is uh, it must be pointed out, nevertheless. Now, he, the Athenian will now give a more practical reason why the conditions were so favorable 
at the beginning of the Peloponnesian Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The men of that age possessed also another advantage, which helped not a little to facilitate legislation. And Gillis, what was that? Athenian. Their legislators, in their efforts to establish equality of property, were free from that worst of accusations which is commonly incurred in the case with laws of a different kind. Whenever anyone seeks to disturb the occupation of land or to propose the abolition of debt, since he perceives that without these measures, equality could never be fully secured. In such cases, if the lawgiver attempts to disturb any of these things, everyone confronts him with the cry, hands off, and they curse him for introducing redistributions of land and remissions of debt, with the result that every man is rendered powerless. But the Dorians have this further advantage, that they were free from all dread of giving offense, so that they could divide up their land without dispute, and they had no large debt of old standing. True. Yes, so that is another consideration then, that the demos wants to have the please in general. Here is a more specific demand, the demand for equality, and that means for a reasonable equality of possessions, and therefore a redistribution of land, I believe they call it now agrarian reform, and permission of death. And it is clear that the Athenian is not simply what is now called a conservative, because he implies that his demand is under certain conditions perfectly reasonable. But uh, um, it was not, the demand didn't arise at that early time, because there was not yet, um, was not an, an inveterate possession of land, but they distributed it at the time. So uh, it was being distributed at the time. So there was no, uh, uh, this problem could be easily solved. Yes? Athenian, how was it then, my good sir, that their settlement and legislation turned out so badly? Megillus, what do you mean? What fault have you to find with it? Athenian, this, that whereas there were three states settled, two of the three speedily wrecked their constitution and their law, and one only remained stable, and that was your state, Megillus. So Argos and Messina, they, they decayed very the soon. Yes? Megillus, the question is not, is no easy one. Athenian. Yet surely in our consideration and inquiry into this subject, indulging in an old man's sober play with laws, we ought to proceed on our journey painlessly, as we said, when we first started out. Yeah, that was at the beginning, as I said, you know, that in Monterey, a pleasant walk in spite of the summer heat. And uh, the pleasant, but the pleasure consists here not so much in the shade afforded by the trees, but the pleasure afforded by the playful occupation befitting old men, meaning the discussion of law. Yes. Megillah, certainly we must do as you say. Athenian, well, what laws would offer a better subject for investigation than the laws by which those states were regulated? Or what larger or more famous states are there about whose settling we might inquire? Megillus. It would be hard to mention better instances than these. Now this trace of the three Peloponnesian cities that they were most famous and great, as this gives the Athenians the opportunity to bring up a much broader subject as he will do in the sequel. Yes. Opinion. It is fairly evident that the men of that age intended this organization of theirs to serve as an adequate protection not only for the Peloponnesian, but for the whole of Pelos as well. In case of any of the barbarians, in case any of the barbarians should attack them, just as the former dwellers around Ilium 
were emboldened to embark on the Trojan War through reliance on the Assyrian power as it had been in the reign of Nine. For much of the splendor of that empire still survived, and the people of that age stood in fear of its confederate power, just as we men today dread the great king. Person can With? Troy was a part of the Assyrian Empire. The second capture of Troy formed a grave charge against the Greeks. It was in view of all this that the Dorian host was at that time organized and distributed among three states under brother princes, the sons of Heracles, and then thought it ab admirably devised, <coughs> and in its equipment superior even to the host that had sailed to Troy. For men reckoned, first, that in the sons of Heracles they had better chiefs than the Pelopidae, and further, that this army was superior from Galar to the army which went to Troy, since the latter, which was Achaean, was worsted by the former, which was Dorian. Must we not suppose that it was in this way and with this intention that the men of that age organized themselves? Megillo, certainly. Can I just stop you for a second? So at the time of the establishment of the Peloponnesian Confederacy, there was great fear of the Assyrian. Allegedly, at that time, the preponderant power uh, in Asia. And uh, the, as far as I know, there is no other evidence of this story or myth as it is stated here. But they were very strong, much stronger than those who went against Troy in the first place because these new kings, the descendants from Heracles, were better than the descendants from Pelops, Agamemnon and Menelaus. And secondly, the army was superior to the army which went against Troy. And the proof of this is the fact that the kings and people then were Dorian, who had defeated the Achaeans, the people who had gone against Troy. So here, formerly it was that the Trojans are the Achaeans. They have only been a different name. But now this is retracted, and therewith the Athenian retracted what he had suggested earlier, that the Dorians were autochthonous. The Dorians came in as conquerors of a foreign land, which he had formerly suppressed and which he doesn't hear even clearly state, because that would cast some doubt on the justice of the whole enterprise, conquest being a less good title than we have now from the earth. Yes? Athenian. Yes? Uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus and their host, the people who went against Troy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, the Dorians defeated the Hans. And that is, uh, the, by the way, this seems to be so-called historical fact that long after the Peloponnesian, uh, the Dorian War, there was the Dorian migration, and perhaps more than that. And so the Dorians immigrated, invaded the Peloponnesian, and destroyed the old uh, civilization of the Peloponnesus. But this, the, the point which is most important in the context is that this is a new people, an invading, conquering people, but contrary to what had been suggested before. Go on. Athenian. Is it not also probable that they would suppose this to be a stable arrangement and likely to continue quite a long time since they had shared together many toils and dangers and were marshaled under leaders of a single family, their princes being brothers, and since, moreover, 
They had consulted a number of diviners, and amongst others, the Delphian Apollo, the Gillis. That is certainly probable. So there is an other feather in the cap of the Dorian Confederacy, that they had consulted diviners, among them the Delphian Apollo, and they had, of course, given favor of the hostages. And so everything seemed to be fine. The military superiority and, in addition, oracles, yes? Athenian. But it seems that these great expectations speedily vanished, except only, as we have said, in regard to that small fraction, your state of Laconi. And ever since, up to the present day, this fraction has never ceased warring against the other two. For if the original intention had been realized, and if they had been in accord about their policy, it would have created a power invincible in war. Yeah. Now, you see what he says about Spar, what happened afterward, and what ruined the whole, all these wonderful prospects, was that Sparta was waging war against the two other cities. And this, taken in itself, means the fault lay with Sparta. Of course, the Athenian would not say so, explicitly. He is only here in time. And why do, would he not say so? Because for a decent Athenian to say to a decent Spartan that the fault was Spartan would be about as tactful as if a foreigner in this country would speak of, uh, say, Negro slavery or the fate of the Red Indians. These things, at least according to the older notions of decency or tact, these are things which are not being done. And therefore, as the commentators deplore the Athenians or Plato's silence about the seemly side of Sparta, but they forget the situation. That here is this Athenian talking to a Spartan. It put certain limits. I mean, it should not become a, a match in name calling or something of this kind. He could not possibly do that. Medulla, it certainly would. Athenian, how then and by what means was it destroyed? Is it not worthwhile to inquire by what stroke of fortune the grand confederacy was wrecked? McGillis, yes. It takes a very long time. He repeats the same question again and again. Like he goes around it like a cat around hot porridge. But he will soon reach the point. Yes? Yes. For if one passed over these examples, one would not be likely to find elsewhere either laws or constitutions which preserve interests thus fair and great, or on the contrary, wreck them totally. That is also a repetition of something said earlier. One must by all means answer this question because of the outstanding quality of these societies. Yes? Absolutely. Thus, by a piece of good luck, as it seems, we have embarked on an inquiry of some importance. The good luck was, of course, guided by the Athenian, I mean, who was, who could guide it more or less as he wished. Yes? Megillus, undoubtedly, <coughs> Athenian. Now, my dear sir, do not men in general, like themselves, like, like ourselves at the present moment, unconsciously fancy that every object they set their eyes on would produce marvelous results if only a man could, if only a man understood the right way to make a fine use of it. But for us to hold such an idea in regard to the matter before us would possibly be both wrong and against nature. And the same is true in all other cases where men hold such ideas. Yes, you know, all right. If this may make the distinction between correctly and according to nature. One should as good assume that these are 
things are identical, but it is possible. So for example, if someone acts on the basis of opinion, of um, a good opinion or inherited opinion, then he does not simply act according to nature, because what guides him is not nature, but what his ancestors have told him. And perhaps he has in mind this distinction between opinion and knowledge. Yes. Michela, what is it you mean? And what shall we say is the special point of your remarks? I think, why, my dear sir, I had a laugh at my own expense just now. For when I beheld this armament of which we are speaking, I thought it was amazing, an amazingly fine thing, and that if anyone had made a fine use of it at that time, it would have proved, as I said, a wonderful boon to the Greeks. This armament is stolos. This is, of course, that of the Peloponnesian Confederacy. As I think underlines the beauty and the marvel of that army, and then all the more urgent becomes the question why was it destroyed? Yes? Miguel, was it not quite right and sensible of you to say this and of us to endorse it? Athenian, possibly. I conceive, however, that everyone, when he beholds a thing that is large, powerful, and strong, is instantly struck by the conviction that if its possessor knew how to employ an instrument of that magnitude and quality, he could make himself happy by many wonderful achievements. So that is, the, in Greek, the word um, um, becoming happy is the last word of the statement of opinion, oidmanonoi. And the emphasis is altogether on the word. Why people have admired such things like that uh, the early Peloponnesian Confederacy, ultimately with a view to happiness. And here, of course, a very big question arises: What is happiness? And uh, the Athenian will try to answer that as far as it is necessary in the present context. Magilla, is that, is not that a right conviction, or what is your view? Opinion. Just consider what one ought to have in view in every instance in order to justify the bestowal of such praise. And first, with regard to the matter now under discussion, if the men who were then marshalling the army knew how to organize it properly, how would they have achieved success? Must it not have been by consolidating it firmly and, maintain, and by maintaining it perpetually so that they should be both free themselves and masters over all others whom they choose, and so that both they and their children should do in general just what they please throughout the world of Greeks and barbarians alike? Are not these the reasons why they would be praised? Megillus, certainly. So that is what most people understand by happiness. Freedom for oneself and empire over others. And so that this enables one and one's descendants to do what one desires, whatever one desires. And this the Peloponnesian Confederacy promised, and therefore it is present. And this criterion is obviously subject to some doubt. Yes. Athenian. And in every case where a man uses the language of eulogy on seeing great wealth or eminent family distinction or anything else of the kind, would it not be true to say that in using it he has this fact especially in mind that the possessor of such things is likely, just because of this, to realize all, or to, or at least the most and greatest of his desires. Yeah, whatever he decides, the satisfaction of desires, that is heaven. Yeah. Megillus, 
That is certainly probable. Athenian. Come now, is there one object of desire that now indicated by our argument, which is common to all men? Megillus, what is that? Is this not um, a song in which Plato also admits that there is one object of desire, one and only one object of desire of all men? All men seek the good and to possess it forever and ever. That is common to, say, Plato and to all men. But there is, of course, a difference um, in regarding uh, the good, namely... Athenian, the desire that it's possible, everything, or failing that, all that is humanly possible, should happen in accordance with the demands of one's own heart. I mean, it's a qualification, but it's humanly possible because some people, of course, would wish to be wealthy and powerful and have all pleasures and never to die. This is not humanly possible, the latter. Hmm? Angela, to be sure, Athenian, since this then is what we all wish, always, in childhood, in manhood, and old age, it is for this, necessarily, that we should pray continually. So he has a further consideration. Since we desire that, and our desire does not guarantee that we get it, we will pray for it. Yes? Megillus, of course, Athenian. Moreover, on behalf of our friends, we will join in making the same prayer which they make on their own behalf. Megillus, to be sure, Athenian. And a, and a son is a friend to a father, the boy to the man. Megillus, certainly. Yet the Father will often pray the God that the things which the Son prays to obtain may in no wise be granted according to the Son's prayer. Megillus, do you mean when the Son who is praying is still young and foolish? Athenian, And also when the Father, either through age or through the hot temper of youth being devoid... Yeah, no, yeah, but the hot temper of youth in his old age, in other words, if he is still childish, yeah? Yeah. Being devoid of all sense of right and justice, indulges in the vehement prayers of passion, like those of Theseus against Hippolytus, when he met his luckless end. While the son, on the contrary, has a sense of justice. In this case, do you suppose the son will echo his father's prayers? And by the way, you see from this example that in the old age is no guarantee of wisdom in case you don't know that. That is important for the argument because frequently it is suggested that the rule of the old is by this very fact rule of the wise. Yeah? I grasp your meaning. You mean, as I suppose, that what a man ought to say and press for is not that everything should follow his own desires, while his desire in no way follows his own reason. But it is the winning of wisdom that every one of us, states and individuals alike, ought to pray for and strive after. Opinion. That he, uh, if I read that he will acquire uh, inter intelligence. That is, the only, that is the only reasonable prayer. Yeah. Opinion, yes. And what is more, I should recall to your recollection, as well as to my own, how it was said, if you remember, at the outset, that the that legislator of the state, in settling his legal ordinances, must always have regard to wisdom. The injunction he gave us was that the good lawgiver must frame all his laws with a view to war. I, on the other hand, maintain that whereas by your injunction, the laws would be framed with reference to one only of the four virtues. It was really essential to look to the whole of virtue, and first and above all to pay regard to the principle of virtue of the whole. To the leader, to the leader. I mean, the one 
virtue which leads the whole course of virtue. Yeah. Which is wisdom and reason and opinion, together with the love and desire that accompany them. Yes, but we are just waiting a moment. But the, way, the opinion refers to what he had said at the beginning. Now, if you look up that passage, and you, I suppose you remember it, this great discussion at the beginning, the opinion said there that Zeus and Apollo did lay down their laws with a view to the whole of virtue. The Athenian doesn't say that anymore now, because his delusion has been dispelled a long time ago. But there is another point of perhaps equally important. The Dorian legislators, both in Crete and in the, the Peloponnesus, laid down all their laws with a view to war. Hence, in particular, Sparta was defective from the very start, radical, and therefore no wonder that what she did you know, to say nothing of her confederates failed. So there can be no longer any doubt that Sparta too is fully responsible for the breakdown of the Peloponnesian Confederacy. But again here it is not explicitly stated we must do some very short steps of our own or say put one and one together. But to do more would again have meant for the Athenian to do something which was not quite this. And now the leader of the whole chorus of the church is called uh, good sense and intellect and opinion with passionate desire following these three. If the passionate desire does not follow, it is not virtue. That is, so virtue is not simply identical with knowledge. The passionate desire must be adequate. Yes? Now the argument has come back again to the same point, and I now repeat my former statement. In jest, if you will, or in earnest, I assert that prayer is a perilous practice for him who is devoid of reason and that what he obtains is the opposite of his desire. For I certainly expect, as you follow the argument recently propounded, you will now discover that the cause of the ruin... No, wait a moment. He, he didn't translate that. I, if, I, if he would um, wish, if you wish to put me, put me down as speaking seriously, put me down as speaking seriously. The Athenian leaves it open, whether he speaks jocularly or seriously, but he is willing to be, be treated as if he spoke seriously. Now, why does he make this qualification? What he said concerned prayer. Prayer is a perilous business for someone who has no sense, because he will uh, pray for preposterous and ruinous things. There is a Platonic dialogue uh, which is at present, I think, generally regarded as spurious, the so-called second Alcibiades on prayer, in which Socrates talks to Alcibiades, who is about to pray and sacrifice, and shows him that as long as he is so unreasonable, as in unreasonable as he is now, it would be wiser for him to abstain from prayer. And this depreciation of prayer, as most people pray, is in a way mitigated by the fact that the Athenian says, you may regard this as a joke. Yes? 
you will now discover that the cause of the ruin of those kingdoms and of their whole design was not cowardice or ignorance or warfare on the part of either on the part either of the rulers or of those who should have been their subjects, but that what ruined them was badness of all other kinds, and especially ignorance concerning the greatest human interest. That this was the course of events then, and is so still, whenever such events occur, and will be so likewise in the future, this, with your permission, I will endeavor to discover in the course of the coming argument, and to make it as clear as I can to you, my very good friend. No, to you, as two friends, as two people who are my friends, um, so uh, ignorance, inability to learn, that is what has ruined the Peloponnesian Confederacy and will also ruin other uh, cities in the future. And of course, it has ruined them in the past. Now, this uh, ignorance existed, of course, also at the beginning. Ignorance is the cause for all, of all political failure. And this <coughs> explains this slightly cryptical statement of the Athenian at the beginning of the third book. In 676 C6 to 8, when he says, Let us try to get hold of the cause of these changes taking place in cities. For this might show us, reveal to us, the first genesis of regimes. We understand by, um, by, see, by understanding what ignorance, like one of the most important human things, is doing. Now, we understand, we, we have the clue to the original state of man, to that extent the changes now taking place Revealed to us the original condition. Yes. Finally, verbal compliments are in poor taste, stranger, but by deed, if not by word, we shall pay you the highest of compliments by attending eagerly to your discourse. And that is what best shows whether compliments are spontaneous or the reverse. I give us capital, Finally, Let us do just as you say. It shall be so, God willing. Only say on. So, yeah, no, wait. God will, if God will. That's the first time that Kleinia says such. He had said at the beginning, at the very beginning of the dialogue, let us go with good chance, with good luck. But here he says, when God, if God will. That is a prayer. A reasonable prayer, according to what the Athenian had indicated shortly before. Now, what should they pray? That they shall attentively listen to what the Athenian is going to say. Yes? Athenian, well then, to advance further on the track of our discourse, we assert that it was ignorance in its greatest form, which at that time destroyed the power we have described, and which naturally produces still the same result. And if this is so, it follows that the lawgiver must try to implant in states as much wisdom as possible, and to root out folly to the utmost of his power. Funny, obviously. Athenian. What kind of ignorance would deserve to be called the greatest? Consider whether you will agree with my description. I take to the ignorance of this time, funny, what time? Athenian, that which we see in the man who hates instead of loving, when he judges to be noble and good, while he loves and cherishes what he judges to be evil and unjust. That want of accord on the part of the feelings of pain and pleasure, 
with the rational judgment is, I maintain, the extreme form of ignorance, and also the greatest, because it belongs to the main mass of the soul. For the part of the soul that feels pain and pleasure corresponds to the mass of the populace in the state. So whenever this part opposes what are by nature the ruling principles, knowledge, opinion, or reason, this condition I call folly, whether it be in a state when the masses disobey the rulers and the laws, or in an individual when the noble elements of reason existing in the soul produce no good effect, but quite the contrary. All these I would count as the most discordant forms of ignorance, whether in the state or the individual, and not the ignorance of the artisan, if you grasp my meaning, stranger. You know, the ignorance, the craftsman is that the craftsmen do not know, do not know the, the more delicate things, which gentlemen are supposed to know. Yeah. That is uh, uh, this servant. So the greatest ignorance is not ignorance of the noble and just, but knowing the noble and Choosing the ignoble and unjust. That one sees what is better, but chooses what is worse. You may remember that this was a certain difficulty, well, apparent difficulty for Socrates, uh, because he taught that virtue is knowledge. And the great question was, how can there be then a conflict between the intellectual part of man, knowledge, and his desires? And the phenomenon of such a conflict, the phenomenon of incontinence, became wholly unintelligible. That's especially in the Prokhavaras, it's in another. Uh, now, here the opinion says something very strange. If someone, when he opposes, when this mass of the soul, or the demons in us, opposes knowledge or opinion, or logos, opinions in the center, the Athenian treats here knowledge and opinion as, as equivalent. And if opinion is the, the intellectual ingredient, then of course the Socratic problem has disappeared. That someone can act against his opinion, say against the opinion that smoking is bad, his desire for a cigarette may overpower him. It happens every day. And, but here there's a question that's only opinion because we have no knowledge whether smoking is so bad as opponents of smoking say. We have only to ask the tobacco manufacturers. They will tell you that this is a very controversial thing. So the Athenian implicitly denies the distinction between knowledge and opinion. And that is an important element in the whole discussion. And I think, yes. Um, one can also say what, what the notion of, of virtue, which she implies, implied is this. Virtue is not knowledge, simply but uh, rather continence or moderation. Continence or moderation uh, can and must be distinguished in a, in, a, in a final analysis, but for crude purposes, they can be treated as identical. Yes? Yes? Uh, I wanted to ask, do you see this difference between the Athenian statement of the relation of uh, knowledge to desire and Socrates' statement as a correction of Socrates, an improvement yeah. of Socrates? Uh, yeah, 
if you if you think that this is simply the Socratic view that Socrates view is that virtue is knowledge period, then it is a correction of Socrates. But that would depend on a closer study, say, of the Protagoras, whether Socrates, the Platonic Socrates, ever meant it. And last year, when we read the memorabilia, we saw quite a few reasons to doubt that uh, Socrates ever proposed the simple identification of virtue and knowledge. There is only one terrific objection to what I say, and that is that Aristotle in the Ethics uh, uh, treats this view that virtue is knowledge uh, with the consequent impossibility of accounting for incontinence as a fact. And then I will try have to raise a question of what is the significance of an Aristotelian statement of that kind for eliciting the historical truth. Into, into that question we don't have to go, fortunately. But it is on, on the face of it, you can say it's the correction of what Socrates says in the Protagoras and in other places. Uh, as, as far as the, the uh, attempt to uh, abandon the distinction between knowledge and opinion that we pointed out, uh, that too would, of course, uh, be a departure from, if not a correction, of Socrates. Yeah, but uh, that happens surely more in the Socratic dialogue. In the, I mean, where Socrates appears as a character, if you call that a Socratic dialogue, happens also. Uh, you, did you ever read Mr. Klein's book on the Nino? Well, there, he makes quite a bit of this fact that so he shuffles around this, after having made the distinction, he learns them again for reasons which uh, one would have to find out for oneself. That is not necessarily unsocratic. Hmm. Yeah? If, if by the argument that's been developed here, virtue turns out to be more akin to moderation, um, why is it that the very first city, the, the city of the first regime, Why is that not the best? And why does this development here yeah, sure. the best? Yes. Now? And that is a good question, but one can in they were these early men. They were more temperate, more just, <coughs> more courageous, and more simple minded than people now in general. That's that is what you the further that's then. And Yes, but is this the true standard for judgment? Must we not ultimately judge an individual or a city with a view to wisdom as distinguished from these, the other virtues which were available even without any wisdom? But wisdom turns out to be by this Yeah, but now, if the, the highest form of wisdom, which is politically uh, feasible yeah, for the average citizen, is not wisdom proper, then it would be something like moderation. I mean, it's one of the many names which it could be given. And I think that is what is what is about what the whole dialogue, in a way, is about, as I believe you will see very soon. Mr. Byrne? Yeah, I'm wondering why I should doubt that Aristotle is an accurate reporter of Socrates' views. Yeah, because Aristotle, uh, if you ask him, 
And I mean, and, you know, he still gives answers, although he's dead. He would quote chapter verse. And not all, it is not always clear whether uh, he can quote chapter and verse. For example, when he says, Plato says in the laws that the best regime is a mixture of democracy and tyranny, of which the one is a bad regime, democracy, and the other not a regime at all. And then, of course, you can look, go through the whole house, you will never find that statement. But Plato says only a mixture of monarchy and democracy. But perhaps uh, in another context, for example, when he speaks of laws, Plato says they consist of, good laws would consist of two parts. A preamble, which reasonably sets forth the reason of the law. And then the tyrannical statement, if you do this or this, you will be punished in this and this way. So that's a mixture of persuasion and tyrannical so, Aristotle has a good reason, although he, uh, one has only to think of it. It is not literally there. But in this case, in the first what he says in the sixth book of the, the Ethics about Socrates, there you can quote verses, chapters and verses in Plato. Yes, so I ask why then, why then should we doubt yeah, but the question is, did Socrates or Plato mean it as literally as Aristotle chose to present it? For example, when he, uh, Aristotle discusses the best regime of the Republic, uh, there is not the slightest suggestion that this might not be taken, have been taken by Plato as literally as a political teaching as Aristotle presents it. But one could say that even an ironical suggestion of a wise man should be seriously considered. Because otherwise, how can you find out in a convincing way that it is ironical except after having examined it closely? Yeah. So that is, I believe, not such a great difficulty. Mr. Fonda? I understand the solution to the problem of how knowledge can be dragged about like a slave in some of the letters that the identical one here. I beg your pardon, which in the same form? The idea of knowledge that the statement. Yeah, the statement of the idea of knowledge. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
even though they be expert calculators and trained in all accomplishments and in everything that fosters agility of soul, while those whose mental condition is the reverse of this shall be entitled wise, even if, as the saying goes, they spell, neither do they swim. And to yeah, Bob must raise this little question on, on the basis of what we have seen before. What about musical education? Is this also entirely irrelevant? Can you have moderation in the sense in which Socrates or Plato sometimes understand it without musical education? So, go on. And to these latter, as to the men of sense, the government shall be entrusted. For without harmony, my friends, how could even the smallest fraction of wisdom exist? It is impossible. But the greatest and best of harmonies would most properly be accounted the greatest wisdom. And therein, he who lives rationally has a share, whereas he who is devoid thereof will always prove to be a home wrecker and anything rather than a savior of the state because of his ignorance in these matters. So let this declaration stand, as we recently said, as one of our axioms. Yeah, but, all right. Um, axioms a little bit. But uh, shortly before, in D7, when, or even 7, 8, when he says, he who lives kata logos, according to the logos, then I think that also reminds of a point which Aristotle makes. Living with lo meta logo, with logos, or kata logos. Now, with logos means that the logos in yourself guides you, but you can act according to the logos, even if that logos is not actual in yourself, but supplied, say, by the law. And that only confirms, I think, what we have said before. Please. Yes, let it stand. Athenian. Our states, I presume, must have rulers and subjects. Finally. Of course. Yeah. No, but in the light of what we have read before, and in spite of the great ambiguities as to what wisdom is, Roughly, it has been said, the wise must be ruled, must rule, and the unwise obey. But this leads to a difficulty. How is it possible for the unwise to obey the wise? How can the unwise recognize the wise as wise? And this question is, in a way, the fundamental question of politics, and which the Athenian stranger articulates in a very impressive way in the immediate sequel. Yes. Indeed. Very well, then. What and how many are the agreed rights or claims in the matter of ruling and being ruled, alike in states large or small, and in households? Is not the right of the father and the mother one of them? And in general, would not the claim of parents to rule over offspring be a claim universally just? In other words, not only the father and mother, but also grandfather and grandmother over their grandsons and grandchildren. Yes? Parnius, certainly, Athenian. And next to this, the right of the noble to rule over the ignoble. Yes, let's say men of noble birth over the sons of base birth. It's still birth which is here the second, yes? And then, following on these, as a third claim, the right of older people to rule and of younger people to be ruled. Finance, to be sure. This is also birth. Born earlier, born later. Or the, the oldest brother as a kind of image, as it were, of the father in the relation to the younger brothers, yeah? I, I can't, I, I somehow don't read it that way because, uh, because of the fact that, because of the case before that, it talks of the right of the one to rule over the other. 
Yeah, but the titles one can perhaps better say. Yeah? The titles or dignities are regarding ruling and being ruled. And here we have first father and mother, and son, uh, then, and all together, the parents of the offspring. And then, noble birth, ruler, base birth, men of base birth are ruled. Three, the oldest rule, the eldest rule, the youngest being ruled. Yeah. My eye is just caught by the, by the conjunction followed by the preposition in the sentence, the right of the older people to rule and of the younger to be ruled. It sounds like the younger are exercising their right here. Yeah, in a way, yes. But this is a massive distinction between rights and duties as we are in the habit of using it. Uh, was not so in use in classical Greece. When Sugar says in the apology, I am dikaios ami, I am just to present my defense. Does this mean he has a right to do so, or does this mean he has a duty to do so? Jews understand this very simply. When it is said certain thing is a commandment in Hebrew mitzvah, it's absolutely uh, impossible to distinguish whether that is, in, at least in many cases, whether this means a right or a duty. It is just to do that. And that is the point. But there is this difficulty, I think, doesn't exist. Now we come, yes? Well, one could translate it so that it is here in accordance with our understanding of the context. Titles, that which entitles men to rule or to be ruled. Yeah, it's a, yes, because, yes, and, and also perhaps this accounts for the difficulty Mr. Gary had, and the emphasis to put on rights in particular. The claim to be ruled, or the right to be ruled, is not immediately intelligible, no? unless you think of the protection afforded to the ruled by the ruler, and then it could be said to be a, a claim or right. Now, the fourth is something different, no? Finally, to be sure, Athenian, the fourth right is that title. slave... Let us say fourth title. Yeah. The fourth title is that slaves ought to be ruled and masters ought to rule. No, this has, of course, nothing to do with birth, yes. Finally, undoubtedly, Athenian. And the fifth is, I imagine, that the stronger should rule and the weaker be ruled. Finance, a truly compulsory form of rule. Compulsory because it's strong compared with it, yes? yes. But it has a, do it has a double meaning. It means also a truly necessary, in Felix's and word. Something necessary. I, something without which a city would not be possible, yes? Athenian, yes, and one that is very prevalent among all kinds of creatures being according to nature, as Pindar of Thebes once said. <laughs> the most important right is, I would, it would seem, the sixth, which ordains that the man without understanding should follow and the wise man lead and rule. Nevertheless, my most sapient Pindar, this is a thing that I, for one, would hardly assert to be against nature, but rather according to but rather according thereto, the natural rule of law without force over willing subjects. Clinius, a very just observation. Athenian, heaven's favor and good luck mark the seventh form of rule, where we bring a man forward for a casting of lots and declare that if he gains the lot, 
he will most justly be the ruler, but if he fails, he shall take his place among the rule. Cleinias, very true. Athenian, seest thou, O legislator? It is thus we might playfully address one of those who let you start on the task of legislation. How many are the rights pertaining to rulers, and how they are essentially opposed to one another? Herein we have now discovered a source of faction, which thou must remedy. So now let us stop here. Let us stop here. Now, by the way, that he speaks now about to the legislator who will be likely, without the necessary preparation uh, to legislation, that in, would also include Zeus and Apollo, of course, in the context of the whole book. But that is not the main point. The main point are the seven types to rule. The fourth, the central one, is the rule is... is Master slave. And for some reasons, that is in the center. One could say that those connected with birth, the first three titles, are modifications of the rule of wisdom, of insight, because the parents, the older, older, elder people generally are supposed to be wiser than the children or young, younger. Slavery, number four, clearly has something to do with strength, the rule of the stronger, which is the fifth in uh, the fifth, the fifth title. Of slavery is the only title regarding which nothing is said as to its soundness, whereas uh, all other titles get some predicate. One can say this to mean that slavery is the least just of titles, and uh, this could be confirmed by the fact that in the Republic, slavery is silently abolished, if one wants to. The, only in the case of slavery and of wisdom are the rules mentioned before the rulers which one could take to mean that the true slaves are the unwards. And that one could say. Now there are, however, a certain points which we must make. Now the opposition of which he speaks here, of the, of the opposition of these various titles, uh, that is particularly striking, of course, in the case of the rule of the stronger and the rule of the wise. And therefore, we should perhaps consider, consider that somewhat more closely. Strength is obviously necessary if there is to be society, civil society. But there is, there is also a necessity, of course, of wisdom. But since these two are not identical and even can very well be at loggerheads, the question arises how to reconcile these two claims, wisdom and force. And I believe that from Plato's point of view that is a fundamental political problem. And the general answer could be stated as follows. Wisdom must be diluted so as to become compatible with force of things. This was, we know that for some time, because we have seen on a few occasions the seeming identification of logos and law, but in fact, the distinction between logos and law. Logos, and especially the true logos, is golden and therefore soft. It is not, it's not of iron. And therefore it needs to be strengthened. And the strengthened logos, that's a nomos. But the strengthened nomos is no longer simply the true logos. 
It is very interesting to see that in this half quotation from Pindar in 690b, he omits something which is being quoted uh, in the Gorgias, the Calicus Gorgias, and namely that the context, the whole poem of Pindar is lost. I think one doesn't know more than what is, than what is quoted in the Gorgias. But there it begins, the fragment begins, that the nomos is the tyrant of all. And that in the context, as, as Calicles understands it, it means the rule of the stronger. And here Plato, uh, or the Athenian, does not speak of law, connection with Pindar, but quotes and um, refers to law a little bit later in the same speech, where he says, uh, where he is, again seems to identify law with reason. The natural rule of law, the natural, uh, not violent rule of law of a voluntary subject. Rule of law is a kind of rule of the stronger. And I think empirically that is rather obvious. Because if it is not, if the law enforcing people or the law in favor of enforcing people are not stronger than the lawbreakers, the law will cease to be law. It will be a well-meaning prescription and not more. Now, yes? Well, isn't there much opposition between the first three kinds of rule, that is, the family or the agent, and yeah. strength as there is between the wise and the strong? Yes, but on the other hand, the aged father is generally speaking physically inferior to his son in their, matu- in, in their maturity. No, I believe now that. Now, in the case of the wise, we're also physically inferior um, to the unwise. Really. Yes, and, and therefore I said that the first three titles, the titles based on birth, are a kind of reflection on a, in a somewhat dimmer medium of the claim of wisdom. And the rule of the, the, rule of the stronger is presented also by the rule of masters over slaves, because that is, uh, by definition, a rule based on coercion. I think that Plato explains this cooperation of force and wisdom, of coercion and persuasion, very simply at the beginning of the Republic, when Polemachus warns Socrates and Glaucon uh, and Adamantus no, uh, to stay on in the Piraeus and says, pointing to his muscles, we are more, i.e. we are stronger than you. And then uh, Glaucon gives in at once. And then Adamantus tries to persuade Socrates by telling him that what wonderful things they will see in the, in the evening, the torch rays and uh, whatever. And then, then there is complete agreement, except Socrates doesn't say a word. Socrates says only if it is the opinion, meaning the opinion of all except me, then it must be done. 
the combination of coercion and persuasion that is uh, what is uh, law, what is political society. And uh, I think it leads to uh, either brutality or sentimentality if one suppresses one of the two items. I have a question uh, that, I, that I wish to take and answer in the light of a parallel developing tradition. You say that wisdom must be diluted in order to effect itself on the demos. I want to know about justice. Perhaps that is justice. Yeah, that is one way. I mean, if you identify wisdom with, with justice... Speaking out of divine law. Yeah, well, all right, but divine law is ambiguous. And that can be understood in the sense in which it would have to be understood in the Republic and in a different way here. But do they have to be diluted or improved upon? In order to, uh, it's not an improvement. The dilution is the opposite of an improvement. Well, a dilution could constitute either applying only a little bit or of simplifying them down to a couple of precepts. I mean, yeah, that would be a very incomplete notion of justice, would it not? I think it would. That would not satisfy Plato. I mean, say, if you take the second table of the Decalogue, it would, be, would not be sufficient for other Plato and Aristotle, of course. And any further simplification would be even less sufficient. Which one? Of the, of the uh, Decalogue. If that was simplified down to one or two precepts, and those precepts were to be offered as the precepts by which all men should live, yeah, well, this is all depends. It all depends. But then uh, the danger is, uh, if it is stated in the, in the greatest generality, that it doesn't um, say very much. As I say in this country, that is something as not being against motherhood. Oh, yeah. Yeah? That uh, does not, is not sufficient for a law. So or for would that be diluted justice then? In some sense, could we call that diluted justice or... Constant? No, for example, if here is a voice of wisdom somewhere, and this would be unintelligible or unpalatable to the community at large. And therefore, you do what is... I refer again to a very common uh, expression in American political uh, parlance, compromise. That compromise between uh, wisdom and public opinion. Would that be the, this is the last question. Would that possibly be the distinction between the oral tradition and the written tradition? No. It could be the fact, insofar as an oral tradition, it seems to be more flexible as a, as a written one. No? Could be. But I would like to say, uh, although there is, of course, an enormous difference between Plato and Rousseau, in this question here, there is agreement. And that is shown by the very beginning of the social contract, where Rousseau says, all men are born free, but everywhere they are in chains. How this happened, I do not know. But I can tell, I believe that is what it says, I can tell what will make it legitimate. So the social, the teaching of the social conduct is a teaching of the difference between legitimate and illegitimate bondage. But even in the best case, in the case of that policy which he, uh, he develops, it is nevertheless bondage. And I think that is also what Plato is. Yes. I see.
I believe not so difficult. If you take a society in which all members are supposed to be equal, how can you elect rulers? If you say you elect them uh, as we understand election today, what the Greeks say called election by raising the hands, meaning, you know, the name is mentioned, then you may vote for someone because you regard him as virtuous or as efficient or what have you. And then you make, you discriminate. It's the worst crime in democracy. You discriminate. And that, of course, and quite a few, uh, while everyone is to, uh, in a democracy is supposed to have access to ruling offices, that doesn't exist because people want to have distinguished people. The distinctions may be uh, laughable from all kinds, from all points of view, but still there must be some claim to prefer, to prefer it. And therefore the Greek Democrats said, we must have election by lot. Then the humblest citizen and even the most incompetent citizen and, and, and has a chance of being elected. If, and, and that um, Plato recognizes it to some extent, you will see later on there will be allowance for election by lot. One can say number seven is a democratic increment. And one can say that there is a connection between this democratic ingredient and the rule of the stronger insofar as other things being equal. The multitude is brachially stronger than any part, like the rich or the, the virtues of whichever you take, you know? So th to that extent, the fifth and the seventh, I think, belong together. But the election by a lot has this simple reason. Yes? Uh, was the remark you made about Rousseau uh, the necessary Why the masters and slaves were in the center? Yeah, I, I suppose so. I, I did not explicitly uh, think of that, but I may have thought of it before. Then, then, uh, then the well, then masters and slaves could be understood metaphorically. Yes, or as Plato could also say, what slaves and masters in the ordinary sense. This is a metaphorical understanding of what true masters and slaves are. Yeah? A, a diluted understanding. Since you can't get easily the wise 
to be the master and the unwise to be the slaves, you dilute it. And you say, establish, for example, that, say, prisoners of war or people who didn't pay their debts, they will become the slaves. Because you could, in the case of people who don't pay their debts, you could say, with some semblance of truth, these are unwise people because they shouldn't have run into debts in the first place. But you see at any rate that this is a fragile way of looking at it, but it could be used as an example of what I understand by a dilution. Yeah, I believe he... Oh, I'm sorry. Another question. Uh, first, uh, Marx was not the first person to think about the The rule of the stronger does have some strength. Good. So then I hope we meet again reasonably good. Completed our reading of the third book of the law. The subject under discussion was the Spartan regime, which is mixed from three ingredients, monarchic, aristocratic, and democratic. The monarchic and the, and the democratic, the two extremes, are linked by the Council of Elders, which is characterized by moderation. For the better understanding of the Spartan arrangement, the Athenian considers the two extremes by themselves, monarchy and democracy, which for the most striking examples of both, Persia and Athens. First, he derives this lesson from Persia. Persia was in good shape when ruled by a king who was not the son of a king, which implies hereditary kingship is bad, but Sparta had hereditary kingship. The second point is a critique of moderation. Moderation is no title to honor. It's absent gives just cause for blame, but in itself is no title to honor, and still less is a title to rule. But the central part of the Spartan order, the Council of Elders, is characterized by moderation. He then turns to Athens, to her good time, corresponding to the time of Cyrus and Persia. It was an ancient regime at the time of the Persian War, and especially at the time of the Battle of Salamis. What was characteristic was the prevalence of reverence and fear. Nothing had been said about reverence in the account of Persia, so we may suspect that this was not a Persian quality, but it was uh, very much so in ancient Athens. And now he has to give an account of the decline of Athens, the emergence of extreme democracy. There is only one little point towards the end of what we have read last time in 699 E. I showed you the time. As I think you're speaking. Do you read it? But both you and Phineas must now consider whether what we are saying is at all pertinent to our lawmaking, for my narrative is not related to its own sake, 
But for the sake of the lawmaking, I speak that. Yeah, no, but this is not, uh, he says, mm, for, not for the sake of reason, of myths, go through, through these things, but for the sake of lawmaking. So, historical narrative, what they call the fact of history. These are myths, as well as uh, the myth, um, and properly so called. But we go on now a little later, the next speech of the Athenian. No, first the short. I will. Under the old laws, my friends, my friends, our commons had no control over anything, but were, so to say, voluntary slaves to the law. Megillus, what laws do you mean, Athenian? Those dealing with the music of that age, in the first place, to describe from its commencement how the life of excessive liberty grew up. Among us at that time, music was divided into various classes and styles. One class of song was that of prayer to the god, which bore the name of him. Contrasted with this was another class, best called dirges, paeans, formed another, and yet another was the dipsograph, dip named, I fancy, after Dionysus. Gnomes also were so called as being a distinct class of songs, and these were further described as kitharoedic gnomes. Uh, so these and other kinds being classified and fixed, it was forbidden to set one kind of words to a different class of tunes. The authorities whose duty it was to know these regulations and, when known, to apply them in its judgment and to penalize the disobedience was not a pipe, nor, as now, the mob's unmusical shouting, nor yet the tappings which mark applause. In place of this, it was a rule made by those in control of education that they themselves should listen throughout in silence while the children and their ushers and the general crowd were kept in order by the discipline of the rod. In the matter of music, the populace willingly submitted to orderly control and abstained from outrageously judging by clamor. But later on... No, wait a moment. So this was ancient Athens. So characterized not only by awe, but also by music. Of course, nothing has been said about music in the account of Persia, and how the two things are connected with one another, or a music that is not in any way stated. Now, what happened? What happened next? But later on, with the progress of time, there arose as leaders of unmusical illegality, poets who, though by nature poetical, were ignorant of what was just and lawful in music and they, being frenzied and unduly possessed by a spirit of pleasure, mixed dirges with hymns and paeans with dithyrams, and imitated flute tunes with harp tunes, and blended every kind of music with every other. And thus, to their folly, they unwittingly bore false witness against music, as a thing without any standard of correctness, of which the best criterion is the pleasure of the auditor, be he a good man or a bad, by compositions of such a character, set to similar words, they bred in the populace a spirit of lawlessness in regard to music, and the effrontery of supposing themselves capable of passing judgment on it. Hence the theater goers became noisy instead of silent, as though they knew the difference between good and bad music. And in place of an aristocracy in music, there sprang up a kind of base theocracy, theocracy. The rule, the rule of the theater, yeah. the theater crown, yes. For if in music, and music only, there had arisen a democracy of free men, such a result would not have been so very alarming. But as it was, the universal conceit of universal wisdom and the contempt for law originated in the music, and the heels of these, and at the heels of these came liberty. For thinking themselves knowing, men became fearless, and audacity begat effrontery. For to be fearless of the opinion of a better man, owing 
to self-confidence is nothing else than base effrontery, and it is brought about by a liberty that is audacious to excess. Megillus, most true. So the decline of heavens came from the decline of music and not from any political reason. This decline is due to the great Athenian poet after the Persian War. No names are mentioned, but uh, on the other hand, uh, this means uh, we, don't, we, we don't know whether Plato makes Aeschylus, for example, responsible, but we don't know. Uh, one might think he uh, thinks primarily of Euripides and Aristophanes, but that is unlikely that it starts as late as these two men. That is a very uh, remarkable doctrine of the origin of democracy, or the, or the worst kind of democracy in Athens, a corruption of music. But it is uh, not altogether intelligible if you think of the influence of art and literature on how people think and feel. And it surely makes clear the profound opposition of Plato to poetry. That is perhaps stronger even than this famous statement of the Republic, because here the whole decline of Athens is traced to men who were by nature poetic and yet had emancipated themselves from morality, as you would say. Yes. Next, after this form of liberty, would come that which refuses to be subject to the rulers, and following on that, the shirking of submission to one's parents and elders and their admonition. Then, as the penultimate stage, comes the effort to disregard the laws, while the last stage of all is to lose all respect for oaths or pledges or divinity, wherein men display and reproduce the character of the titans of story who are said to have reverted to their original state, dragging out a painful existence with never any rest from woe. What again is our object in saying all this? Evidently, I must, every time, rein in my discourse like a horse, and not let it run away with me as though it yeah, had... It, it, uh, my discourse, he doesn't say. The discourse. The logo. Yeah. Evidently, I must, every time rein in the discourse like a horse, and not let it run away with me as though it had no bridle in its mouth, and so get a toss off the donkey, as the saying goes. Consequently, I must once more repeat my question and ask, with what object has all this been said? Megillo, very good. So what does this mean, this <coughs> remark about uh, that he must put a rein on the logos. Well, he's, he's living what he's just spoken in the speech before. But were we not told that one must follow the logos? But not in every direction. I mean, this is a speech before about the logos. No, he, he refers to the logos which condemns this newfangled music. But even that must be held in, in a law. Even that logos, as the music must be held in a law, so the logos about the music. Yeah, but does not, is not the logos its own law? Can it be, can the logos, and especially the true logos, be subjected to a law that would be a question? But the logos of a living dialogue is always directed to particular people, and that would have to be directed by laws that couldn't be... Yeah, but why should uh, the presence of Megillus and Kleinias induce the Athenian to put a rein on the logos condemning new kind of music? If he says the truth simply, they might kill him. 
Men gud och sånt kan jag. Det är annat så fond av nyfangad musik. Det är Mr. Brown. And you think that uh, you think they argue this if music can be corrupted, and then it is fate in itself. Yes, yeah. Uh, but general, uh, at any rate, this much is clear, and uh, you, you admitted that uh, that the locust goes rather far. So and he stops it. Uh, yes, and and now he returns. Uh, he returns to the subject by the next question. Athenian. What has now been said bears on the objects previously stated. Megillus. What were they? Athenian. We said that the lawgiver must aim in his legislation at three objectives. To make the state he is legislating for free, and at unity with itself, and possessed of sense. That was so, yeah. but not... Yeah. No, that is a repetition of what was said earlier. But the original formula was rather moderate, and now he has replaced, has replaced it by sense or intellect, because that has something to do with the critique of the prosthetic of moderation, which we have read. Yes. Megillah, certainly. Athenian. With these objects in view, we selected the most despotic of polities and the most absolutely free and are now inquiring which of these is rightly constituted. When we took a moderate example of each, of despotic rule on the one hand and liberty on the other, we observed that there they enjoyed prosperity in the highest degree. But when they advanced, the one to the extreme of slavery and the other to the extreme of liberty, then there was no gain to either the one or the other. McGillis, most true. Athenian. With the same objects in view, we surveyed also the settling of the Doric coast and the homes of Dardanus at the foot of the hills and the colony by the sea and the first men who survived the flood, together with our previous discourses concerning music and revelry, as well as all that preceded these. The object of all these discourses was to discover how best a state might be managed and how best the individual citizen might pass his life. But as to the... Yeah, that is is okay. So that is a, a brief a summary of <coughs> everything that went before. From the very beginning, it is one and only one object to see how a police would develop best and how one would live privately of how one would live privately his own life best. So both are the subjects. The best police, the best life for the individual. This was the subject throughout. And the uh, uh, long discussion of music and drunkenness are subordinate, of course, to this theme of the good life. Yes. And that is the conclusion of the argument. Now, how does he go on to me? But as to the value of our conclusions, what test can we apply in conversing among ourselves, O Megillus and Clinius? Clinius, I think, stranger, that I can perceive one. It is a piece of good luck for me that we have dealt with all these matters in our discourse, for I myself have now come nearly to the point when I shall need them, and my meeting with you and Megillus here is quite opportune. I will make no secret to you of what has befallen me. Nay, more, I count it to be a sign from heaven. The most part of Crete is undertaking to found a colony, and it is given charge of the undertaking to the Knossians, and the city of Knossos has entrusted it to me and nine others. We are bidden also to frame laws, choosing such as we please, either from our own local laws or from those of other countries taking no exceptions to their alien character, provided only that they seem superior. Let us then grant this favor to me, and yourselves also. Let us select from the statements we have made and build up by arguments the framework of a state, as though we were erecting it from a foundation. 
In this way, we shall be at once investigating our theme, and possibly I may also make use of our framework for the state that is to be formed. Athene. Your proclamation, Cleinias, is certainly not a proclamation of war. So, if Megillus has no objection, you may count on me to do all I can to gratify your wish. Cleinias. It is good to hear that. Megillus. And you can count on me, too. Cleinias. Splendid of you both. But in the first place, let us try to found the state by word. Yeah, to found the city in speech first. <coughs> Now, and Kleinias, who is, as we know, more abundant in thought than in speech, and therefore had not disclosed hitherto what he had up his sleeve, now tells it. That is an excellent training for him in the task which he said he had imposed on him to become the founder or co-founder and co-legislator of a new city. And this foundation of in speech of, a, of the new city will be the test of the truth or reasonableness of everything they have said <laughs> before. And that from now on there begins then the founding of the city in speech, and everything else is a kind of introduction. Now, founding a city in speech, that is also being done in the Republic. But in the Republic, the co-founders are Socrates, Glaucon, and Adamantus. And here they are, the Athenian, uh, Megillus, and Clarius and Megillus. And that makes all the difference. In the Republic, the founding of the city in speech was preceded by an examination of the wrong opinions on justice. Here, it was preceded by an examination of the Dorian legislation. And the Dorian and especially the Spartan regime. The question of justice is not the guiding question of the laws, as it is the guiding question of the Republic. Now, and the change which takes place here, there is no such change in the Republic. It means also that from now on, the Athenian <coughs> is no longer merely the teacher of legislators, but an advisor to an actual legislator, here and now. And that uh, accounts for uh, some happenings later on. Now, before we turn to book four, is there any point which you would like to raise <coughs> regarding the book three or anything else which we have not sufficiently considered? Yes. Let me put it this way, what else could he have done? He, after all, he has to explain why this wonderful ancient regime of Athens was destroyed, how it came to be destroyed. Um, what would be the alternative to his explanation? But could there be a democratic process before there was a democracy? No. 
How did the Athenian democracy come into being? But the king had been disposed of a long time ago, and in the but the explanation which the Athenian himself gives later on in the fourth book is this: Salamis was the high point, and the consequence of Salamis' a naval battle was Athenian naval power, and that meant that the Athenians had to use. All kind of low class people, the scum, for assailers, you know, and they couldn't do that in the long run without giving them citizen rights, the vote. And that was a democracy. So, but this would perhaps be somewhat awkward after this high price of salary. And of Athens at the time of Salamis, to say that Salamis and Athens at Salamis so wonderful, and look what happened almost immediately afterward. The change of the ancient regime. Instead, he refers to an alternative interpretation, which is not so visibly true. Uh, but which, uh, from Plato's point of view, is true in a deeper sense, because uh, the corruption of cities is, in the first place, the corruption of how people think and feel, and that can very well be brought about by poets, and perhaps more by them than by any other people. <coughs> Mr. Burns? Yes, that, that argument, in a way, has, I think, a funny character for us because uh, if one thinks about television now and the power of television, uh, one can see, uh, uh, because so many people uh, see it so much of the time, one can see the argument being perhaps more plausible now, but I wonder uh, if, if it really was plausible then. Uh, did the people go to the theater so often? Did the poets really have the kind of effect and the kind of uh, audience that, uh, say, television has now? Well, one could say it is less plausible now because the demands regarding decency are so much lower now. You know, the, it is impossible to get any agreement, even among Supreme Court judges, as to what obscenity is. A hundred years ago, there wouldn't have been any difficulty with this system. Yeah, but I think we could make the argument that 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 is precisely evidence for the sort of thing that he was that he was talking about here because I suspect that the reason it's hard to get that kind of agreement now is because uh, the advanced people, the artists and the intellectuals, have uh, have made us familiar with all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, but no. In other words, it seems to me that what has happened to the Supreme Court might be more effect than cause of what yeah, yeah. the people who control yes. it. That is true. No, I took, I meant only another aspect of the thing. But I agree with you. But you must not limit yourself to, the, to what you call the artist. You use, I think, without Freud, Without D. H. Lawrence and some other people whose names I've only heard, this whole 
thing would need the power which it actually possesses. This is not the... And therefore, if from the point of view of foundness, uh, one could say uh, they corrupt the regime. Hmm? I mean, that it has nothing in itself to do with democracy would seem to follow from the fact that there can be a rather severe purity, not to say theocratic, democracy. That there must be another reason for that. Well, uh, the, 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 the you just uh, mentioned namely that uh, there might be corruptors in back of the artists. That, that is to say, if one assumes that the artists are corrupting the populace, but then there are corruptors of, of, the, of the artists, uh, is there a suggestion that there were corruptors of the Athenian poets? No. Well, what I mean is meant Uh, the movement that is called sophistry. But that is not linked up. We must be, I mean, we have received a venerable tradition, which, as all venerable traditions, is well, subject to examination. And that the whole thing started with a certain number of wicked men uh, traveling from one city to another, having no yeah, well, they did have visible means of support, but surely no landed means of support, the Soviets. But whether this is not a somewhat narrow view of what happened, and precisely on the basis of Plato and Aristotle, we seem to be the great accusers of these sophistic movements. You know, people have made all kinds of fantastic notions. Protagoras as a theorist of Athenian democracy, have you heard that? That an Austrian discovered about 70 years ago, and in the meantime it has become something like holy writ. On the basis of a few pages in Plato's Protagoras, which means something very different, and so on. Plato does not say there is a connection between the sophist and the poet. Well, but I was thinking of something like Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's argument about, uh, well, the poetry being corrupted by philosophy. Yeah, but Plato doesn't say that. Plato does not suggest that. Yes? That, that I didn't mean, and I don't believe I, that it would be a, a kind of half Marxist invitation. No, I said there are two things the massive thing, naval power, Athenian empire, democracy becoming ever more extreme. And the other is, of which we, so to say, know nothing except from this page of Plato, the great Athenian po poets. They alone are responsible for the for that. And now the question is how do the th two things go together? And we have no platonic guidance for them for answering that question. That it is intelligible in this context because here we have first been given a high praise of Salamis. And then it would be uh, perhaps too much for old Megillos and Plinius to tell them very well, this Athens' finest hour produce Athens' utmost decay. You know, today I believe they call that dialectic. And this is not the way in which 
always law-bred gentleman think. If it is a biased hour, there can only be something fine can come out of it. Plato has something, has some deep objection to the poets, but that objection is not adequately expressed by saying that the poets are responsible for the emergence of Athenian extreme democracy. And that is only done in this country. but it is that which makes courage possible. Yeah? Because by having, there are two things, fear in the language of Hobbes, fear of human beings, and fear of powers invisible. And what Plato says is, uh, or the Athenians, is that the fear of powers invisible makes enables people to overcome the fear of human enemies. Yeah? There's not a substance. Well, it struck me that it was somewhat akin to the earlier discussion yeah. of moderation, where the sense of shame was somehow perhaps a substitute for, for the virtue of, of moderation. And I wonder if yeah. there is a way that the reason that the Athenians are susceptible to the corruption brought about by the poets is that instead of having the virtues, they have merely this. Here, that is the possible explanation, and that the poets, as it were, exploit these or make use of and uh, aggrandize these feelings of awe, which would surely be true of tragedy. And this could lead to that. That's possible. But that is very deeply hidden. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Surely that was not what the old Athenians had was not virtue, strictly speaking. There was no Socrates there, and perhaps not even possible among them. You want to say that? It, it, it just seems to me that the argument that's offered here is certainly capable of expansion in, in many different ways. Yeah. It can be seen to be parallel to other arguments that Plato gives. But I think really this argument is very pure, and the logic that runs through it is inescapable. That if there are different kinds of music, and each kind has to be appreciated according to a certain knowledge, and not all kinds are directed purely towards producing pleasure, then if you mix the kinds all together and create art out of the mixture of that, the only possible criterion of art would be pleasure. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it would be pleasure for good men and bad men. Yeah, that is true. But for any kind of men. I mean, that seems to be a pretty... Yeah, but still, the, over, the, question, the overall question is this. Uh, how uh, can one say that the corruption of music or the emergence of the great Athenian, Athenian poets is responsible for the decay of Athens, for the emergence of the Athenian democracy, especially since there is, so, is available a much more plausible explanation, an explanation which the Athenians themselves, themselves will give in the fourth book, that is, so that was not beyond his knowledge, 
In other words, it's not plausible to think that if the law in art about musical kind is broken down and the pleasure principle is instituted as the only judge of art, then the law, for example, with respect to justice can be broken down. The pleasure principle No, no, but the still right there, is there not... Is there not a difference between these two possible explanations? The political one and the lucid one? But don't people have a certain mentality which encompasses both their musical understanding and their political understanding? And if, and if one part of it goes one way, isn't the other one going to follow? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the argument is, is very plausible. And, and, and with the bare logic that it offers, it's very strong. Yeah. An examination of the third and Atkins is one to show the kind of anti-attack and moderation, but also to show the, the weakness of such a choice to show the existence and generation of the physical affirmances and the physical freedom. I wonder if you apply the physical friendship that you've shown to the yeah, well, but friendship is there. If you have a limited uh, despotism or a limited freedom, so that it's not... Uh, and, and this will break down in the moment you get extreme despotism or extreme freedom. There's no power and there's no power action belongs. No, the, 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 here is the main point is the, the decay of awe in the case of Adam and of awe and of respect for authority, music or non music. And in the case of Persia, the, the, the disregard of the people, the subject. There is not such a one-to-one -one coordination, I believe, between these three items, ancient Persia, modern Persia, ancient Athens, modern. So, shall we then turn to book four? Athenian, <coughs> come now, what is this state going to be, shall we suppose? I'm not asking for its present name, or the name it will have to go by in the future. For this might be derived from the conditions of its settlement, or from some locality, or a river, or spring, or some local deity might bestow its sacred title on the new state. The point of my question about it is rather this. Is it to be an inland state or situated on the sea coast? Finance. The state which I mentioned just now, stranger, lies about 80 states, roughly speaking, from the sea. That is about nine miles. <clears throat> Athenian. Well, has it harbors on the seaboard side, or is it quite without harbors? Cleinias. It has excellent harbors on that side, stranger. None better. Athenian. Dear me, how unfortunate. But what of the surrounding country? Is it productive in all respects or deficient in some respects? Finally, there is practically nothing that it is deficient in. Athenian, will there be any state bordering close on it? Finally, none at all, and that is the reason for settling it. Owing to emigrations from this district long ago, the country has lain desolate for ever so long. Athenian, how about plains, mountains, and forests? What extent of each of these does it contain? Finally, as a whole, it resembles in character the rest of Crete. Athenian, you would call it hilly rather than level? Finally, certainly. Athenian, then it would not be incurably, incurably unfit for the acquisition of virtue. For if the state was to be on the sea coast and to have fine harbors, and to be deficient in many products instead of productive of everything. In that case, it would need a mighty savior and divine lawgiver, if, with such a character, it was to avoid having a variety of luxuries, luxurious and depraved habits. Yeah, literally, 
is that regarded as such a nature. Yes? Yeah. As things are, however, there is consolation in the fact that 80 stud stayed the fact that that 80 stayed still it lies unduly near the sea and the more so because as you say its harbors are good that however we must make the best of for the sea is in very truth a right briny and bitter neighbor although there is sweetness in its proximity for the uses of daily life for by filling the markets of the city with foreign merchandise and retail trading, and breeding in men's souls knavish and tricky ways, it renders the city faithless and lovely, not to itself only, but to the rest of the world as well. But in this respect, our state has compensation in the fact that it is all productive, and since it is hilly, it cannot be highly productive as well as all productive. If it were, and supplied many exports, it would be flooded in return with gold and silver money. The one condition of all, perhaps, that is most fatal in a state is the acquisition of noble and just habits of life. As we said, if you remember in our previous discourse, <coughs> finally, we remember and we endorse what you said both now, both then and now. Union begin then. I was speaking as an advisor to legislator with the nature of the land, with the nature of the territory, and it proves to be, that nature proves to be tolerably good. It is not quite at the sea coast, the, the terrain is hilly, it's almost self-sufficient, but it doesn't produce uh, almost self-sufficient, hence not in need of import, and Owing to its silly character, it does not, has no surplus to export. So it is as self-sufficient as it can be. And therefore, no need for trade. That corrupter of pure manners, pure morals, as it was always called in former times by the philosophers. And only later on, uh, in modern times, in the 17th, 18th century, uh, was a case made for trade, because admitting that it was bad for morality, for pure manners. Yet it was said to be productive of gentle manners, meaning taking away the severity of the old-fashioned morality. You find this beautifully developed by Montesquieu in his Spirit of Laws and in his whole literature leading up to Adam Smith, where there was always some doubt regarding the goodness of international exchange or of trade within the country, but it was, true, uh, it was meant to be much more acceptable in, uh, in modern times. Uh, you know, another argument which plays a role, including in, even in Kant, that trade connects the people, whereas religion separates them. And hence, trade and um, well, not, I uh, didn't say make love, not war, but it make trade and dilute the power of religion by permitting the pollution of sex so that the power of religion as a whole would become weaker. Now, Plato is here, of course, a representative of the absolutely opposed to, as you see. Uh, trade and traveling are uh, two great dangers to cohesion. And therefore, very strict rules regarding traveling will be stated later on in the book. Uh, we, re Pliny, we remember and we endorse what you said both then and now. Athenian. Well then, how is, it our, how is our district off for timber, for shipbuilding? Finally. 
There is no fir at Tisbito, nor pine, and but little cypress, nor could one find much large or plain, which shipwrights are always obliged to use for the interior fittings of ships. Athenians. Those two are natural features which would be which would not be bad for the country. Finally. Yeah, and the, 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 for the, and for our, uh, that is also still the nature of the, of the country. Needless to say, there is not a word said here about the beauty of scenery and, and of the various kinds of trees which exist there. This is wholly beyond the interest of not only of Megidas and Kanyas, but of the Athenian stranger himself. Because that would require that people come interested in the beauty of the scenery. And that would require a great change in outlook which had not taken place at that time. Kleinian, why so? Athenian, that a state should not find it easy to copy its enemies in bad habits is a good thing. Finally, to which of our statements does this observation allude? Athenian, my dear sir, keep watching me with an eye to cast back on our opening statement about the Cretan law. It asserted that those laws aimed at one single object, and whereas you declared that this object was military strength, I made the rejoinder that while it was right that such enactments should have virtue for their aim, I did not at all approve of that aim being restricted to a part instead of applying to the whole. So do you now in turn keep a watch on my present lawmaking as you follow it in case I should exact any law either not tending to virtue at all or tending only to a part of it? So the Athenian is now presents himself now as legislator. And that is a new role in which he appears. Yes? For I lay it down as an axiom that no law is rightly enacted which does not aim always, like an archer, at that object and that alone, which is constantly accompanied by something ever beautiful, passing over every other object, be it wealth or anything else of the kind that is devoid of beauty. To illustrate how the evil imitation of enemies, which I spoke of, comes about when people dwell by the sea and are vexed by enemies, I will give you an example. Though with no wish, of course, to recall to you painful memories. Yeah, or later to, to bear grudge against you. Hmm? Yeah. When Minos, once upon a time, reduced the people of Attica to a grievous payment of tribute, he was very powerful by sea, whereas they possessed no warships at all at that time, such as they have now. Nor was their country so rich in timber, they could easily supply themselves with a naval force. Hence, they were unable quickly to copy the naval methods of their enemies and drive them off by becoming sailors themselves. And indeed, it would have profited them to lose 70 times seven children rather than to become marines. They had to give only twice them. Yeah? They had to give to miners only twice them. Uh -huh. I think it says, even if they had um, we compelled to give them many times seven, it would not be a thing as bad as to imitate the art uh, practices of minor. Okay? Rather than become marines instead of staunch, staunch foot soldiers. For marines are habituated to jumping ashore frequently and running back at full speed to their ships, and they think no shame of not dying boldly at their posts when the enemy attacks, and excuses are readily made for them as a matter of course when they fling away their arms and betake themselves to what they describe as no dishonorable flight. Um, that is the uh, minor, the old enemy of us. And of course, at the same time, the legislator of Crete. And we have seen there was quite a bit of criticism of the Cretan legislation before. And here a point comes up 
uh, which had not been mentioned and which is in a way is stronger than the things mentioned before, namely that Minos corrupted the character of his subject by his naval imperialism, in Greek Talosokos, rule of the sea. If he knew nothing else, this would be a sufficient explanation why Crete had practically disappeared from the discussion in Book 3, where only Sparta was being discussed and not Crete. It is completely out, although we are on the island of Crete, and although we are supposed to found a Cretan city. Crete has lost its, uh, its um, a traditional prestige completely. Yes. Could I ask a question about the section that came just before this speech? He says that a state should not find it easy to copy its enemies, in, that, that a state should not find it easy to copy its enemies in bad habits is a good thing. Yeah, the Athenians could, the old Athenians of Minos' time, could not imitate Minos because they did not have a navy. They did not even yeah. have the necessary timber for shipping. I just want to ask, is that saying the same thing as, as, uh, as in Exodus uh, chapter 12, verse 13? It says that uh, Moses led his people not into the land of the Philistines, although it was near. Yeah. Yes, but the reason is perhaps somewhat different thing. The reason is because the land of the Philippines is so near. Yeah. Yeah, sure. One is sure. The other things can, can be presumed to be implied. And, and, it, and, and also, it seems to me that it says here, though with no wish, of course, to recall to you painful memories. Yeah, because that was, uh, no, no uh, to, um, uh, to bear grudges. As an Athenian, he must be supposed to bear grudges against Minos, ah. the torturer of us. Couldn't that also be taken as a, as a living case of the Athenian I mean, I'm now going to another level of interpretation. The idea that he doesn't want to bring the doesn't want to bring Cleinias to consider something that is that bad, because just by the exposure to a memory so painful, a memory of something that yeah, it was bad. no, that is really not probably the. Nessica can means that in remembering evil things, in the first place, evil things one suffer. Yeah. That's which one did. Isn't there a possibility that, that with certain people it's better not to think about evil things with them? Because even if even if, you, if your whole conversation is directed towards virtue, if you think about evil things with them, they'll, they'll be inevitably corrupted by this. Maybe this is a... I doubt whether this is meant. I think it is more... It is a reminder of the old uh, sufferings of Athens and uh, in the context of the question of whether naval power is good. And the Athenian goes so far as to say that it is much better to be exposed to the ravages wrought by a naval power then to have oneself maybe power. That is the point. These exploits are the usual result of employing naval soldiery, and they merit not infinite praise, but precisely the opposite. For one ought never to habituate men to base habits, and least of all the noblest section of the citizens. That such an institution is not a noble one might have been learnt even from Homer, for he makes Odysseus abuse Agamemnon for ordering the Achaeans to fall down their ships to the sea when they were being pressed in fight by the Trojans, and 
His wrath he speaks thus. Dost bid our people hail their fair bench ships, seaward when war and shouting close us, us round? No, so shall the Trojans see their prayers fulfilled, and so on us shall sheer destruction fall. For when the ships are seaward drawn, no more will our Achaeans hold the battle up, but backward glancing they will quit the fray, and thus thus vain for counsel such as thine will prove. So here Homer, or his auditors, there is no distinction necessary to me, uh, they, he is a wise poet. Homer is never blamed in the law, whereas he is blamed in the Republic. He is never blamed. And um, now Homer, he is, confirms his truth that hoplite power, power of the heavy armed infantry, that is the thing which brings about good characters, noble characters, as distinguished from naval power. It is very doubtful whether the passage in the Iliad, which he quotes here, has this meaning. But you see, he can use it without difficulty. Yes? So Homer, too, was aware of the fact that triremes lined up in the sea alongside of infantry fighting on the land are a bad thing. By even lions, if they had habits such as these, would grow used to running away from doves. Moreover, states dependent upon navies for their power to give honors as rewards for their safety to a section of their forces that is not the finest, for they owe their safety to the arts of the pilot, the captain, and the rower. Yeah, the captain is not bad than the, the commander of rowers, yeah? of 50 rowers. That's to say, a kind of non-commissioned officer, not the captain, yes? Men of all kinds and not too respectable, so that it would be impossible to assign the honors to each of them rightly. Yet without rectitude in this, how can it be still how can it still be right with a state? Finance. It is well nigh impossible. Nonetheless, stranger, it was a sea fight at Solomon's, fought by the Greeks against the barbarians, which, as we Cretans at least affirm, saved Greece. So in other words, he turns the battle of Salamis against his anti-naval argument of the Athenians. Salamis, which the Athenian himself has praised so highly, saved Greece from the barbarians, and uh, why should not, therefore, a naval power be desirable? And how does Athenian get out of that fix? Yes, that is what is said by most of the Greeks and barbarians. But we, that is, I myself and our friend Megillus, affirm that it was the land battle of Marathon which began the salvation of Greece, and that of Pythia which completed it. And we affirm also that whereas these battles made the Greeks better, the sea fights made them worse. If one may use such an expression about battles that helped at that time to save us, for I will let you count Art Artemisium also as a sea fight, as well as Salamis. Since, however, our present object is political excellence, it is the natural character of a, of a country and its legal arrangements that we are considering, so that we differ from most people in not regarding mere safety and existence as the most precious thing men can possess, but rather the gaining of all possible goodness and the keeping of it throughout life. This, too, I believe, was stated by us before. Finally, it was. Yeah, and the principle is clear, not life, not living well, living as good as possible, not salvation from danger, mere salvation from danger, but what makes the citizen body better. And from this point of view, the land battle, the land victory, the at um, Marathon and Plataea are to be placed more highly than the naval battles of Salamis and Athenisia. Yes? Athenians. Then let us consider only this, 
whether, you, whether we are traveling by the same road which we took then, as being the best, we took then, yes. which, which we took then, as being the best for states in the matter of settlements and modes of legislation, Finally, the best by far, Athenian. In the next place, tell me this: Who are the people that are to be settled? And now let us talk about that. So he has first discussed as the nature of the terrain, the nature of the territory, and the question pertaining thereto. And now he turns to the people. Aristotle in the seventh book of the Politics does exactly the same, in the same order. But Aristotle, of course, speaks always as a teacher of legislation. And while the Athenian speaks in the first place, as an advisor of a, of a legislator, which is very different. And this explains at least partly the fact that the Athenian, in contradistinction to Aristotle, does not speak of the nature of the citizen body or of the populace. The term does not occur in this very short section, and we shall see soon why. Yes? Will they comprise all that wish to go from any part of Crete, supposing that there has grown up in every city a surplus population too great for the country's food supply? For you are not, I presume, collecting all who wish to go from Greece, although I do indeed see in your country settlers from Argos, Athena, and other parts of Greece. So tell us now, from what quarters the present expedition of citizens is likely to be drawn? Finance. It will probably be from the whole of Crete. Of Crete. Of Crete. And of the rest of the Greeks, they seem most ready to admit people from the Peloponnese as fellow settlers. For it is quite true, as you said just now, that we have some here from Argos, amongst them being the most famous of our clan, the Gortinian, which is a colony from Gortis in the Peloponnese. Yeah, no, so, in other words, it, it, it is not the question of what kind of people will found the new colony. They are under chiefly Cretans and the sprinkling from the Peloponnese. Well, and what about the nature of the people? Well, of these people, that nature is, can be presumed to be known to the Cretans as well as the, to the Athenians. Possibly. It is not a very good subject for discussion among them. And, and that the nature of these of these properties is not discussed. Yes. That then turns to a, another subject which has very much to do with it. It would be it would not be equally easy for states to conduct settlement in other cases, as in those when, like a swarm of bees, a single clan goes out from a single country and settles as a friend coming from friends, being either squeezed out by lack of room or forced by some other such pressing need. At times, too, the violence of civil strife might compel a whole section of a state to emigrate. And on one occasion, an entire state went into exile when it was totally crushed by an overpowering attack. All such cases are, in one way, easier to manage as regards settling and legislation, legislation, but in another way, harder. In the case where the race is one, with the same language and laws, this unity makes for friendliness, since it shares also in sacred rights and all matters of religion. But such a body does not easily tolerate laws or polities which differ from those of its homeland. Again, where such a body has seceded owing to civil strife due to the badness of the laws, but still strives to retain, owing to long habit, the very customs which caused its former ruin, then, because of this, it proves a difficult and intractable subject for the person who has control of its settlement and its laws. On the other hand, the clan that is formed by fusion of various elements would perhaps be more ready to submit to new laws 
but to cause it to share in one spirit and pant, as they say, in unison, like a team of horses, would be a lengthy task and most difficult. But in true legislation and the settlement of states, our tasks that require men perfect above all other men in goodness. And what is the question? You want to found a new city, a new political society. The question is, should the population be homogeneous or heterogeneous? If it is homogeneous, and as if it has the same language and has lived under the same laws and have worshipped the same gods uh, and has the same advice, R-I-T-E-S, then this makes them homogeneous. And then uh, it has great advantages. The cohesion is very great. But on the other hand, the very homogeneity makes them unwilling to change, or rather the cause of the homogeneity makes them unwilling to change their laws, and their laws are perhaps not the best. And the founding of the colony should be taken as an opportunity for introducing new laws. So from this point of view, a heterogeneous population would be preferable. But in that case, you have the difficulty of getting the necessary cohesion. What should you do? Here in this case, the answer is imposed by the decision of the Cretans uh, to choose a qualifiedly heterogeneous population. And therefore, it's not a practical question. But the theoretical question, of course, remains. And it is, not, it is only uh, indicated, not solved, by what the Athenians they see here. What is the solution of the Republic to this very question? Oh, the myth. Pardon? The myth. No, to this particular question, how you can break the power of habit? Send away all people over the age. Yes, yes. Send away all people older than 10, so that they will no longer be under the influence of their parents. But doesn't it have another part to it, the lie about everybody growing up out of the ground? Yeah, that is not, but that is not a practical, I mean, that is not a practical measure proposed in the decisive moment. Yet you have a Socrates solution to the public is a desperate solution. Um, expel everyone older ev- ev- than them. Everyone can figure out that this condemns the city of the Republic uh, uh, to never be positive. Because however desperate uh, and critical the situation may be, uh, the parents would never, and probably also the children, would never accept this as the solution of the critical situation. Here there is a much more uh, practical solution, and that is uh, a controlled degree of heterogeneity. Because the heterogeneity compels the legislator uh, to modify the laws of any section of the population, and uh, therefore uh, to give them the opportunity of cutting out those laws which he regards as bad. Change is possible, under the, and profound change is possible under these conditions. If you, if you remind us of the myth that in the Republic, well, one uh, must say that this myth is not a part of the laws. You, you must uh, 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 
Es ist nicht in einem anderen Weg, es schaut in einem anderen Weg. Diese hopeless difficulty of a radical solution and shows it as much as the expulsion of everyone older than 10. You mean it's impossible to persuade people if they grew up out of the ground? <clears throat> no, but uh, and, uh, what does it mean? What is this? I mean, they are, are told they have been educated beneath the earth. Yes. And they, and they grew up with their instruments in their hands out of the same ground. Yeah, that is minor, but what does this imply? Well, that they're all brothers and sisters and that they're attached to the ground just as yeah, they but, grew up with it. Yeah, but the trouble is that in telling this story, Sugat is uses two different terms. One is the, the ground of the man, the other is the earth. Now, if all are earthborn, this would apply to all human beings and not only to the citizens of this particular city. And then all men would be brothers, and that would be ruinous to political society as Plato understood it. But there's a line around the city, isn't there? Yeah, but this is not arbitrary. It, that doesn't belong to the earth, does it? That is made by men. But then maybe another myth would be necessary to say that that line is given by nature and not by nature. Yeah, all right. But then that is the same myth. Uh, you only add the assertion that it's natural. Yes. So we know now all we have to learn about the nature of the populace, the nature of the territory, the nature of the populace. And now we come to a third point, which is also a condition, belongs to the natural conditions for establishing, for founding a good city, a city directed toward the whole of virtue. Yes? Pinius, very probably, but tell us still more clearly the purport of these observations. Athenian, my good sir, in returning to the subject of lawgivers in our investigation, I may probably have to cast a slur on that. But if what I say is to the point, then there will be no harm in it. Yet why should I vex myself? For practically all human affairs seem to be in the same plight. Cleinias, what is it you refer to? Athenians, I was on the point of saying that no man ever makes laws, but chances and accidents of all kinds occurring in all sorts of ways make our laws for us. For either it is a war that violently upsets polities and changes laws, or it is the distress due to grievous poverty. Diseases too often force on revolution, hoping to the in inroads of pestilences, owing to the inroads of pestilences and recurring bad seasons prolonged over many years. Foreseeing all this, one might deem it proper to say, as I said just now, that no mortal man frames any law, but all human affairs are nearly all matters of pure chance. But the fact is, but although one may appear to be quite right in saying this about seafaring and the arts of the pilot, the physician, and the general, yet there is really, yet there really is something else that we may say with equal truth about these same things. Pinius, what is that? Now let us just stop a moment. Is that is occasioned by the preceding remarks? the solution to this difficulty, heterogeneity or homogeneity, was imposed by, as they say today, by the situation, by the decision of the Cretans to establish a colony to Cretan, on both of Cretans and Peloponnesians. So this was not subject to the power of the legislator, or legislators. The Athenian draws a radical conclusion. Is not all legislation determined by happenings, 
and mostly misapp. So that there is no possibility of choice. And therefore, we cannot say anything beyond. There is no place for the art of legislation. But he is only tempted to say this. He corrects himself immediately. As is shown by the arts he mentions here, piloting, medicine, and generalship, while they depend very, very while the outcome depends very much on chance, and what they do depends very much on opportunities which these arts cannot supply, yet these arts can make a very important contribution. And this leads up to the question of the art of the legislator, as distinguished from the nature is presupposed, the nature of the territory and the nature of the populace. Yes? Athenian, that God controls all that is, and that chance and occasion cooperate with God in the control of all human affairs. It is, however, less harsh to admit that these two must be accompanied by a third factor, which is art. For that the pilot's art should cooperate with occasion, verily I, for one, should esteem that a great advantage. Is it not so? Finance. It is. So, you know, there are, yeah, it all depends how you count. According to one counting, you could say the God controls everything, rules everything. And then, after him, A, chance, B, opportunity, C, art. Or, which is equally possible, the God one, chance and opportunity two, art the third. So that art has a place, if a subordinate, a place within a whole which in the main is supplied the whole is in the main supplied by things beyond human control. Athenian, then we must grant that this is equally true in the other cases also, by parity of reasoning, including the case of legislation. When all the other conditions are present which a country needs to possess in the way of fortune, if it is ever to be happily settled, then every such state needs to meet with a lawgiver who holds fast to the truth. Finally. Yeah, a true, one can also translate simply, a, a true legislator is also required in addition to the right kind of territory and the right kind of populace. If these three things do not come together, and that cannot be achieved by any human art. Uh, if they come together, they coincide, and then there will not be a good city. Yes. Arnian, very true. Athenian, would not then the man who possessed art in regard to each of these crafts mentioned be able to pray a right? for that condition which, if it were given by chance, would need only the supplement of his own art? So now we have the legislator, but now we see the legislator must make another wish or prayer, that's in Greek the same word, a wish or prayer for something which his art cannot provide, apart from the nature of the territory and the nature of the people. And what is that? Finian, certainly. Athenian, and if all the other craftsmen mentioned just now were bidden to state the object of their prayers, they could do say, they could do so, could they not? Finian, of course. Athenian, and the lawgiver, I suppose, could do likewise. Finian, I suppose so. Yeah, it's, he takes a very long road until he leads us up to the legislator's answer to that question, for what would you wish or pray in the first place? Yes? Athenian, 
Come now, O lawgiver, let us say to him, what are we to give you and what condition of state to enable you when you receive it, thenceforward to manage the state by yourself satisfactorily? Finally, what is the next thing that can rightly be said? Athenian, you mean, do you not, on the side of the lawgiver? Yeah, he emphasizes the fact that this is not his answer, but the legislator's answer, and that legislator is, of course, not present. And in addition, he has not even a name. The Athenian has at least the name, the Athenian stranger, but uh, this is a wholly unknown. What does he say? Cronius, yes, Athenian, this is what he will say. Give me the state under a monarchy. And let no, them... Oh, no. A tyrannically ruled city. Give me the state under a tyrannically... Give, give me the tyrannically ruled city. And let the tyrant be young and be possessed by nature of a good memory, quick intelligence, courage, and nobility of manner. And let that quality which we formerly mentioned as the necessary accompaniment of all the parts of virtue attend now also on our tyrant's soul if the rest of his qualities are to be of any value. Cleinias, temperance, as I think, Megillus... And moderation, is that what said? Yeah. Moderation, as I think, Megillus, is what the stranger indicates as the necessary accompaniment, is it not? Athenian, yes, Cleinias, moderation, that is, of the ordinary kind. Not the kind men mean when they use academic language and oh, that is impossible. Even in exalting language. And that's the, the thing which is not done by academic people at all. They don't use exalting language. The poets do that. It's a great barbarism. Uh, not the kind men mean when they use exalting language and identify moderation with wisdom. Yeah, they, they, by some forcing, by some forcing, you know, they, they force the two things together. They force the moderation to be good sense, honest. Because in itself it is not, it is not good sense, yeah? But that kind which by natural instinct springs up at birth in children and animals, so that some are not incontinent, others continent, with respect, in respect to pleasures, and of this we said that when isolated from the numerous so-called goods, it was of no account. You understand, of course, what I mean. Finally, certainly. Athenian, let our tyrant then possess this natural quality in addition to the other qualities mentioned. If the state is to acquire in the quickest and best way possible the constitution it needs for the happiest kind of life, for there does not exist nor could there ever arise a quicker and better form of constitution than this. Yeah, now let us stop here. So we have, as you must have seen, even from the translation, what the legislator needs is this tyrant with these and these qualities. Let's say with this and this nature, there is another natural condition which must be fulfilled if there is to be good legislation, in addition to the territory and the people, and that is the character, the natural character of the tyrant. He has various qualities, moderation, and proper, in the highest sense. And good sense do not belong to his qualities, for the very simple reason he doesn't need them. The legislator is there, and he provides his qualities. The tyrant, as it were, vicariously participates in these virtues which he himself does not possess. But the other qualities which he must have, do they not ring a bell? That he must have a good memory, must be a good learner, must be courageous, must be magnificent. Yes, absolutely. But not all. He omits 
But the philosopher also must possess by nature the qualities of being a lover of truth, and he must have the quality of gracefulness, he must be usurious. This the tyrant does not need, again, I suppose, because the legislator will have them. And is there not implied here something regarding another nature, apart from that of the tyrant? I think the nature of the legislator. That is also something which the legislator cannot supply by himself, which he cannot produce. So that is the third or fourth nature which must be supplied before the art of the legislator can have its effect. It is, of course, um, of the utmost importance that uh, nothing is said here of philosophers. The word philosopher occurs, as far as I know, not at all in the laws, although the word philosophizing occurs very, very rarely. The dialogue abstracts from philosophy for the same reason for which it is sub-Socratic. That is its peculiarity. He will say a few more things about this condition as a tyrant and the coming into being of the best regime. The formulations remind strikingly of those in the Republic, the coming into being of, say, of political power and wisdom is the condition without which the best regime cannot emerge. Yes? Yeah, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's an obvious question here that, uh, according, to what, according to what we've learned about the tyrant in the Republic, he couldn't have this demonic sofa sune either. And he's, he's characterized fundamentally by complete lack of self assumption. Yes, but the Republic is not the only platonic statement uh, on the tyrant. In the Petrus, there is a list of the various ranks of human beings. And in each case, there is a, a good and a bad one. For example, a king or philosopher, and, so and the lowest is a tyrant, but there is also a good tyrant. So one must not take this too academically, Mr. Byrne. Yeah? There was the, the, pubs, the public system of the tyrant. And uh, to speak to Glaucon and Amalantos, who may be impressed by tyrannical teaching, like those suggested by Parasimachus, and Kleinias and Megillus, who are totally unim unimpressed by them, makes a difference. Yeah? And in the tyrant, well, what our modern debunking historians have brought to light is that such tyrants, say, like Pisistratus in Athens, we are not such terrible beasts as a democratic myth presented them. You know, fellows like Wirth and Stalin said. Yeah? But they also have their good side. A Plato knew them. But still, this simplistic presentation, king, tyrant, is not altogether useless, but it is too simple to fit all situations. And Xenophon does it in this way that he presents the possibility of a good time, but does not permit Socrates to present them, but some other man, a poet. But still, he presents them, nevertheless. And this talent is even qualified as someone who has committed an actual number of crimes. And yet, after having come to power, 
and after having learned something from a wise man, uses that power for the benefit of his subjects. And the question is then only, does, is it fatal for a ruler to come to power through force and fraud? Then one would have to consider the other titles of legitimacy and see whether they are so unqualifiedly superior to force and fraud. And this is a long question. We have read something about that in the, in the enumeration of the titles to rule in Book 3. But this is no question. So, we will... Mr. Bird? So, this is the secondary question of how to talk about theory. About? How to talk about theory. About titles? Yeah, about titles. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but is this... There's some question about the propriety of, of ever talking about a good title. Yeah, it all depends. For example, in the case of Flanias and Megillus, like there is no danger because they, being brought up in what now would be called constitutional cities, have only low things for trial. Yeah? There is no... Uh, there is no danger. They are not for one moment attracted by that. Klaukon and Diamond in the language of our time, political idealists are very much endangered by the possibility of tyranny. I believe I don't have to labor that point. And therefore, tyrannies must be presented as absolute wickedness, as it is in the Republic. But when someone is talks to patriots and non-political young men outside of the city walls of Athens, you know, and in the context of the question of erotic speeches, there it is possible to speak somewhat more positively about that. The, the context is terribly important. Yes? Currently, translator here thought that monarchs would have been an equally suitable understanding of what... In the world, it's short. He was what, short. What is, what is it being? our last meeting. Let me remind you again where we stand. We are reading now the fourth book. Now, from book four till the end of the laws, a city is being founded in speech, just as in books two to seven of the Republic. But in the Republic, the founding of the city in speech is in the service of answering the question, what is just? And of proving that the just life is infinitely preferable to the unjust life in books 2 to 10. From this it follows that the question, what is justice, is not the guiding theme of the law. And uh, some other considerations of the criminal nature. So we will as in their result, as standards of judgment, also to cities already found, or to every legislation, past or future. Plato speaks there as teacher of legislators in general. But from book four on, the Athenian is an advisor to a named legislator and founder, here and now, namely to Kleiner, who had revealed that he was commissioned by his city, together with nine other men, to frame a code for a colony to be founded. 
Now, in this capacity, as an advisor to legislators, he raises first the question regarding the nature of the territory. Then he speaks, without using the term nature, of the nature of the political multitude. And finally, he speaks of the nature of the tyrant who is most desirable for the first establishment of an excellent political order. But in speaking of the tyrant, he adumbrates, without saying so, the nature of the legislator himself. So here the, the legislator, as distinguished from the tyrant, has the same nature as the philosophers according to the Republic. The tyrant does not need all the high qualities, only some of them. I think we were, were discussing just this point when we stopped last time. Only one point I should remember. Among the other qualities which the young tyrant must have if he is to be an excellent servant of the legislator is that he must possess moderation, so prosuning. But as the Athenian makes clear, this is the vulgar moderation, not the one which one could would call moderation in exalting speech by compelling moderation to be good sense, honesties. But what children and bees have from their birth, that some of them are moderate in their desires and others immoderate. So this downgrading of moderation, of which we have had some phrases before, is here repeated. The tyrant does not need moderation in the higher sense, in the perhaps somewhat forced sense, in which is the same as inside or good sense itself. He doesn't need it because he is subject to the legislature, and, the, and he vicariously participates in these higher virtues by being his helper. So this is a point we have reached, that is 710 B4. Do you have the passage? Now, let us first read. This nature, namely vulgar moderation, the tyrant should have in addition to the natures previously mentioned, if the city if the city is to acquire a regime, a political order, as quickly and as well as possible. Do you have to Ah, Athenian. Let our monarch then possess this natural... Yeah, why does he say monarch? Why does he not say tyrant? Let our tyrant... I mean, we shouldn't be more, how should I say, Jane Austenian than Plato. Hmm? Possess this natural quality in addition to the other qualities mentioned. If the state is to acquire in the quickest and best way possible the constitution it needs for the happiest kind of life. For there does not exist, nor could there ever arise, a quicker and better form of constitution than this. Okay, so these two requirements mentioned also in the Republic, as quick as possible and as well as possible. Uh, we must see what quick, I believe, does is not in need of an explanation, but well is. And let us see what we find out about it later. Aquinas, how and by what argument, stranger, 
could one convince oneself that to speak this is to speak the truth? I can mean, it is quite easy to perceive, at least this, Aquinas, that the facts stand by nature's ordinance in the way described. Aquinas, in what way do you mean? On condition, do you say that there should be a monarch who is young, quick at learning, with a good memory, brave, and of a noble manner? So he repeats only the things which the Athenian has said, with one minor change. He inverts the order of a good learner and having a good memory. These two things are used by him interchangeably, and that is characteristic of Kleiner. The Athenian had mentioned the memory, having a good memory first, and then being good at learning. Yes? Athenian, add also fortunate, not in other respects, but only in this, that in his time there should arise a praiseworthy lawgiver, and that by a piece of good fortune the two of them should meet. For if this were so, then God would have done nearly everything that he does when he desires that the state should be eminently prosperous. The second best condition is that there should arise two such rulers. Then comes the third death with three rulers, and so on, the difficulty increasing in proportion as the number becomes greater, and vice versa. Finally, you mean apparently that the best state would arise from a monarchy from tyranny, from a tyranny mm. when it has a first-rate lawgiver and a virtuous tyrant. And these are the conditions under which the change into such a state will be effected most easily and quickly. And next to this, from an oligarch, or what is it you mean? Athenian. No, Not wait. Now we know what it means best in contradistinction distinction to quickest. The most easy, most easy. Something may be very quick, but not easy. Yeah? The earlier formula, uh, quick and good, are replaced here by quick and easy. Yes, but the other thought here is clear. The Athenian contradicts one, I think, if we could actually see. Athenian, not at all. The easiest step is from a monarchy. The next easiest, from a constitutional monarchy. I'm sure. No, no, no. From a kingly regime. A kingly regime. A king is distinguished from a tyrant. No constitution is a very, very misleading term that is 17th century rather than Plato. The next easiest, from a kingly regime. The third, from some form of democracy. An oligarchy which comes forth in order would admit of the growth of the best state only with the greatest difficulty, since it has the largest number of rulers. Yeah, no, let's stop it. So the, the transformation into the best regime is most difficult in an oligarchy because there is the largest number of rulers. But are there not many more rulers in a democracy? Yes. There is a man who defines democracy as an oligarchy of orator. I see, so that would, um, and they are not, still, the others have the vote, all have the vote, or all citizens at least have the vote. So what uh, Plato means is this, as he says elsewhere, that democracy is the weakest of the three religions. And therefore, the resistance to a radical change is smaller than in oligarchy. Oligarchy, the regime in which the avaricious rich rule is, that is implied here, the most stable. But from our present point of view, this is undesirable because we do not want now stability, but excellence which is a different consideration. Yes? What I say is that the change takes place when nature supplies a true lawgiver, and when it happens that his policy is shared by the most powerful persons in the state, 
And wherever the state authorities are at once strongest and fewest in number, then and there the changes are usually carried out with speed and facility. Cleinias, how so? We do not understand. Athenian, yes, surely has, it has been stated not once, I imagine, but many times over. But you, very likely, have never so much as set eyes on a tyrannical state. Tyrannically ruled city, yeah. It is very hard to say where he said that. He, uh, the Athenian claims to have said it not only once but many times, but it is hard to identify this thing. And commentators sometimes believe that Plato is quoting himself, say, the Republic or the Seventh Letter, but this is very unlikely. The Athenian stranger is not simply Plato. So one would have to look more closely at the law themselves. But there is one passage of which one must think, especially which we discussed formally in Study 627b2-4, when he speaks of the hostile brothers and the arbiter who is trying to establish peace there. And there, this was an ambiguous passage, but it seemed to mean that the, the best solution would be, the, would be if the nice brother alone would remain in the city and the other ones simply expelled or, or killed. So this is quite a tyrannical solution and would be, and in, surely, an easy and quick solution. Because if you keep them in, you will have troubles all the time. Yes? Plinius, no, nor have I any craving for such a sight. Many of a city ruled by a giant, yes. Athenian, you would, however, see in it an illustration of what we spoke of just now. Plinius, what was that? Athenian, the fact that a monarch, when he decides to change the moral habits of a state, needs no great effort nor a vast length of time. But we see, he yeah, doesn't need toil, toys. The toys, the opposite of toys is easing. And not much time, the first too quick. Yes? But what he does need is to lead the way himself, first along the desired path, whether it be to urge the citizen towards virtues practiced, or the contrary, by his personal exact example, he should first trace out the right lines, giving praise and honor to these things, blame to those, and degrading the disobedient according to their several deeds. Finance. Yes, we may perhaps suppose that the rest of the citizens will quickly follow the ruler who adopts such a combination of persuasion and force. You see, he says quickly, but not best. I, he sees that there would be some annoyance on the part of the subject if they are suddenly be compelled to be virtuous. But a quick it could be, because with the necessary force, this quickness can be guaranteed. Yes? Athenian, let none, my friends, persuade us that a state could ever change its laws more quickly or more easily by any other way than the personal guidance of the rulers. No such thing could ever occur either now or hereafter. Indeed, that is not the result which we find it difficult or impossible to bring about. What is difficult to bring about is rather that result which has taken place but rarely throughout long ages and which, whenever it does take place in a state, produces in that state countless blessings of every kind. Cleinias, what result do you mean? Athenian, whenever a heaven-sent desire for temperate and just institutions arises in those who hold high positions, whether as tyrants or because of conspicuous eminence of wealth or birth, or happily as displayed, displaying the character of Nestor, of whom it is said that while he surpassed all men 
in the force of his eloquence, still more did he surpass them in his temperance. That was, as they say, in the Trojan age, certainly not in our time. Still, if any man existed or shall exist or exists among us now, blessed is the life he leads, and blessed are they who join in listening to the words of temperance that proceed from his mouth. Please stop here. So, a tyrant is not up to the necessary. This uh, desire, this divine desire, this divine passionate desire for moderate and just pursuit may arise in, um, in other people as well. For instance, in the rich, even in the rich. But it may also arise in a man like Nestor, in a Nestor-like man, a man who does not have bodily power, power to coerce, uh, but the power of speaking. This strength of speaking could fulfill the function of the strength of coercing a spell. And that opens up an interesting possibility, namely that a supreme orator might fulfill the function originally entrusted to the virtuous tyrant. When he says here, at the, at the end of what you just read, and uh, if there is there now such a one, like Nesta, among us, whom among us, commentators suggested that we can only name the three interlocutors, because if he thought of himself, this would have been immodest. This, I believe, is not necessarily the way in which Plato looked at this matter. Yes. So likewise of power in general, the same rule holds good. Whenever the greatest power coincides in man with wisdom and temperance, then the germ of the best polity and of the best laws will plant it. But in no other way will it ever come about. Yes. Now, this is, of course, restatement of the central proposition of the Republic, naturally with the omission of philosophy or philosophers. Philosophy and philosophers uh, cannot occur here because of the sub character of the conversation. Yes. Regard this as a myth oracularly uttered and let us take it as proved that the rise of a well-governed state is in one way difficult, but in another way given. That is, the condition we mentioned. It is easier by far and quicker than anything else. Cleinias, no doubt. Athenians, let us ap apply the oracle to your state, and so try, like gray-beard boys, to model its laws by our discourse. Cleinias, Yes, let us proceed and de delay no longer. So, you know, there's a, a play, a game befitting all men uh, that they will do and therefore frame laws in this spirit. Yes? Athenians, let us invoke the presence of the God at the establishment of the state, and may he hearken, and hearkening may he come, propitious and kindly to usward, to help us in the fashioning of the state and its law. Cleinias, yes, may he come. Athenians, well, what form of polity is it that we intend to impose upon the state? So, as now, we have now concluded this part of the third book, which deals with the nature of the various ingredients of the city. And now we come to the work of the legislator, to the art of the legislator, as distinguished from the presupposed nature. And his first action consists 
in determining the regime. And to this he turns now. Kleinian, what in particular do you refer to? Explain still more clearly. I mean, is it a democracy, an oligarchy, an aristocracy, or a monarchy? For certainly you cannot mean a tyranny. That we can never suppose. Athenian, come now. Which of you two would like to answer me first? And tell me to which of these kinds his own polity at home belongs. Megillus, is it not proper that I, as the elder, should answer first? Pontius, no doubt. But it's very rare that Megillus <laughs> steps forth, come out. But he has, of course, an excellent title because he is older. He's elder, older than Kleiner. Yes? Megillus, in truth, stranger, when I reflect on the Lacedaemonian polity, I'm at a loss to tell you by what name one should describe it. It seems to me to resemble a tyranny, since the board of Duke of Ephors it contains is a marvelously tyrannical feature. Yet sometimes it strikes me as, of all states, the nearest to a democracy, since it would be totally absurd to de deny that it is an aristocracy, while it includes, moreover, a life monarchy and that the most ancient of monarchies, as is affirmed, not only by ourselves, but by all the world. But now that I am questioned thus suddenly, I am really, as I said, at a loss to say definitely to which of these polities it belongs. Finally, and I, Megillus, find myself equally perplexed, for I find it very difficult to affirm that our Gnosian polity is any one of these. Now, what would the answer, answers of um, Megillus and Kleinus amount to in somewhat more technical language, what their polities are? They are neither, neither democracies, nor oligarchies, nor aristocracies, nor mixed. Yes. And we have learned that a regime, in order to be good, must be mixed. And therefore, the Athenian praises them in the immediate sequel, without uh, speaking explicitly of mixture. Yes? Athenian, yes, my good sirs, for you do, in fact, partake in a number of qualities. Not a number, but of, um, tr you partake truly of qualities. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but those we named just now are not qualities, but arrangements of states would rule or serve parts of themselves, and each is named after the ruling power. But if the state ought to be named after any such thing, the name it should have borne is that of the God, who is the true ruler of rational men. No, men. So the Athenian does not say now the regime is mixed in Sparta and Crete and ought to be mixed in the colony, the new colony which is supposed to be an excellent city. What has happened here? We have heard before that Dorian regimes are mixed, but we have also learned certain other things since. Perhaps it is not so simple that a mixed regime is superior to a certain kind of simple regime. At any rate, what will happen later in the laws will be not the formed Spartan or Cretan regime, but the Solonian regime, the Solonian regime, which is not mixed in that sense at all, except that uh, it consists of four property classes, and uh, so that the wealthier people are protected against the nasty things the poor might do to them, you know, making the rich, or how you would call it. And so that there would be a mixture of rule of the wealthy and rule of the poor, and this one could say. But it is not a mixed regime in the uh, commonly understood sense. Now, the Athenian makes now an entirely different proposal. He doesn't speak of a mixed regime but 
alter. The best regime is the rule of law, the theocracy, as it later on was called. And now, of course, uh, he must uh, explain what that means. What does Kleinias uh, say here? Kleinias, who is that God? Yeah, very sure. That is one question. But there are other questions which would also arise. Huh? How does this God become audible to the citizen body? Yes. I think maybe we then do a little more storytelling if we are to answer this question suitably. Climbing, climbing. Should we not do so? I think we should. Long ages before even those cities existed whose formation we have described above, there existed in the time of Kronos, it is said, a most prosperous government and settlement on which the best of states now existing is modeled. So the, no, that is even prior to the Kiklopian regime of which we have heard before. There was the regime of Cronus, the father of Zeus, and it seems that this order was destroyed by the cataclysm. So we would have to go back behind the cataclysm to the rule of Cronus. Yes. Cleinias, evidently it is most important to hear about it. Athenian, I for one think so, and that is why I have introduced the mention of it. Megillus, you are perfectly right to do so, and since your story is pertinent, you will be quite right in going on with it to the end. I must do it. But, but there is a certain hesitation here on the part of the Athenian. Uh, we must remember the hesitation he had before he spoke of the tyrant. But at that time, uh, his hesitation led to or was connected with the fact that the answer was given by the legislator, not by the Athenian. Here the situation is somewhat different, because he, the Athenian answers this question, but he answers it by referring to an ancient logos, the story of the age of Cronus, which he will now, now reverse. Yes. Athenian, I must do as you said. Well then, tradition tells us how blissful was the life of men in that age, furnished with everything in abundance and of spontaneous growth. And the cause thereof is said to have been this. Cronus was aware of the fact that no human being, as we have explained, is capable of having irresponsible control of all human affairs without becoming filled with pride and injustice. So, pondering this fact, he then appointed as kings and rulers of our city, not men, but beings of a race that was nobler and more divine, namely, demons. He acted just as we do now in the case of sheep and herds of tame animals. We do not set oxen as rulers over oxen, or goats over goats. But we, who are of a nobler race, ourselves rule over them. In like manner, the God, in his love for humanity, set over us at that time the nobler race of diamonds, who with much comfort to themselves and much to us, took charge of us and furnished peace and modesty and orderliness and justice without sin, and thus made the tribes of men free from feud and happy. Yeah. Now, this same story is also told in the myth of the Satan, but there, a stranger from Elia tells the story to a young Athenian mathematician. Here it is told by an Athenian stranger to two old Dorian lawyers, as we may say. And he does not, is Athenian stranger, as distinguished from the Eleatic stranger, 
does not mention the fact that this caring for human beings, characteristic of the age of Kronos, has ceased under Zeus, that is implied, but in the statement that is explicitly stated. So we are forsaken now, and therefore we must find a human solution to the problem of government. That is here only implied. Yes? And even today, this tale has a truth to tell, namely that wherever a state has a mortal and no god for ruler, there the people have no rest from ills and toils. And it seems that we ought by every means to imitate the life of the age of Kronos, as tradition paints it, and order both our homes and our states in obedience to the immortal element within us, giving to reason's ordering the name of law. Yeah. Now, um, so we not obey these superhuman beings who ruled men in the age of Kronos, but obeying that in us which possesses immortality, and that is the intellect. And the dispensation affected by the intellect, that we will call law. He does not say here logos, which is only created by reason, but he ascends to the highest, higher than logos, and that is the intellect. And of course that is the only form of theocracy which is now possible, or the only approximation to, uh, to theocracy which is now possible. When he spoke of the relation of law and logos, and particularly, in particular the true logos, they were identified and they were not identified. This ambiguous treatment pointed to a great difficulty. Here this ambiguity is avoided uh, by a simple identification of the dispensation of the intellect with the law. And we can draw a, a further conclusion. This is the only way in which there can be a legislation under Zeus, dispensation of the intellect. The uh, Cretan legislation, allegedly due to Cronus's son, Zeus, that is not possible. That is not possible. This is here implicitly excluded. Yes? But if an individual man, or an oligarchy, or a democracy, possessed of a soul which strives after pleasures and lusts and seeks to surfeit itself therewith, having no continence and being the victim of a plague that is endless and insatiate of evil, if such an one shall rule over a state or an individual by trampling on the law, then there is, as I said just now, no means of salvation. This then is the statement, Cleinias, which we have to examine to see whether we believe it or what we are to do. Cleinias. Yeah, now this seems to be clear. The rule of law, uh, the regime is, must be the rule of law, not of men. But you have heard that formula very often. And that the rule of law is somehow the rule of God. How is not said. But this is, of course, not obviously true. We know a bit about law, and some facts seem to suggest an entirely different interpretation. And that is brought out in the secret. Finance. We must, of course, believe it. Athenians, are you aware that, according to some, 
There are as many kinds of laws as there are kinds of constitutions. Yeah, regimes, you know. Regimes. And how many regimes are commonly recognized? We have recently recounted. Please do not suppose that the problem now raised is one of small importance. Rather, it is of the highest importance. For we are again faced with the problem as to what ought to be the aim of justice and injustice. The assertion of the people I refer to is this, that the laws ought not to aim either at war or at goodness in general, but ought to have regard to the benefit of the established regime, whatever it may be, so that it may keep in power forever and never be dissolved and that the natural definition of justice is best stated in this way. Now, let us wait here for one moment. So, we, this is a very important statement. You remember, formerly we were confronted with this alternative, the end of legislation, the end at which the legislator must aim, is either war, or the virtue of war, the courage, or else the whole virtue. But now an alternative solution is suggested. However this may be, the, the alternative, but even this third, uh, third alternative is an answer to the question regarding justice. So it follows that, contrary to what I said before, the Republic, the laws, is devoted to the question of what justice is. Now, how can one reconcile these two things? The, the Republic, the laws, is not as obviously devoted to the question of justice as the Republic is. Now, what is the reason for that? The Platonic reason is that uh, only in the Republic of these two works, the question of justice is the guiding thing. I believe one can say that the solution proposed in the Republic is that the just life is a philosophic life. And since the philosophic life is not to become a theme of the laws, for very good reason, justice cannot be the guiding theme. But in a limited way, a very qualified way, justice is of course also the subject of the laws. The last remark that we must repeat, the natural definition of the just will follow from what we have just heard about the relation of laws and regimes. And Kleinius does not quite understand, therefore, Athenian answers this question. Kleinius, in what way? Athenian that justice is what benefits the stronger. Clinius, explain yourself more clearly. Athenian, this is how it is. The laws, they say, in a state, are always enacted by the stronger power. Is it not so? Clinius, that is quite true. Athenian, do you suppose then, so they argue, that a democracy or any other government, even a tyrant, if it has gained the mastery, will of its own accord set up laws with any other primary aim than that of securing the permanence of its own authority. Pliny, certainly not. Athenian. Then the lawgiver will style these enactments justice and will punish every transgressor as guilty of injustice. Pliny, that is certainly probable. Athenian. So these enactments will thus and herein always constitutes justice. Finally, that is, at any rate, what the argument asserts. This counter-argument, the, the alternative view was the law is a dispensation affected by the intellect, or the rule of law is in some way the rule of God, and to the opposite view, the rule of law is the rule of as the law is just the rule of the strong one. So justice itself is the rule of the strong one. Yes. 
Well, you remember that it's from the first book of the Republic where Sarasimhavad sets forth this view. And the basis of this view is not primarily some nasty Machiavellian cynicism, but the undeniable fact that in all political communities the laws are laid down by the stronger part. Stronger does not necessarily mean more numerous, of course, but the stronger part, and this stronger part, of course, can't help thinking of its of itself and of its own interest in the first place. Yes? Yes, for this is one of those agreed claims concerning government. Finally, what claims? Athenians, those which we dealt with before, claims as to who should govern whom. It was shown that parents should govern children, the older, the younger, the high-born, the low-born, and, if you remember, there were many other claims, some of which were conflicting. The claim before us is one of these, and we, and we said that, to quote Pindar, the law marches with nature when it justifies the right of might. Plinius, yes, that is what we said then. Athenian, consider to which class of men should we entrust our state? For the condition referred to is one that has already occurred in state thousands of times. So now he formulates the question of the regime more precisely. To whom shall we entrust the state? Of course, to what kind of human being shall we entrust the state? This question is not answered by the question that the law should rule, and the rule of law is the rule of God. Yes. Clinius, what condition? Athenian, where offices of rule are open to contest, the victors in the contest monopolize power in the state so completely that they offer not the slightest share in office to the vanquished party or their descendants, and each party keeps a watchful eye on the other, lest anyone should come into office and, in revenge for the former troubles, cause a rising against them. Such polities we of course deny to be polities, just as we deny that laws are true laws unless they are enacted in the interest of the common weal of the whole state. So here we get a somewhat different um, uh, 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 notion that a true law must, must aim at the common good and not at a, the good of a section. And what happens in all these other cities uh, is a section, uh, is uh, that the laws aim at a section good. Yes? But where the laws are enacted in the interest of a section, we call them feudalities or rather than polities and the justice they ascribe to such laws, we say, an empty name. Our reason for saying this is that in your state we shall assign office to a man not because he is wealthy, nor because he possesses any other quality of the kind, such as strength or size or birth, but the ministration of the laws must be assigned, as we assert, to that man who is most obedient to the laws and wins the victory for obedience in the state. The highest office to the first, the, the next to him that shows the second degree of mastery, and the rest must similarly be assigned, each in succession, to those that come next in order. And those who are termed magistrates, I have now called ministers of the law, not for the sake of coining a new phrase, but in the belief that salvation or ruin for a state hangs upon nothing so much as this. For whenever in a state the law is subservient and impotent over that state, I see ruin impending. But whenever the law is lord over the magistrates, and the magistrates are servants to the law, there I describe salvation and all the blessings that the gods bestow on states. 
the term which he translates by servant, at least in the last page, um, is all is the same as slaves. Yeah? Slaves of the law. Yes. You know, rule of law is the rule of God, and it follows that the human beings who are to be entrusted with rule must be the most law-abiding of the citizens, and not the richest or the most noble or whatever else other qualities he might have. But this, of course, does not answer one little question. It is not merely a question of obeying the law. It is also the question who will make laws in that society. This simple solution of absolute obedience to the law as a highest consideration would be sufficient if the laws were simply immutable. But whether this is feasible, that uh, is a question, and it will later on, um, later on, it will be explicitly discussed. So, if human beings are to be legislators, they cannot be simply observants or slaves of the laws, but they must be makers of laws, and then we are up against it over difficulty. Yes, Clinius. I, by heaven, stranger, for as befits your age, you have keen sight. There isn't uh, that by Zeus, he says, and uh, the oath fits the theocratic context uh, quite obviously. Yes. Athenian. Yes, for a brave, yes, for a man's vision of such objects is at its dullest when he is young, but at its keenest when he is old. Plinius, very true. Athenian. What then is to be... No, wait, no, let us stop here. You see, this remark about uh, the superiority of the old man to the young uh, fits the context, of course, perfectly, because when the difference and the possible conflict between law and true lovers disappears, then the difference between old age and wisdom will correspondingly disappear. So that is, I think, in perfect order. Now, hitherto we have seen what the first step of the legislator following his art is, to establish the regime. And that is by no means fulfilled, this task, but in a, a very general des description of it is given up to this point. Should we not make here a stop and discuss what we have read? It has something to do with that. Yeah, something with, uh, yeah. The Dorian context, the sub Socratic context, and for the same reason for which philosophy or the philosophers do not occur. That is a very defensible abstraction. Because, uh, well, think of the modern philosophers. Which role do the philosophers play in their political construction? Say in Hobbes, in Locke, in Rousseau, and even in Kant, and in Hegel, in Hegel's philosophy of right, and even in Aristotle. Where are the philosophers there as members of the citizen body? When he enumerates the parts of the police, the priests are there, but not the philosophers. Context, 
I beg your pardon? I didn't understand the adjective. Is what kind of context? Yes, you can say so. Yeah. But the trouble is that the polis has this ambiguity. In a way, it is close to philosophy. But in another way, it points to philosophy. And therefore, as this cannot be maintained in the long run, this abstraction from philosophy. And in the laws, uh, there will be some philosophic discussions later on, toward the end. I mean, philosophic in the traditional sense of the word philosophy. I want to ask a question about the distinction made between feudalities and polity. Yeah, well, that is, a, I understand, a, an embarrassment of the translator. The Greek word is stasiotai, and, and not politai. Politai means citizen. And stasis is derived, stasiota is derived from stasis, the uh, Greek word for civil strife, sedition, rebellion. So there will be, can you say sedition? Yeah. It, it is an awkward, uh, I mean, it, it's a coinage of Plato, I believe. Yeah. Would, it, would it be the case that, that uh, in examining all organized groups of men that have a leader. In, in examining all organized groups of men that have a leader, we could divide the groups according to whether they were founded on the principle of loyalty or whether they were founded on the principle of courage. Courage? Courage. It seems that, that a feudality has something to do with... No, no, that they don't pay any attention well, to that feudality. That is... That is Barry's Barry's coin and Barry's embarrassment, which is perfectly excusable, but it also leads away from Plato. I think that I, I, there was no I'm concept sure of what, feudality. Yeah, I'm not sure what what that word means, but it seems say sedition. Yeah, it seems that there is a there is an, an alternative thing upon which a group of men with a leader might be founded, other than yeah. loyalty. That is no, that is not the point. Uh, what uh, Plato has in mind is either the community or in its laws aim at the common good or at a sectional good. And these sectionalists, they are the seditionists. The true citizens are those who aim at the common good. It started with a fight. It says here at the beginning yeah, sure. of this speech, the offices of rule are open to contest, the victors in the contest yeah, are then, lawful the, He starts from, a, from an experience, more or less common to all times and places, is that various parts of the city wish to be in control. And what happens ordinarily is, is that the victorious part absolutizes its sectional interest to the detriment of the sectional interest which it dethroned. I, I was just trying to point out that, that perhaps the, the fundamental element in a fight that determines which way the fight goes is the notion of courage, and that a state that begins with a fight is founded upon courage. Whereas a state no. that begins with reason is founded upon loyalty. There is something, it, it, there is nothing said about here that the state begins with fight. There are people, men live in cities, and then from time to time there are upheavals, what they now call revolution. That he has in mind. And that can, is open. Uh, maybe both parts are equally courageous, maybe one part is more courageous than the other, and there is, of course, loyalty also, in principle, on both sides. The Democrats are loyal to the democratic cause, and the oligarchs are loyal to the oligarchic cause. All these things are discussed in greater detail, 
and perhaps more intelligently in Aristotle's politics, all these things. Also this competition for supremacy in the city of which he speaks here. So we know now, provisionally at any rate, what's the best regime is. And now he turns to another subject in uh, 715 E3. Finance, very true. Athenian, what then is our next step? May we not assume that our immigrants have arrived and are in the country, and should we not proceed with our address to them? Cleinias, of course. So now that in this new part, the Athenian will address in his own name, and in Cleinias' name, the future citizens, the future colonists, and what he's going to say to them. Yes? Athenian, let us then speak to them thus. O men that God, who, as old tradition tells, holdeth the beginning, the end, and the center of all things that exist, completeth his circuit by nature's ordinance in straight, unswerving course. With him followeth justice always as an aven- as avenger of them that fall short of the divine law. And she again is followed by every man who would fain be happy, cleaving to her with lowly and orderly behavior. But whoso is uplifted by vain glory or prideth himself on his riches or his honors or his comeliness of body and through his pride joined to youth and folly is inflamed in soul with insolence, dreaming that he has no need of ruler or guide, but rather is confident himself to guide others. Such an one is abandoned and left behind by the God. And when left behind, he taketh to him others of like nature, and by his mad prancings throweth all into confusion. To many indeed he seemeth to be some great one, but after no long time he payeth the penalty not unmerited to justice. When he bringeth to total ruin himself, his house, and his country. You know, wait, well, the only one point I would like to mention. The term he translates lowly is the same, which is tapainos, which is used in the New Testament, for humility. That is the only occasion, as far as I know, in which Plato or praises humility. It is usually used in a, neg- in, in a, a, a negative sense. Yes, so this is a very pious speech. Uh, Looking at these things thus ordained, what ought the prudent man to do, or to devise, or to refrain from doing? Cleinias, the answer is plain. Every man ought so to devise as to be of the number of those who follow in the steps of God. Athenian, what conduct then is dear to God and in his steps? Yes, this Plania uh, uh, said being silent on his conduct and the action. He had only spoken of the state of mind, as it were, of the right state of mind. Yes. One kind of conduct expressed in one ancient phrase, namely that light is dear to light. When it is moderate, whereas when it is moderate, whereas immoderate things are dear neither to one another nor to things moderate. In our eyes, God will be the measure of all things in the highest degree, a degree much higher than is any man they talk of. So that is a famous, uh, an allusion to the famous proposition of Protagoras that man is the measure of all things, to which Plato opposes uh, the view that God is the measure of all things, but he qualifies it. God deserves, we can say, to a much higher degree uh, to be called the master of all things than some human being, any human being. Yes. He then that is to become dear to such an one must needs become, so far as he possibly can, of a like character, and according to the present argument, 
he amongst us that is tempered is dear to God. Yeah, but I took from what Adrian said, I was by moderate. So we have now rehabilitated moderation completely, and that is in perfect agreement with the praise of humility in the same context. Yes? Since he is like him, for he that is not tempered is unlike and at enmity, as is also he who is unjust and so, like lo- so likewise with the rest by parity of reasoning. On this there follows, let us observe, this further rule, and of all rules it is the noblest and the truest, that to engage in sacrifice and communion with the gods continually, by prayers and offerings and devotions of every kind, is a thing most noble and good and helpful toward the happy life, and superlatively fitting also for the good man, but for the wicked the very opposite. For the wicked man is unclean of soul, whereas the good man is clean, and from him that is defiled, no good man nor God can ever rightly receive gifts. Therefore, all the great labor that impious men spend upon the gods is in vain, but that of the pious is most profitable to them all. Here then is the mark at which we must aim. But as to the shafts we should shoot, and, so to speak, the flight of them, what kind of shafts think you would fly most straight to the mark? So the aim is assimilation to God, and that means being moderate and living a moderate life in the full sense of the word moderate. And now we come to the specification. What does such a moderate life precisely mean? Yes? First of all, we say, if after the honor is paid to the Olympian and the gods who keep the state, we should assign the even and the left as their honors to the gods of the underworld, we would be aiming most straight at the mark of piety, as also in assigning to the former gods the things superior, the opposites of these. Next, after these gods, the wise man will offer worship to the daemons, and after the daemons to the heroes. After these will come private shrines, legally dedicated to ancestral deities, and next, honors paid to living parents. For to these, duty enjoins that the debtor should pay back, first and the greatest of debts, the most primary of all dues, and that he should acknowledge that all that he owns and has belongs to those who begot and reared him, so that he ought to give them service to the utmost of his power, with substance, with body, and with soul, all three, thus making returns for the loans of care and pain spent on the children by those who suffered on their behalf in bygone years, and recompensing the old in their old age when they need help most. And throughout all his life, he must diligently observe reverence of speech toward his parents above all things, seeing that for light and winged words, there is a most heavy penalty. For over all such matters, Nemesis, messenger of justice, is appointed to keep watch. Therefore, the son must yield to his parents when they are wrong. And when they give rein to their wrath, either by word or deed, he must pardon them, seeing that it is most natural for a father to be especially wrong when he deems that he has been wronged by his own son. When parents die, the most modest funeral rites are best, whereby the son neither exceeds the accustomed pomp nor falls short of what his forefathers paid to their sires. And in like manner, he should duly bestow the yearly attentions which ensure honor on the rites already completed, He should always venerate them by never failing to provide a continual memorial and assigning to the deceased a due share of the means which fortune provides for expenditure. Every one of us, if we acted thus and observed these rules of life, would win always a due reward from the gods and from all that are mightier than ourselves, and would pass the greatest part of our lives in the enjoyment of hopes and happiness. 
So this is the end of the speech of the Athenian and Kvanias to the new citizen. And it, the, the subject is piety. Piety is the fundamental virtue on which everything depends. But he also says moderation. And he enumerates the various duties, as we can say, which are, which are implied in that. But he speaks most fully of the duties to parents, to one's parents, living or dead. That belongs to piety, but it's a sense in which also in Latin, pietas, it means this in the first place. Then he concludes his speech. Yes. As regards duties to children, relations, friends, and citizens, and those of service done to strangers for heaven's sake, and of social intercourse with all these those classes, by fulfilling which a man should brighten his own life and order it as the law enjoins, the sequel to the laws themselves, partly by persuasion, partly when men's habits defy persuasion, by forcible and just ch chastisement, will render our state, with the concurrence of the gods, a blessed state and prosperous. There are also matters which a lawgiver, if he shares my view, will necessarily regulate, though they are ill-suited for statement in the form of a law. In dealing with these, he ought, in my opinion, to produce a sample for his own use and that of those for whom he is legislating, and after expounding all other matters as best he can, pass on next to commencing the, ta the task of legislation. So that was this, what was stated in that long speech and in the quasar appendix to it is not yet legislation. What it is, he will explain soon. But even before he made a distinction between what belongs to legislation, like, for example, what one, how one has to behave towards neighbors and kin and uh, fellow citizens, strangers and so on, as distinguished from parents and other higher beings. And now he makes insensible transition to the third step of the legislator. The first was to repeat the clarification of what the best regime is. The second was the address to the future citizens. And then he takes the first step, which consists, in a word, in trying to fill the greatest lacuna in what he had said before about the law, that law is a dispensation affected by the intellect. This is very incomplete, and he will now show why and in what respect it is incomplete. Yes? Plinius, what is the special form in which such matters are laid down? No, you omitted something, I believe, didn't you? What? Did you not omit the end of the Athenian speech? You you read only that he will that he will thereafter begin with the laying down of the laws, and then. Oh, he omitted that. I read right down to here, and then I continued here. Oh, I see. All right, that is not right. Yeah. Athenian. It is by no means easy to embrace them all in a single model of statement, so to speak. But let us conceive of them in such a way as this, in case we may succeed in affirming something definite about them. Let us, Cleinias, tell us what that something is. Athenian, I should desire the people to be as docile as possible in the matter of virtue. And this evidently is what the legislator will endeavor to effect in all his legislation. Cleinias, assuredly, Athenian, 
I thought the address we have made might prove of some help in making them listen to its monitions with souls not utterly savage, but in a more civil and less hostile mood, so that we may be well content if, as I say, it renders the hearer even a little more docile, because a little less hostile. So there is no great plenty or abundance of persons anxious to become with all speed as good as possible. The majority indeed served to show how wise Hesiod was when he said, smooth is the way that leadeth unto wickedness, and that no sweat is needed to traverse it, since it is passing short. But, he says, in front of goodness the immortal gods have set the sweat of toil, and thereunto long is the road, and steep and rough withal, the first ascent. But when the crest is won, tis easy traveling, albeit it was hard. Yes, so the first consideration which he suggests here is this, that the majority of men are rather lukewarm to the acquisition of virtue. That we must keep in mind. And then he quotes Hesiod with uh, some slight variations. But we know that this is not due to a different tradition, uh, because in, in, an, in the Protagoras, Plato quotes this, as in our Hesiod uh, manuscripts, the only deviation which he makes is especially in the last verse he quotes, when he says, after virtue is easy to bear, whereas in Hesiod it is, Virtue dwells easily once you have reached the heights. This we have mentioned passing. Yes, and then the answer of Cleinias. Cleinias, the poet speaks nobly, I should say. Yeah, it is funny that the reply of Cleinias is metrical, and you will see so kalos legonti, and uh, later on. After some time, in 722a, there will be another metrical reply of Cleinias. The reason of this jocular comments is that we come now to speak of poets, and in which way we will see. Yes? Athenian. He certainly does. Now I wish to put before you what I take to be the result of the foregoing argument. Cleinias, do so. Athenian, let us address the lawgiver and say, Tell us, O lawgiver, if you knew what we ought to do and say, is it not obvious that you would state it? Cleinias, inevitably. So, if, 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 a big if. Now, let us, let us assume that the legislator is not a man of supreme knowledge then we would be confronted with this situation. This legislator is supposed to lead to virtue men imperfectly motivated to virtue, and he lacking the full knowledge required. This would be, uh, quote, a realistic, unquote, view of laws, um, and we must see how to fit it in with what we have heard before, what a law should be. Yes? Athenian. Now, did we not hear you saying a little while ago that the lawgiver should not permit the poets to compose just as they please, for they would not be likely to know what anything of theirs might be contrary to the laws and injurious to the state. Yes, that we have heard indeed. Now, but the thought is going this way. The legislator is not necessarily a man of supreme knowledge, a truly wise man. Now, what kind of human beings, apart from the legislator, could possibly be wise in the sub-Socratic context, only the poets. 
And therefore, we come now to the poets and see whether they do not help us out of the predicament. But the difficulty is this, of course, that we have previously subordinated the poets to the legislator's control and censorship. Now, but if the legislator is not supremely wise, we may have to reconsider it. Yes. Cleinias, that is quite true. Athenian, would our address be reasonable if we were to address him on behalf of the poets in these terms? Cleinias, what terms? Athenian. So now he addresses the legislator together with Cleinias on behalf of the poets and appear in from that speech itself, he speaks to the legislator in the name of the poets, not only on behalf of them. And now what does he say? There is, O lawgiver, an ancient saying constantly repeated by ourselves and endured... By ourselves, by us poets, yes? By us poets. No, no, no. That is explanation, that is not text. Oh. And endorsed by everyone else, that whenever a poet is seated on the muse's tripod, he is not in his senses, but resembles a fountain which gives free course to the upward rush of water. And since his art consists in imitation, he is compelled often to contradict himself when he creates characters of contradictory mood, and he knows not which of these contradictory utterances is true. But it is not possible for the lawgiver in his law thus to compose two statements about a single matter, but he must always publish one single statement about one matter. Take an example from one of your own recent statements. A funeral may be either excessive or deficient or moderate. Of these three alternatives, you choose one, the moderate. And this you prescribe after praising it unconditionally. I, on the other hand, if in my poem I had a wife of surpassing wealth and she were to bid me bury her, would extol the tomb of excessive grandeur, while a poor and stingy man would, pri would praise the defective tomb. And the person of moderate means, if a moderate man himself, would praise the same one as you. But you should not merely speak of a thing as moderate in the way you have now done, but you should explain what the moderate is and what is its size. Otherwise, it is too soon for you to propose that such a statement should be made law. Finally, exceedingly true. Yeah, so that is talking. So in other words, it appears that now the legislator has to sit at the feet of the poet. And the example would indicate why. The poet voices what very different kinds of human beings demand, think, feel. They would instruct the legislator in the natures and habits, in the variety of natures and habits of human beings and to which, as the stranger had referred at the end of the first book. But this is, of course, only a very small part of the story. Let us see that. Now, the poet, the simplest example is that, of course, of a dramatic poet, but it would apply to all poets, is this. They have an art, the art of imitation, that's clearly said. But at the same time, when they are creative, as they say today, they are not in their senses. And this leads to the consequence that they do not know whether what they say is in agreement with the law or not. 
It's funny, and because they could very, very well find out immediately after being out of their trance. But what does it say here? So they they make they create human beings who are of opposite or so let us say contradictory dispositions, like that rich woman and that stingy poor man. Yeah? And therefore the consequence is that the poet contradicts himself, which is I think not true. Because if he makes the rich woman speak in this way and the stingy man speak in that way, the poet doesn't contradict himself at all. Nor does he show that he does not know which of the contradictory statements is true, because that is not his primary concern. The primary concern is whether the speeches he makes are fit the different characters or not. So this statement about the poets is in itself self-contradictory. And it is based on the ancient story going back to the poets and propagated by the poets, which says the poets are not responsible for what they say, whereas in fact they are. At any rate, the poets are said to say different things on the same subject. The legislator, of course, must say only one thing on the same subject. Now, to say different things on the same subject to different people, that precisely is irony in the original meaning of the term. And it is obvious that the legislator's speech must, under no circumstances, be ironic. This, I believe, doesn't need any proof. So, now, what about Plato's own speech? It is clear that Plato also makes different human beings say different contradictory things, just as he just reproduce the speech of those who say that the laws are dependent on the regimes and therefore are made in the interest of the strong and not with a view to any other aim. But the legislator's speech must be radically different. So Plato's writing must be diametrically opposed to the legislator's writings. Now, whether that is the last word about that legislator, who is a platonic legislator, that remains to be seen. At any rate, we are now confronted with the question, and which will be discussed in the immediate sequence, must the legislator's own speech be truly simple, as it is stated here, truly simple, or must it not also be twofold or even manifold as the speeches of the poets? And that uh, uh, the answer which he will give is, at least to begin with, is they must be twofold. And that means in principles or principle also manifold. And if this is true, then indeed the Platonic legislator, the legislator inspired by Plato, in his speeches would approximate the Platonic speech. And this difference would disappear. But the completely non-Platonic legislator, that is clear his speeches would be at the other pole of the platonic speeches. I believe that is the strongest statement on behalf of the poets, which occurs in Plato's writings. And there is also no accident that it occurs in the laws in which uh, um, uh, Homer 
and his yacht, of course, are never uh, blamed as they are in the Republic. That has all to do with his, with the fact that philosophy is pushed out of sight, but it is always there. Nevertheless, is there any point you would like to bring up? And we will meet next week. Okay, and we can start. We are reading now the fourth book, the first book in which the Athenian speaks as an advisor of Cleinias, of an individual legislator here and now, and no longer merely as a teacher of legislators in general. And in this, the first subject which he takes up is the nature of the land, of the population, and of his helper, his most desirable helper, a young tyrant. And that implies also, as we have seen, the nature of the legislator himself. After he has completed this discussion, he turns to the three fundamental acts of the legislator's art, those acts which precede the legislation proper. And here again we have a tripartition. First, the determination of the regime, which is to use a non-Platonic word, a theocracy. More precisely, the rule of the intellect, the dispensation affected by the intellect, by the nous or noos, is nomos, law. So it is rule of law, not rule of man. There follows as a second act, the allocution to the future colonists or citizens who are exhorted to piety and humility. There is also an exhortation to the future citizens in the Republic in 415A to B in the context of the noble lie, much shorter statement and, and very different statement. Now, the third step and this is the one with which we are now concerned, is this. Here, the Athenian reconsiders what he had said first on law. And he starts from two facts. The majority of men are lukewarm to the acquisition of virtue, and the legislator is likely to be a man of imperfect knowledge. Then we have this situation in legislation. A man of imperfect knowledge is to lead to virtue human beings who are not very eager to acquire virtue. And that is a difficult a proposition. Now, the lack of evidence of the legislator's prescription due to the imperfection of his knowledge, and on the other hand, the recalcitrance of the people calls in the first place for coercion. So from this point of view, the law is nothing but coercive command, as it is most clearly in later thinkers in Hobbes. But in Plato, this is only the flooring, because the other statement on law, that it is a dispensation affected by the intellect, must not be forgotten. But this first statement, that law is a dispensation affected by the intellect, is the ceiling. And between this flooring and that ceiling, the whole task 
of legislation moves, of any uh, respectable legislation moves. Now, these two extremes, coercion and interact, call for a mediation. And that mediation is affected by persuasion. The most effective persuaders are the poets. And therefore, the Athenian leads up to this subject, as we have already seen last time. But I think we should reread the section on poets which we began in 719 B4. Can you perhaps tell the others on which so, page? Page 305. 305. Yes. Um, Athenian. Now, did we not hear you saying a little while ago that the lawgiver should not permit the poets to compose just as they pleased? For they would not be likely to know what saying of theirs might be contrary to the laws and injurious to the state. So, in other words, previously the poets had been subordinated to the legislators because of their ignorance of what seemed to be most important, namely of the law. This is perhaps not so easy to understand because why should the poets not know the laws? You know, in our time, the poets who praise all kinds of weird things condemned by the legislators know very well that these things are condemned by the legislator. This is the first minor difficulty, but let us see how he proceeds. Cleinias, that is quite true, Athenian. Would our address be reasonable if we were to address him on behalf of the poets in these terms? Cleinias, what terms? So now, the Athenian addresses now the legislator on behalf of the poets. That's to say, he wishes to make a case for the poets against the legislator. And as you will see, he talks to the, uh, he speaks to the legislator not only on behalf of the poets, but he makes the poets or poet himself speak. Yes? Athenian, these. There is, O lawgiver, an ancient saying constantly repeated by ourselves and endorsed by everyone else, that whenever a poet... By ourselves, he means here the, by, uh, by ourselves, by the poets. The poets have originated this story, yes? But it has been accepted by all men, yes? that whenever a poet is seated on the muse's tripod, he is not in his senses, but resembles a fountain which gives free course to the upward rush of water. And since his art consists in imitation, he is compelled often to contradict himself when he creates characters of contradictory moods, and he knows not which of these contradictory utterances is true. Yes, so the poets are, according to their own acclaim, they possess an art, which means they, are, they know what they are doing. But on the other hand, they deny that they know what they are doing while in the state of poetic production. And furthermore, they make their characters say contradictory things because the characters have contradictory dispositions, but they do not know which of, of their characters, if any, says the truth. The poets might say that this is not their major concern, or not their first concern, the first concern being whether the speeches fit the characters. Yes? But it is not possible for the lawgiver, in his law, thus to compose two statements about a single matter. But he must always publish one single statement about one matter. Take an example from one of your own recent statements. A 
funeral may be either excessive or defective or moderate. Of these three alternatives, you choose one, the moderate, and this you prescribe after praising it unconditionally. I, on the other hand, I, the poet, yeah. if in my poem I had a wife of surpassing wealth and she were to bid me to bury her, would extol the tomb of excessive grandeur, while a poor and stingy man would praise the defective tomb and the person of moderate means, if a moderate man, would praise the same one as you. But you should not merely speak of a thing as moderate in the way you have now done, but you should explain what the moderate is and what is its size. Otherwise, it is too soon for you to propose that such a statement should be made law. Finally, exceedingly true. You know, let us see. So uh, what is the legislator supposed to learn uh, from the poet? Uh, the, that the legislator's speech is insufficient is not precise enough. It is not quite clear whether the poet means that the legislator should prescribe different burial expenses to that rich woman, to that poor man, or the man of moderate means. That is not clear. But the poet would always speak in the character of these three different people. In the center, you see the stingy and poor man. That is more a comical character than the two others, yeah? And so that uh, it's not too surprising that the comical should be in the center. Now, at any rate, the poet's speech is manifold, and the legislator's speech must be simple, warm born about born subject. But now the question arises, as we shall see from the sequel, as to whether one can leave matters at the unqualified university of the legislator's speeches. Must the legislator too not speak in a manifold manner? And if he has to do that, must he not learn from the poets how to speak, how to speak in a manifold manner? Yes. Athenian. Should then our appointed president of the laws commence his laws with no such prefatory statement, but declare at once what must be done and what not, and state the penalty which threatens disobedience, and so turn off to another law without adding to his statutes a single word of encouragement and persuasion? Just as it is the way with doctors, one treats us in this fashion, and this in this fashion, and another in that. They have two different methods, which we may recall in order that, like children who beg the doctor to treat them in the mildest method, so that we may make a like request of the lawgiver. Shall I give an illustration of what I mean? There are men that are doctors, we say, and others that are doctor's assistants. But we call the latter also, to be sure, by the name of doctors. Kindness, we do. Athenian. These, whether they be freeborn or slaves, acquire their art under the direction of their masters, by observation and practice, and not by the study of nature, which is the way in which the freeborn doctors have learned the art themselves, and in which they instruct their own disciples. Would you assert that we have two classes of what are called doctors? Cleinias, certainly. Athenian, you are also aware that the sick folk in the cities comprise both slaves and free men, the slaves are usually doctored by slaves who either run round the town or wait in their surgeries, and not one of these doctors either gives or receives any account of the several ailments of the various domestics, but prescribes for each what he deems right from experience, just as though he had exact knowledge, and with the assurance of an autocrat, a tyrant, 
of a tyrant. Then up he jumps and off he rushes to another sick domestic. And thus he relieves his master in his attendance on the sick. But the freeborn doctor is mainly engaged in visiting and treating the ailments of free men. And he does so by investigating them from the commencement and according to the course of nature. He talks with the patient himself and with his friend, and thus both learns himself from the sufferers and imparts instruction to them as far as possible. And he gives no prescription until he has gained the patient's consent, and only then, while securing the patient's continued docility by means of persuasion, does he attempt to complete the task of restoring him to health. Which of these two methods of doctoring shows the better doctor, or of training, the better trainer? Should the doctor perform one and the same function in two ways, or do it in one way only? And that the worst way of these two is the less humane. Cleinias, the double method, stranger, is by far the better. Yeah. No, he has not yet made here an application to the legislator, and has spoken hitherto only of medicine as the two classes of physicians. And here, these are different men, the physicians of slaves and the physicians of free men. And what will come out later on is that in the case of the legislator, the two functions must be fulfilled by the same man, the legislator, in the same act. But let us first uh, con uh, consider a few things in this uh, speech here. At the end, he brings in, for a second, so to speak, the gymnastic trainer, in addition to the physician. Now, what is the relation between these two arts? gymnastics and medicine. They are obviously the arts dealing with the human body, strengthening it and restoring it to health. What is the, the, the art of the legislator must be compared to both the gymnastic that of the gymnastic trainer and that of medicine, an edifying function, like building up function, and a restorative or punitive function. In the case of the body, they are strictly separated. But in the case of the soul, they uh, must be exercised by one and the same man. But this is at least the demand here. Of course, one can also conceive of a medicine of the mind which is limited altogether to the medicine of the free man, of the free physician who treats free patients. And then one would, I believe, naturally think of Socrates, whose proceedings are here implicitly described, who uh, talks to people and himself learns something by talking to the patient about his disease, and he talks to the patient's friends, and he reaches agreement with the patient, but think of Carmides and his headaches, and then the patient will comply with the prescription without any coercion. The main point, however, is that in the, according to what is implied here, is that in legislation as distinguished from medicine, the treatment of freemen and the treatment of slaves belong to one and the same art, the legislative art. The free treatment, the generous treatment, 
and the tyrannical treatment, both belong to the legislative art. The legislative art must be in itself twofold. And therefore, it is possible or even necessary that the legislator must speak in a twofold manner to the free men and to the slaves in the literal as well as in the metaphoric sense of the words free men and slaves. Yes? Athenian, do you wish us to examine the double method and the single as applied also to actual legislation? Cleinias, most certainly I wish it. Athenian, come, tell me then. By the God. By the gods. I mean, that is uh, one of the very few oaths occurring here. Yes. What would be the first law to be laid down by the lawgiver? Will he not follow the order of nature and in his ordinances regulate the first, first the starting point of generation in states? Cleinias, of course. Yeah, now, this is, is it of course? One could have had the impression from the allocution to the future citizen, citizens, that the first laws, the laws which come first, would be those regarding divine worship. But perhaps there is no contradiction, because here he speaks of what would come first according to nature. And then uh, the two statements would be easily reconciled. At any rate, the sermon, the oath by the gods, reminds us of this question. Yes? Athenian, does not the starting point of generation in all states lie in the union and partnership of marriage? Cleinias, certainly. Athenian, so it seems that if the marriage laws were the first to be enacted, that would be the right course in every state. Cleinias, most assuredly, Athenian. Let us state the law in its simple form first. How will it run? Probably like this. A man shall marry when he is 30 years old and under five and 30. If he fails to do so, he shall be punished both by a fine in money and by degradation. You know, by, with a fine of so and so much, and uh, with degradation, with such and such a degradation. So the lacuna has to be filled out by the legislator. And if this is not meant to be a final formulation, as you see, uh, when he says it would perhaps be run somehow in the following manner. Therefore, if later on a statement occurs uh, which conflicts with this, and where the age is stated differently, I think 30 as a maximum, there is naturally no contradiction because this is meant to be a provisional statement. And one must not assume that Plato has forgotten what he wrote earlier because he made, he qualified this statement by the perhaps. This is, as we, what we have read, is a simple statement. And now we will hear the double statement. Will you read that? Such shall be the simple form of marriage law. The double form shall be this. A man shall marry when he is 30 years old and under 35, bearing in mind that this is the way by which the human race, by nature's ordinance, shares in immortality, a thing for which nature has implanted in everyone a keen desire, the desire to win glory instead of lying in a nameless grave aims at a like object. Yeah, but only th this is a reason for to become famous and not lie nameless after one's death. This is the desire for such like thing, I mean, for immortality. Yes? Thus, mankind is by nature coeval with the whole of time in that it accompanies it continually, both now and in the future. And the means by which it is immortal is this. 
By leaving behind it children's children and continuing ever one and the same, it thus by reproduction shares an immortality. That a man should deprive himself thereof voluntarily is never an act of holiness, and he who denies himself wife and children is guilty of such intentional deprivation. He who obeys the law may be dismissed without penalty, but he who disobeys and does not marry when 35 years old shall pay a yearly fine of such and such an amount, lest he imagine that single life brings him gain and ease. And he shall have no share in the honors which are paid from time to time by the younger men in the state to their seniors. When one hears and compares this law with the former one, it is possible to judge in each particular case whether the laws ought to be at least double in length through combining threats with persuasion or only single in length through employing threats alone. Yeah, this statement, this long statement of the Athenian is double because it contains both the law in the narrow sense and the reason of the law. This much is clear, but this is a wholly unproblematical twofoldness as we see. A difficulty is indicated by a fact which is not mentioned in the laws or anywhere else in Plato's writings, but which is nevertheless firmly established. And that is that Plato never married. Now, Plato, in other words, contradicted his own legislator. And his own legislator is not just anybody, any legislator, but the men whose laws are supposed to be the dispensations of the intellect. Is then Plato, as I say today, a hypocrite? By preaching one thing and doing another? Or is the law not sufficiently flexible twofold to permit of Plato's seemingly lawless action. Well, I think he makes one crucial qualification, voluntarily. There is indicated here that this desire for immortality, which finds its normal outlet in the generation of children, and may be satisfied also in other ways by immortal fame. And if this desire is overpowering, then there is no place left for marriage, and therefore the abstention from marriage is involuntary. This possibility is provided for. So if this is so, however, we see that the law is not only twofold, because it consists of the law proper and the reason of them, but the reason of the law itself is twofold, because it says different things to different people. Now, if this is the case, then Plato's legislators' writings will be as manifold as Plato's own writings, which also say different things, and are meant to say different things uh, to a different people. Yes? So now it's clear, so uh, the question is now, uh, what kind of uh, laws should we have? The usual one, the statement, uh, uh, or else, do that or else, or a statement appealing to the understanding of the subject. Yes? McGillis, our Laconian way, stranger, is to prefer brevity always. But were I bidden to choose which of these two statutes I should desire to have enacted in writing in my state, 
I should choose the longer, and what is more, I should make the same choice in the case of every law in which, as in the example before us, two alternatives were offered. It is necessary, however, that the laws we are now enacting should have the approval of our friend Clinius also, for it is his state which is now proposing to make use of such things. Yeah. Well, uh, Megillus is apparently worried in the first place by the length, the greater length, and the Spartans were laconic, but he assures the Athenian that this kind of length is entirely welcome. So there will be no conflict on this ground. The Athenian will have to say something about length, length almost immediately. But now what does Kleinius say? Klein. Yes? Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Yes. Generally speaking, yes, but it has also what they call teeth in it for those who are not docile. So the essence of the law is really not persuading coercion? Yes, but a coercion which should try to make itself superfluous in the given case. There can be, it, it, there will always be ne the necessity for coercion. But uh, in, in the given case, uh, the coercion become, can, may become superfluous because uh, all people become convinced that it is the best way. Pardon? Yeah, but the, the, the doctor must, of course, the, the, the genuine doctor, the competent doctor, uh, he would succeed in persuading the patient that he has to take the bitter pill or whatever it may be, and uh, then he will take it. Similarly, in the case of legislation. So what Kleiner says here in the last speech we have read is again metrical. Kalosko mecula ipis, just as we found in a metrical statement uh, shortly before, before the, in 719A3, before the discussion of poets and after the discussion of poets. That is a meaningful little joke of Plato. The Athenian now takes up the suggestion of uh, Megillus that one should make no objection to the, to the length of the speeches. Yes? Kleinius, I highly approve of all you have said, Megillus. Athenian, still, it is extremely foolish to argue about the length or brevity of writing, for what we should value, I suppose, is not their extre extreme brevity or proxility, but their excellence. In the case of the laws mentioned just now, not only does the one form possess double the value of the other in respect of practical excellence, but the example of the two kinds of doctors recently mentioned presents a very exact analogy. But yeah, that is a little bit more the twofold, no, the genus of the twofold or the twofold doctors. It is really not two genera of doctors, as we, as in the case of, of ordinary medicine, but it is one genus, in the case of legislation, which performs the free doctors and the slave doctors function. Yes? But as regards this, 
It appears that no legislator has ever yet observed that, while it is in their power to make use in their lawmaking of two methods, namely persuasion and force, insofar as that is feasible in dealing with the uncultured populace, they actually employ one method only in their legislation. They do not temper compulsion with persuasion. They use untempered force alone. And I, my dear sirs, perceive still a third requisite, which ought to be found in laws, but which is nowhere to be found at present. So, now this much is clear, but uh, we need both. And one special reason is uh, that the legislator has to do with the crowd inexperienced in education. And this is clear. But there will be a third consideration um, which he has not yet made and which follows. And what is this? Cleinias, what is it you allude to, Athenian? A matter which, by a kind of divine direction, has sprung out of the subjects we have now been discussing. It was a little more than dawn when we began talking about laws, and now it is high noon, and here we are in this entrancing resting place, all the time we have been talking of nothing but laws, yet it is only recently that we have begun, as it seems, to utter laws. And what went before was all simply preludes to laws. Yeah, now let us stop here for one moment. So they started at dawn, and now it's high noon. And think we are about at the end of the fourth book. Now, if it is reasonable to assume, that books 5 to 8, and then books 9 to 12, the laws consist altogether of 12 books, will take approximately the same time. And that would mean that books 9 to 12 will be spoken in the evening, and the beginning at dusk, the beginning of the night. Now, these last four books are devoted to penal law. In other words, this is something which is something which we should obscure, if possible. But of course, we must have it. And the very last discussion on the laws deals with something called the nocturnal council that is the closest approximation to the rule of philosophers, which is possible in this work here. And the very name, Nocturnal Council, points to the night. Of course, one doesn't know whether the next four books will also be in the shade as it will be spoken in the shade, as this very passage here is, that it cannot be settled, I believe. Yeah. What is my object in saying this? It is to explain all, that all utterances and vocal expressions have preludes and tunings up, as one might call them, which provide a kind of artistic preparation which assists toward the further development of the subject. Yeah, artistic in this precise sense, according to art, according to the rules of art. All speeches need preludes, which uh, must be composed in an artful, artistic manner. And this applies also to laws, as we shall see. Yes? Indeed, we have examples before us of prelude, preludes admirably elaborated in those prefixed to that class of lyric ode called the gnome and to musical compositions of every description. But for the gnomes, which are real gnomes and which we designate political... So no it is the same word in Greek of us, nomoi, for this kind of songs as well as for laws. No one has ever yet uttered a prelude or composed or published one, just as though there were no such thing. 
But our present conversation proves, in my opinion, that there is such a thing, and it struck me just now that the laws we were then stating are something more than simply double and consist of these two things combined, law and prelude to law. The part which we call the despotic prescription, comparing it to the prescriptions of the slave doctors we mentioned, is unblended law. But the part which preceded this, which was uttered as persuasive thereof, which, while it actually is persuasion, yet serves also the same purpose as the prelude to an oration. To ensure that the person to whom the lawgiver addresses the law should accept the prescription quietly, and be caused quietly in a docile spirit. That, as I suppose, was the evident object with which the speaker uttered all persuasive discourse. Hence, according to, our, according to my argument, the right term for it would be not legal statement, but prelude, and no other word. Having said this... Yeah, no, no, it's prelude, but not a speech of the law. So he retracts now the earlier statement, which has full about the twofoldness of law, a statement which has now fulfilled its purpose and is no longer necessary. But uh, now he says that uh, the, the reason of the law which is stated in the prelude, is not law. The law is a statement, do this or that or else. That's the law. It's a tyrannical statement. And generous, persuasive statement it does not belong to the law proper. But the whole thing, the law plus its prelude, consists of a tyrannical ingredient and of an ingredient which wishes to elicit consent, free consent. And if we assume for a moment that this political order most concerned with consent is democracy, then we would have to say that a law a, a law as it should be, is based on a mixture of a democratic and a tyrannical ingredient. And perhaps one should enlarge that in Plato's spirit to say that all sensible political arrangements are mixtures of tyranny and democracy. So that when Aristotle says in his politics, in criticizing the Athenian stranger, that according to the Athenian stranger, the best mixture is one of tyranny and democracy. Aristotle has read the laws better than me, and not worse, because that statement never occurred. Then, of course, the modern scholars point their finger of disapproval at Aristotle and says, that's the way in which he reads and slanders. But he doesn't slander at all. He only has thought through his subject more than the people who believe there is only that in the book which can be quoted by every reader, however superficial. So this is crucial for the understanding. And we remember, perhaps, that earlier he had said in the third book that there are two mothers of regimes, monarchy and democracy. He did not say kingship and democracy. Monarchy, which could, tyranny would also be a monarchy, of course. And this is another confirmation of Aristotle's interpretation. We are speaking now about the tyrannical state with the legislature. And if so... No, no. Uh, yes? If, if so, my question is, what is the relation between the tyrant, the legislator, who takes his, uh, uh, his uh, law from the news, from the law? What is the relation? 
Feldheiren came in only in the context of the question of how to establish most quickly and most easily this particular kind of society. But afterward, after it has been established, the tyrant disappears. Yes, I, uh, I, I mean, whether he can be pushed aside as easily is another question. Not all tyrants ever stay. Yeah, no, No, I think the legislator chooses the tyrant. Yeah. And the tyrant is supposed to be a very docile man. Yeah, well, that is only one of the... Yes, yeah, sure. But the legislator will tell him. And since he has such a high regard for the legislator, he will do it. But this is only, that is as impossible as arrangement made in the Republic. That the philosophers should become kings or the kings should become philosophers. There is no quick and easy solution. Yeah. Yeah. Having said this, what is the next statement I would desire to make? It is this, that the lawgiver must never omit furnished preludes as prefaces both to the laws as a whole and to each individual statute, whereby they shall possess their original form, but as much as the double examples recently given surpass the sing by as much as the double examples recently given surpass the single. Clinius. I, for my part, would change the, the expert in these matters to legislate thus and not otherwise. So uh, the key point which we must keep in mind for the immediate sequel is this. There will be first a general prelude to the whole code, and then there will be particular preludes to the particular laws. Of the latter, we had an example in what he said about the marriage laws. Yes? Athenian, you are right, I believe, Clinius, in asserting at least thus much that all laws have preludes and that in commencing each piece of legislation, one ought to preface each enactment with the prelude that naturally belongs to it. For the statement that is to follow the prelude is one of no small importance and it makes a vast difference whether these statements are distinctly or indistinctly remembered. Still, we would be wrong if we prescribed that all statutes, great and small, should be equally provided with preludes, for neither ought that to be done in the case of songs and speeches of every kind, of every kind for they all naturally have preludes, but we cannot employ them always that is a thing which must be left in each case to the judgment of the actual orator or singer or legislator. Fine. You know, that it would be interesting to know whether Plato meant here also some of his own works and which, I mean, which were susceptible of having a prelude but do not have one because it would not be useful in their case. There are two Platonic writings which occurred to me immediately, today generally regarded as spurious, which have no prelude in any sense, and these are the Hippias and the, no, not the Hippias, the, the Minos and the Hipparchus. The minors and the partials. They, especially in the minors, this begins in a very abrupt manner, without any preparation. But they uh, may have thought of something else. I do not know. Yes. 
Kleinius, what you say is, I believe, very true. But let us not spend more time, stranger, in delay, but return to our main subject and start afresh, if you agree, from the statements you made above, and made not by way of prelude. At that time, yeah, they did not, they did not make them as if they were pronouncing the prelude. Yeah. Let us then repeat from the start the second thought that are best, to quote the player's proverb, treating them throughout as a prelude and not as before as a chance discourse. And let us handle the opening part as being confessedly a prelude. As to the worship of the gods and the attention to be paid to ancestors, our previous statement is quite sufficient. It is what comes next to these that you must try to state until the whole of the prelude has been, in our opinion, adequately set forth by you. After that, you will proceed with your statement of the actual laws. Now, Kleinius makes now a momentous proposal that they should retroactively declare the allocution to the future citizens to be the first part of the prelude to the whole code. You know, it was not, it was meant to be as an allocution to the citizens, nothing else. And now it is, as I said, retroactively declared to be such the first half of the prelude. Yes. Athenian. So then, the prelude we previously composed concerning the gods and those next to the gods, and concerning parents, living and dead, was, as we now declare, sufficient. And you are now bidding me, I understand, to bring up, as it were, to the light of day, the residue of this same subject. Plinius, most certainly. Athenian, well, surely it is both fitting and of the greatest mutual advantage that next to the matters mentioned, the speaker and his hearers should deal with the question of the degree of zeal or slackness which men ought to use in respect of their souls their bodies and their goods, and should ponder thereon and thus get a grasp of education as far as possible. Precisely this, then, is the statement which we must actually make and listen to next. Yeah. Finally, perfectly right. So uh, the Athenian uh, indicates here now the subject which follows. The souls, bodies, and properties of the people. And they, the speaker and the hearers, and this includes, of course, also the Athenian as a speaker, and Clias and Megillus as hearers, would by this very fact acquire education as much as they are capable. This is expected from the statement about the souls, the bodies, and the properties. There is, has, nothing has been said about the educating function of the first part of the prelude, i.e. the statement about the gods and the parents. So this is the end of the fourth book. And before we turn to the fifth book, I would like to make a stop for a moment and see whether there is any point which you would like to discuss. Ye Mr. Sitter? Is there a connection? Uh, you indicated briefly, but didn't elaborate on a connection between uh, the fact that the central part of the fourth book culminates in a theocracy in the rule of gods, which also is expressed as rule of intellect. And, and the rule of law. The higher status given to what in the last part? To the poets. You, you spoke of you know, the fact that the poets are re-established. Who the poets? 
No, I mean, the first part is still implicitly based on the negative judgment on poets. You know, the, the legislator is a man of supreme knowledge, and the poets, of course, while being competent in matters purely poetic, have to obey the legislator in the truly important question. But in this last section of the fourth book, where the knowledge of the legislator is questioned, the status of the poets raises automatically. That is, I believe, the point. But the, the chief relation of these two discussions of the law in, 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 the, in Book 4 is law, what I call the ceiling. The, the law is a dispensation of the intellect. And the flooring, law is tyrannical command. And he has separated this by uh, these two statements, by the allocution to the citizens, which now proves to be, according to Kleinias at least, the first half of the prelude to the whole code. Yes. On 719E10, page 307 in the Logue. Uh, E10, is Yeah. Yes. There's a speech that the Athenian gives in which there, there's talk about the, the poets, the poets who are able to speak in different ways, one about the defective tomb, one about the excessive tomb, no. and one about the moderate. And then Cleinias responds, exceedingly true. And I was wondering if there is some things which there is no possibility of excess. And, and so therefore, the statement, the thrust of the statement that's made in this speech by the Athenian is ironically countermanded by what Cleinias says. Because yeah, but he suggests, by saying exceedingly true, to the reader who considers that perhaps there are certain things that cannot be in excess, like truth. I don't th think so. I believe that Kranger's statement it must be understood, at least in the first place, as a response to what the Athenians said last, namely, that the legislator cannot leave matters as saying, as praising the mean, the moderate, but he must be more specific about it, as is shown by the example of the variety of what various kinds of people regard as becoming, like the rich woman, the stingy, poor man, and, and so on. I believe that has no further bearing. The Kranias does not accept everything the Athenian says here, but especially the, the, this main point, that the poet got a point against the legislator. I think I was suggesting that, I wasn't suggesting that Kleinias was trying to, contra to contradict the Athenian, but I was suggesting that Cleinias might be saying something that has a meaning that even he doesn't understand. It could be, yes. And when he says exceedingly true, he makes us think about the truth and whether it's possible that it be exceeding. And if it's not possible, then we have to look back at the speech. Greek doesn't say anything about excess, it's just... Uh, exceeding, no. Very, it's oh, only yes. superlative, very true. Most true. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I see that. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I return to the point about um, the status of being called in? And the further consideration is that poetry might be questioned from a higher point of view has no place here because that higher point of view is, so to speak, suppressed. But uh, we cannot forget that. But on the other hand, we must also uh, remember this statement of the laws 
in order not to take too, in too simple a manner the condemnation of poetry in the Republic. You know, it's twofold. Every, that, all, the, all these things are twofold. Would it be fair to say that in this context, in, in the laws, that um, insofar as the legislator is not simply a tyrant, um, yeah, yeah. he's a poet. Yes, one can say that. The, the uh, but it, that the question is how much would follow from that. I mean, surely he, his statements do not have to be metrical, although Claudia somehow seems to believe that, you know, by his two uh, metrical utterances. But in another sense, yes, he must tell, uh, uh, he must tell st uh, untrue but edifying stories, for example, which would be the work of poets, for, for instance. But if you go into the details of the laws of purchasing and, and selling, that's not likely to make us think of poets. Yeah? Although, conceivably, I don't like Balzac, could give it a quasi-poetical treatment. Yeah? Mr. Von Gondor. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the, what the subsequent element is to feel, because it seems as if the same point is made in Gorgias, that somehow letter has to be ministerial to philosophy, and the same equation is used, the relationship between medicine and justice, and the, uh, the medicine and gymnastics, and then yeah, yeah. more or less something. In fact, the same example is the beginning, where Gorgias counsels the patients of his brother to take the medicine. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, quite superficially, in the gorgeous, Socrates talks to the most famous teacher of rhetoric in Athens. And here, the str Athenian stranger talks to two old. Dorians in a very underdeveloped part of Greece. Yeah. At least at that time, underdeveloped. So that is clear, the situation is very different. And uh, of course, in, in the gorgeous, Socrates speaks of philosophy without any hesitation, and it is perfectly fitting there. You know, the whole contrast with Calicles is that between the political man and the philosophic man. The, this contra uh, contrast is also effective in the laws, but not in such an extreme way as in the gorgeous. We will see that later. Mr. Burns? Isn't the real problem that is uh, broached by talking about, uh, on the one hand, the flooring and the ceiling, coercion and persuasion, is that it would seem to be impossible to simply talk about law, to define law as one thing. You have to always define the law for the free and the law for the unfree. Uh, yeah, but so if... It seems that it's really impossible to talk about simply law. If, 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 even if one... I'm thinking of uh, Thomas's uh, treatise on law, where he begins and defines it in terms of an ordinance of reason, hmm. persuasion. And then towards the end of the treatise, you suddenly find him talking about the coercive power of the law. But that, that was implied from the very beginning in the general question on laws preceding the particular kinds of laws, the question of sanctions was mentioned. Yeah, it was mentioned, but it doesn't really fit in with the definition. Yeah, but he did not bring up the sanctions, especially in connection with the natural law, because that would bring up the whole question of divine punishment and rewards, and he didn't wish to bring that up in this context. But he does speak of them, of course, when it comes to human law. 
Yeah, but Thomas simply starts from the premise that the law, in particular also the human law, is or ought to be a dictate of reason. And he does not go into the complexities of law as much as Plato does. Yeah, but it, 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 it still bothers me that in, in the general definition, which at first appears to be the definition of law that he works towards, there's no mention of compulsion. And yet it's clear that when he does talk, as you said, when, when he talks about human law, he, he does talk about yeah, yeah, sure. In other words, this, this uh, seeming failure of the definition seems to indicate that it's almost impossible to define law simply, that one always has to define it uh, in terms of the law for those who are persuadable and the law for those who are not. Yeah, but it still, it does not every law um, have this dual appeal, at least implicitly. Uh, think of uh, if the legislator forbids drinking of alcoholic beverages, what does he do? Uh, there is a, a, he or his friends point out the awful ravages wrought by demon rum. Yeah, that's a persuasion. And then the legislator comes with his tyrannical prescription and says, he who buys or sells or drinks this kind of thing will be punished in such and such a way. You have both things uh, in all legislation, only not, uh, it, it is not generally thought to be the function of the legislator to do both things as Plato or, or the Athenian stranger demands. I, I must. I think there is no difficulty in that. At least I don't see it. Well, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what I, what, <laughs> if I see anything either. But I mean, for instance, if one takes Hobbes, who defines law in a systematic way as a command, the will, hmm. he leaves out entirely what he calls counsel. Yeah, yeah. That's perfectly clear and logical but it leaves out half the story. Yeah, yeah. And then, if you take Thomas, who defines law as counsel, uh, or as an ordinance of reason, which in Hobbes' terms would be counsel, uh, uh, that definition also, which is perfectly clear, proves to be insufficient. It seems that you, that you must, because then the coercion comes in. It really seems as if uh, there's no simple way to define law. One has to define it in terms of the two. Yes. Is this terrible? Well, only for those who would like a simple, systematic treatment, I guess. Yeah, perhaps one. In the simplicity is, you know what Aristotle says about hippodamus? who had such a simple scheme, it only led to confusion. And perhaps this is true in this case too. But even Hobbes, who is as, in this respect, so wonderfully clear and has been properly admired for that. But, on the, but even Hobbes uh, brings in the, the ceiling when he speaks of the office of the sovereign, yeah? And, uh, and there he speaks of, of uh, what is a good law. He denies that there can be unjust laws, but he admits that there can be bad laws. And then he speaks of good laws and of a good code, and this became then the model for people up to Bentham and the utilitarians, so he has this too. But nevertheless, it is a much narrower statement than that of Plato, I can't then. Yes? Uh, at the end of book four, when the Athenian speaks of the prelude that he has previously discussed of the gods and the parents, uh, I wonder what specifically he's referring to as a prelude in 
That is what was presented as an allocution to the future colonists. And I can only repeat, Glanius proposes that this allocution be raised retroactively to the status of the first half of the prelude. And the second half of the prelude is given in the first part of Book 5. Is this so difficult? Well, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that I'm clear. What, what I was, uh, the question I was asking was, where, where in the previous books does he discuss the prelude to the gods or to the parents? No, he, he doesn't mean anything but this particular section, the allocution to the future citizens. And that was... That was uh, exhortation to piety, humility, etc. And uh, where he spoke of the gods as well as of the parents, both living and dead, uh, as he said here. But you want to say something? If I understand the, uh, if I understand the analogy between medicine and the legislative arts, that, uh, then the prelude to the gods is The slave doctrine treating slaves corresponds to the I have not been able acoustically to understand everything you said, but let me only make one point. The legislator's function combines that of the slave doctor and of the free doctor. That is clear. You have seen that? Yes. yes. Now, what was your difficulty? No, the free doctor is not the teacher of the slave doctor. The slave doctor is a simple empiric, has no, no um, scientific knowledge, no knowledge of the nature of things. And uh, there are two entirely uh, different kinds of people by, uh, united only by the fact that they both are supposed to heal, heal human beings. No, but it follows only that the legislative art consists, and that's its paradox, of two heterogeneous things, which are, but both are equally essential, the free and the tyrannical ingredient. And, uh, pun? I beg your pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, that the free doctor looks to nature, but the slave doctor looks to the free doctor. It's not that... that I don't think so. This is not the way in which I understood that. Now let me see. Yeah, he may. Uh, uh, that he says. 
here uh, servants of the all right, say kind of male nurses. But this is then later on dropped uh, in the detailed discussion in 720 B to D. There is nothing said of the slave doctors being guided by the free doctors. Pardon? Yeah, but that is hard to say. Let me see. Yeah, these male nurses, yeah, they treat their patients, free or slave, according to the command of the masters. And masters means here the free doctors. Yes, and they acquire their art uh, uh, by uh, experience, but not according to nature, as a free doctor himself. So there are two kinds of the men who are called doctors, physicians. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in other words, there is... No, that is, I mean, if we, uh, what appears from this passage, 720A to B, would be this, that the slave doctors, or slave medicine, is a very crude version of free medicine. Accordingly, the law is law, the tyrannical prescription is a very crude version of the dispensation affected by the intellect. Does this not make sense? That something sensible and reasonable must be crudified enormously in order to become a law in order to acquire this character of the tyrannical prescription. All finer distinctions must be dropped. Mrs. Kamler? Would it be easier to understand all these analogies and uh, explain the, the play rules, what is this mentioned, and coercion and persuasion as two sides Coercion and persuasion, persuasion as two sides of the legislature. If we were to keep in mind the first part is educational, and this is certainly there. Persuasion, after all, this is here not mentioned as such, but it is educational part of the legislature. How it is done in the Republic of one way, in our days, maybe no one real ordinance or statute is written with long persuasion part and then and then statement what you have to do. But it is in everywhere, in every state, this part is education part. And I think that this all analogies just point to this two sides of of each legislature, like Mr. Burns mentioned. But but one is education. The other one has to be formal. Law has to be defined as a law. And, and accordingly, law has to be written in the status as a law. Yes, but... Then, uh, uh, this, from all the discussion, it's clear that it is difficult, this analogy, to refer to Meaning of these two sides of uh, 
Yeah, but Plato is very much concerned in pointing out the heterogeneous character of these two ingredients, the educational and the correction. That they are heterogeneous. And I believe all the discussions today about the questionable effect of so-called rehabilitation and the difficulty there would confirm what Plato says. All human societies of which we know, at least all somewhat more developed ones, have penal justice. And is what is punishment? Is supposed to better men. Does it better men? Perhaps negatively by deterring men. But the mere deterrence from crime, education, in a way, yes, but a very low, kind, very crude kind of education compared with education proper. And Plato is very much concerned, as you see from the strong language which he uses, with bringing out the radical difference between these two ingredients. That is, uh, there is not a simple, harm, uh, a simple harmony between them possible. And I think we see it up to the present day. Now, as for the, yes. I think uh, there's another uh, problem that, uh, in a way, that I think most of us fall prey to, and that is, uh, in a in a democratic society, uh, one that, uh, insofar as it is controlled by public opinion, you find people who come to expect uh, the persuasive element in the law to slowly absorb yeah. all and then uh, until it absorbs it completely the coercive part. So the withering so, away of the gallows. That's yeah. right, the withering away of the gallows. Mm. And, so, and no there's a certain there was a, there was an there was an article that we that we read on uh, on the on our Cambodia day this year, uh, an article by someone who had been connected with this college called uh, The Law as Question, where the proposal was that every law should be taken as merely an opening question for a discussion. And uh, yeah, I guess from Plato's point of view, that would that view of law would suffer from a fatal one one sidedness. Yeah, but what he said about the crowd inexperience in education, you know, that remark which occurred. Yeah, but then of course the answer is suppose everyone becomes experienced in education. Yeah, but uh, suppose. And uh, Plato, and that is a question which Plato will discuss in his way later on when he uh, really speaks about the regime of the laws. He said, too, he has not yet done it in spite of the claim that he will come and after he has completed the prelude, that's the first thing he does. And there he will lay the foundation for the whole political order and there the first indications are given. I mean, this a tough side of the law, the teeth in them, uh, that uh, which is, of course, overdone by people like Machiavelli, was absolutely recognized by Plato and by Aristotle too, of course. You know, at the end of the ethics, when he speaks of the compulsory power which the law must have, Otherwise, John gets into the difficulty into which Don Quixote came. Okay. Don Quixote, when he tried to liberate the galley slaves, you know. 
and uh, was shocked that they were that they were chained. Do you remember? And at any rate, uh, to come back to our context, in the sequel, in the second half of the prelude, he will discuss the, the proper treatment of the souls, the bodies, and property. And I think we can use without any danger the expressions taken from uh, theology that the first half of the prelude is the first table of that decalogue. And now in the second half we get the second table. And we must see whether that fits or does not fit. And that we must do, begin to do next time. Last, I think the time is correct. Yeah, we completed last time our reading of book four. Uh, only a few points which I would like to remind you of. The laws is the only platonic dialogue located far away from Athens. The only other platonic dialogue located outside of the walls of Athens is the Phaedrus. The theme of the Phaedrus is erotic speeches, in particular erotic written speeches. There is a long discussion on the defects of writings there. Writings say always the same thing, and they say the same things to all, from which we may conclude that the Platonic writings are writings free from that essential defect of writings. Now the laws deal with written laws, the writings of the legislature. The legislator, as we have seen, must say the same thing to all. This will be changed by the Platonic legislator, but primarily the writings of the legislator and the Platonic writings, or poetic writings in general, are at opposite poles. To this crucial fact, we are directed by the most superficial fact, namely that only the laws and the feeders are located outside the walls of Athens, in the country. Now the question which was discussed again in the second half of Book 4 is, what is law? You remember the earlier answer? It is the true Logos when it has become the decision of the city. This was superseded by a new formula according to which law is a dispensation affected by the intellect. But this was implicitly questioned. It was said that law is the tyrannical or threatening command. Yet it is that while being a dispensation defected of the intellect, and this was made clear by the example of the slave doctors and the free doctors. The slave doctors learn from the free doctors and they do what the free doctors do, they imitate it, in a very crude manner. So the law as a tyrannical command is still derivative from the dispensation affected by the intellect. Now, in while he made these things clear, he made clear the need for preludes. Preludes have exactly the function of giving the reason for this for the tyrannic command. And this was agreeable to
included to others. And then Kleinius proposed that the allocution to the future citizens, which the Athenian had made, or had the legislator make, that this allocution to the future citizens be raised to the status of the first half of the prelude, to the whole court. And now we come to the second half of that prelude, and it is surely not platonic usage, but it is defensible to call these two parts of the code, of the prelude of the code, the first table, what has to do with the gods and the ancestors, and the second part, to which we turn now, the second table. Now let us begin to read the beginning of Book 5. Athenian, let everyone who has just heard the ordinances concerning gods and dear forefathers now give ear. Of all a man's own belongings, the most divine is his soul, since it is most his own. Yes, now let us stop here for one moment. So the soul comes after, of course, after the gods and the dear ancestors. He doesn't say that it comes after the parents, although the parents might be included among the forefathers. That is of some importance, the status of the parents, especially of the fathers. There was, uh, Aristotle gives as an example, as the example of an ethical controversy, the question, whom must one obey more, the law or the parents? And this problem is somehow present here. We must see whether we get some more specific information. Yes? A man's own belongings are invariably twofold. The stronger and better are the ruling elements, the weaker and worse those that serve. Wherefore, of one's own belongings, one must honor those that rule above those that serve. Thus it is that in charging men to honor their own souls, next after the gods who rule and the secondary divinities, I am giving a right injunction. But there is hardly a man of us. Now wait, he says more literally, after the gods being lords and those who follow these. So that does not necessarily mean divinities, it may also mean uh, the ancestors, the dear ancestors, perhaps even the parents. That is not excluded here. Yes? But there is hardly a man of us all who pays honor rightly, although he fancies he does so. For honor paid to a thing divine is beneficent, whereas nothing that is male maleficent confers honor. Yeah, that is not among them. Honor is somehow a divine good, yeah? a divine good, and nothing bad is worthy of honor. Yes. And he that thinks to magnify his soul by words or gifts or obeisances, while he is improving it no whit in goodness, fancies indeed that he is paying it honor, but in fact does not do so. Every boy, for example... No, wait a moment. So, honoring the soul consists in making the soul better. That is uh, um, um, here clearly, appears clearly. And now he gives a long list of the ways in which people dishonor the soul. And in this way, throw some light on, indirectly, on what honoring the soul is. Yes. And I think he mentions seven such ways of dishonoring the soul. Yes. Every boy, for example, as soon as he has grown to manhood, deems himself capable of learning all things, and supposes that by lauding his soul he honors it, and by eagerly permitting it to do whatsoever it pleases. 
But by acting thus, as we now declare, he is not honoring his soul, but injuring it. Whereas we affirm, he ought to pay honor to it next after the gods. Yes, no, no, that is absolutely said, next to the gods. And so the status of the parents remains um, in abeyance. Yes? Again, that was the first one. Yeah. Again, when a man counts not himself, but others responsible, always for his own sins, and for the most and, the, and greatest evils, and exempts himself always from blame, thereby honoring as he fancies his own soul, then he is far indeed from honoring it, since he is doing it injury. Again, when a man gives way to pleasures contrary to the counsel and commendation of the lawgiver, he is by no means conferring honor on his soul. Yeah, on his soul is not there. That is an, 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 a plausible suggestion of the translator, but the word soul is here avoided. And yes, but he dishonors it. No? Yeah. But rather dishonor by loading it with woes and remorse. Now here that is the only place here in this enumeration where the legislator is mentioned, and here the soul is not mentioned. Now this leads to an a, 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 leads one to an important question. Is honoring the soul the same as obeying the laws? Uh, you may know that in the Crito, where Sugari speaks up in favor of law abidingness more than anywhere else, there the word soul is studiously avoided. And the, the question which is here present is exactly this. Is, uh, is this what is more worthy of honor, the soul or the city and its laws? A question which, of course, in the Crito could not with propriety be raised because it would complicate matters much beyond uh, Crito's interest. Now the next point, number three. Again, in the opposite case, when toils, fears, hardships, and pain are commended, and a man flinches from them instead of stoutly enduring them. Then by his flinching, he confers no honor on his soul. For by all such actions, he renders it dishonored. Yeah, again, the soul is not there. He simply honors, yeah. Only it is said later uh, in the immediate, at the end of this, but uh, when he, uh, but uh, for, uh, for he makes it dishonored by, by doing all these things. Praised, when he says, when he does it over the, against the praises of the pains and fears and so on, the praises is not said by whom, but it is here implied by the legislator. But Mr. Gonda, you want to say something? Well? Uh, the uh, blaming others for his sins, for the mistakes, and probably the big things of pleasure are the same. And we, let me know. This was number two. If a man does not regard himself as responsible for his sins or mistakes, but makes others responsible, then he believes by this to honor his soul. In fact, he dishonors it. He does the opposite because he harms it. It does harm. That is what, here the soul is mentioned. Yes? When the pleasure comes up, that's when pleasure comes up, that's not that's a different item, is it not? Yes, number three, yes, I would say. Yes, that is a different thing. This is a different item. The first has to do with one's posture towards one's sins or mistakes. And the third has to do not with mistakes as such, but with pleasures, which giving into them may be mistake, but pleasure is, pleasure is not a mistake. 
And the fourth was toils, fears, and pains. Yeah? Number four. And now? Again, when a man deems life at any price to be a good thing, then also he does not honor, but dishonor to his soul. For he yields to the imagination of his soul that the conditions in Hades are altogether evil, instead of opposing it by teaching and convincing his soul that for all it knows, we may find, on the contrary, our greatest blessings in the realm of the gods below. So that refers to death in particular, yeah? Immortality of the soul is here not asserted, but it's merely used the argument also of the apology that we do not know. And if we give in to fear of death, we act as if we knew what we do not know. Yes? Again, when a man honors beauty above goodness, this is nothing else than a literal and total dishonoring of the soul. For such a statement asserts that the body is more honorable than the soul, but falsely, since nothing earth-born is more honorable than the things of heaven. And he that surmises otherwise concerning the soul knows not that in it he possesses and neglects a thing most admirable. Again, when yes, a man... Yes, that's number seven now, to which we come now. Yep. Again, when a man craves to acquire wealth ignobly, or feels no qualm in so acquiring it, he does not then by his gifts pay honor to his soul, far from it in sooth. For what is honorable therein and noble, he is bartering away for a handful of gold. Yet all the gold on earth, or under it, does not equal the price of goodness. So these are the seven ways in which one cannot, as not, uh, the seven deadly sins, but uh, the seven ways of dishonoring one's soul. Yeah. And now he summarizes the argument. Yeah. To speak shortly. To, you know, uh, to take it all together. Yes. To take it all together, in respect of the things which the lawgiver enumerates and describes as either, on the one hand, base and evil, or, on the other hand, noble and good, if any man refuses to avoid by every means the one kind, with all his power to practice the other kind, such a man knows not that everyone who acts thus is treating most dishonorably and most disgracefully that most divine of things, his soul. Yeah. So here he identifies the standard, what the legislator declares. So to honor one's soul, and to obey the legislator are identical, according to this statement. Yes? I have a question about, it goes back to the beginning of book five, the second paragraph of the second sentence of 323, where he says, the man's own belongings are invariably the people, the stronger and better are the ruling elements to be perverse those that serve. Now, in that argument, it doesn't seem to me, uh, it's obvious in the first place that it's very twofold. I think twofold, it, it's yeah. It's not obvious to me that those things are very twofold. And then, secondly, that the stronger and better should be the same. Now, yeah, the word which, yeah, the term which she translates as stronger is not simply stronger, it means, it means superior also. That we, uh, it, uh, Crito, to Crito, the superior and better. And of course, it must also be stronger if it is to exercise its rule. Now, we'll take a simple example. Would you regard the stomach as superior and uh, a, a man in which the stomach is in control? as in a good shape? No, but that's, that was my argument with the term stronger. See, the man whose stomach is in control and his stomach is stronger in that sense. Yeah, yeah, but is there not a very well, but there are as situations in which the, what ought to be weaker is stronger, yeah? For example, uh, if you have cancer or something of this kind, 
And then the weaker, that which by nature is weaker, is by violence, strong, against nature, stronger. Well, in terms of the first part of my question, though, does he go into the argument of the twofold nature of uh, man's belongings, or does he just posit this once and then leave it? Is there any argument to support that, or is it just mentioned as well? Uh, not here, but, and you can say he doesn't give an opportunity to Kleinias and Megillus to to take issue with him. But I believe, say, I think they would not have taken issue with him, but have taken for granted, of course, there is a, a ruling part in men and, and a ruled one. And if the ruled, what by nature is ruled, is in control, and that is so like a household uh, ruled by children or the wife, you know? It happens, but it is a disordered household. And the same would be true of St. Louis. I mean, if I use the example of the wife, I'm speaking in the way, according to the spirit of Plato and Aristotle, that is not necessarily my opinion. Yeah. 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 Hardly anyone takes into account of the greatest, takes account of the greatest judgment, as men call it, upon evil doing. That greatest judgment is this, to grow like unto men that are wicked, and in so growing to shun good men and good counsel, and cut oneself off from them, but to cleave to the company of the wicked and follow after them. And he that is joined to such men inevitably acts and is acted upon in the way that such men bid one another to act. Now such a resultant condition is not a judgment, for justice and judgment are things honorable, but a punishment, an infliction that follows on injustice. Both he that undergoes this and he that undergoes it not are alike wretched, the one in that he remains uncured, the other in that he is destroyed in order to secure the salvation of many others. Thus we declare that honor speaking generally, consists in following the better and in doing our utmost to affect the betterment of the worst when it admits of being better. Man mm. has no possession, better no, fitted... Let us, let us stop here. So here the legislator came in, the, as we have seen, and it seemed as that obeying the legislator is identical with honoring one's soul. But in this discussion about, which follows immediately, which we just read, the, he doesn't speak of honoring the soul, uh, but of punishment. The punishment is not merely that inflicted by the human legislator, but rather that which follows wickedness inevitably. Namely, that you are attractive to the wicked and have this kind of company. So it is not perfectly clear that honoring the soul and obeying the legislator is identical. Not only may there be a, comma, a law of the legislator which is unwise, but there may even be the whole range of the legislator may perhaps not be sufficient for honoring the soul. So this much about not honoring the soul and only by indirection honoring the soul. What follows next? Man has no better possession, has no possession better fitted by nature than the soul for the avoidance of evil and the tracking and taking of what is best of all and living in fellowship therewith when he has taken it for all his life thereafter. Wherefore the soul is put second in order of honor. And as for the third, everyone would conceive that this place naturally belongs to the honor due to the body. But here again one has to investigate the various forms of honor, which of them are genuine, which spurious, 
And this is the lawgiver's task. Yeah. Here he speaks at the beginning of his section that the soul must try to must follow and try to get hold of that which is best of all. This what is best of all seems to be most worthy of honor, more worthy than the soul. Of course, the one could say these are the gods, but we must make a distinction because we assume the gods to be good, and uh, therefore, and very good, in this sense, best. But why are the gods good from Plato's point of view? By participating in goodness. And therefore, this goodness is a higher consideration than the gods. This is the argument of the Euthyphron, you know, when uh, the question rises to the gods determine what is right uh, with a view to the right, or is it determined by them arbitrarily? So we have then the body, best of all, the soul, and then the body. And now he continues to speak about the body. He's an other enumeration of items, yes? Now he, as I suppose, declares that the honors are these, and of these kinds. The honorable body is not the fair body, nor the strong, nor the swift, nor the large, nor yet the body that is sound in health, although this is what many believe. Neither is it a body of the opposite kind of any of these. Rather, those bodies which hold the mean position between all these opposite extremes are by far the most temperate and stable. For while the one extreme makes the souls puffed up and proud, the other makes them lowly and spiritless. Yeah, what you translate here, lowly, is the same word which we translated by humble when it occurred in the first part of the prayer, you know, in the part about the gods. And that illustrates very well the difference between the two tables, that now humility is, or humbleness, kapainotis, is regarded as it ordinarily is in Plato, say nothing about the story, as something defective. Yes? The same holds good of the possession of goods and chattels, and they are to be valued on a similar, similar scale. In each case, when they are in excess, they produce enmities and feuds, both in states and privately, while if they are deficient, they produce, as a rule, serfdom. Now here, the order is perfectly clear up to this point. The soul, the body, which after all is, belongs to man himself, and then that which can be divorced from him without his seeing, ceasing to be a man, his wealth. And now how does he go on from here? And let no man love riches for the sake of his children, in order that he may leave them as wealthy as possible. For that is good neither for them nor for the state. For the young, the means that attracts no flatterers, yet is not lacking in things necessary, is the most harmonious of all and the best. For it is in tune with us and in accord and in accord and thus it renders our life in all respects painless. To his children it behooves a man to bequest modesty, not money in abundance. We imagine that... Yeah, modesty that is sense of shame. Yeah? Sense of shame. Yes. We imagine that chiding the young for their irreverence is the way to bequeath this, but no such result follows from the admonition commonly given nowadays to the young. When people tell them that youth must reverence everyone. Yeah, have a sense of shame and be ashamed. Yeah. Bashful. Yeah. Rather will the prudent lawgiver admonish the older folks to reverence the young, and above all to beware lest any of them be seen, lest any of them ever be seen or heard by any of the young, either doing or saying anything shameful. 
For where the old are shameless, there inevitably also will also the young be very imp impudent. The most effective way of training the young, as well as the older people themselves, is not by admonition, but by plainly practicing throughout one's life the admonitions which one gives to others, by paying honor and reverence to his kinsfolk, and all who share in the worship... Now, wait, wait. Now, what, what was the subject here up to this point, after wealth, so that we understand the sequence of the argument? It's not a, not a profound question, it's very obvious. What did he talk about? Children. Children. And so there is a, there is a kind of insensible transition from wealth to children. Yeah, well, you can understand it in the way that ordinarily the heirs to one's wealth are the children. There are other ways of understanding it. But this is their children. And now there's a new item. By paying honor and reverence to his kinsfolk, and all who share in the worship of the tribal gods and are sprung from the same blood, a man will, in proportion to his piety, secure the goodwill of the gods of birth to bless his own beginning of children. So this is the, is the fourth item, kinsfolk. Yeah? Moreover, a man will find his friends and companions kindly disposed in regard to life's intercourse if he sets higher than they do the value and importance of the services he receives from them, while counting the favors he confers on them as of less value than they are deemed by his companions and friends themselves. The fifth, yes. In relation to his state and fellow citizens, a man is by far the best who in preference to a victory at Olympia or in any other contest of war or peace would choose to have a victorious reputation for service to his native laws as being the one man above all others who has served them with distinction throughout his life. Further, a man should regard contracts made with strangers as specially sacred. That's a new item. Yeah. As first fellow citizens, no strangers. For practically all the sins against strangers are, as compared with those against citizens, connected more closely with an avenging deity. For the stranger, inasmuch as he is without companions or kinsfolk, is the more to be pitied by men and God. Wherefore, he that is most able to avenge succors, oh, he that is most able to avenge succors them most readily, and the most Able of all, in every case, is the strangers, demon, and god. And these follow in the train of Zeus Xenios. The god of strangers, protecting the stranger. Yes. Whoso then is possessed of but a particle of forethought will take the utmost care to go through life to the very end without committing any offense in respect of strangers of offenses either against, against either strangers or natives. That which touches suppliants is in every case the most grave. For when a suppliant, after invoking a god as witness, is cheated in his compact, that god becomes the special guardian of him who is wronged, so that he will never be wronged without vengeance being taken for his wrongs. So this, uh, this, this suppliant is the, eighth, the eighth item. Now, that was the second the section after the enumeration of the wrong ways of honoring the gods. Here he speaks of honoring the soul, I think, of honoring the soul. Now, what is the subject here of this section, which we have beginning in 720 AD and leading to 730 A? By the way, the gods are mentioned here when he speaks of kinsfolk, as strangers and subjects for very obvious reasons, which are indicated there. Now, what is the subject of this section? These are all are not the soul. And first the body, then wealth, then various kinds of human beings other than oneself. So one could say 
uh, our obligations or duties to others. Uh, this, uh, this is the second, as distinguished from honoring the soul. And then he, uh, uh, the, uh, let us read the very beginning of the next section, because there he gives a kind of, of title of what he has said to, uh, to what he has said. As concerns a man's social relations towards his... No, social relations. I know you're all right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the in the ways of intercourse or, or so. Yes. With what? Towards his parents, himself, his own belongings, towards the state also, and friends and kindred, whether foreign relations or domestic. Our exposition is now fairly complete. Yeah. Now, is this... Uh, this is in this enumeration, the parents precede oneself, as you see, and precede, of course, what belongs to one and the other, uh, the other items. Whether this is simply an order of uh, a descending order is not quite clear. But to what extent oneself is treated here, um, apart from the body, uh, that is not clear. It will become a little clearer from the immediate sequel. Yes? It remains to expound next the character which is most conducive to nobility of life, and after that we shall have to state all the matters which are subject not to law, but rather to, play, to praise or blame as the instruments whereby the citizens are educated individually and rendered more tractable and well inclined towards the laws which, yeah. are, yes. which are to be imposed on them. Now, let me translate a bit more literally. As to of what quality oneself must be in order to spend his life in the most noble manner, that would be the subject which must now be taken up. As for the things which not the law, but uh, praise and blame by educating enables us to be well disposed to the laws uh, uh, to be laid down in the future, this must be told um, after. So the next step is the man himself. So the, the quality of the man himself, and as will appear from the sequel, that are the qualities of the soul, the good qualities of the soul, the virtues. The, after all, they have not been discussed. We have heard hitherto only how one dishonors oneself. And then we have been given an enumeration of our relations to body, wealth, and other human beings. But of the central aspect of honoring the soul, the virtues, we have not yet heard anything in the prelude at any rate. And he turns to this subject now. Now, for the discussion which follows, it is good to consider the passage of the Republic in Book Six on the nature of the philosophers. The virtues mentioned here remind uh, of that enumeration there, but there are considerable differences, as you will see uh, when we come to the details. Now let us, let us turn to the various virtues. Of all the goods for gods and men alike, truth stands first. Thereof let every man partake from his earliest days, if he proposes to become blessed and happy, that so he may live his life as a true man so long as possible. He is a trusty man, but un he is a trusty man, but untrustworthy is the man who loves the voluntary lie, and senseless is the man who loves the involuntary lie. And neither of these two is to be envied. For everyone that is either faithless or foolish is friendless. And since as time goes on, 
he has found out. He is making for himself in his woeful old age at life's close a complete solitude, wherein his life becomes almost equally desolate, whether his companions and children are living or dead. He yes, is that is the first item. Truth followed by reliability, uh, trustworthiness. And this is, of course, mentioned uh, in, in the enumeration of the qualities, the natural qualities of the philosopher, uh, but there it is said what is characteristic of the philosopher is a passionate love for the whole truth. This is, of course, not here. But is this the man who, by virtue of truth, a man will become blessed and happy. That is a very strong epithet which occurs in this context only here. Now we come to the next. He that does no wrong is indeed a man worthy of honor, but worthy of twice as much honor as he. And more is the man who, in addition, consents to no wrongdoers when they do wrong. For while the former counts as one man, the latter counts as many, in that he informs the magistrates of the wrongdoing of the rest. And he that assists the magistrates in punishing, to the best of his power, let him be publicly proclaimed to be the great man of the state, and perfect, the winner of the prize for excellence. So this is the second virtue, um, which is justice, with the emphasis on punitive justice. And here the man who denounces the wrongdoers to the authorities and even joins the authorities in their punitive action, he is called the great man, an heir, hombre, in the city, and perfect. It's also high praise, but a praise differing from the one given in the case of truth. These are two, the, in the case of truth, it was not said that this man is a great man in the city, and here it is not said he is blessed and happy. These are two very different virtues. We can say they are the two peaks of virtue but we must understand these two peaks as poles of virtue, two different poles. So, now we come to number three. Upon temperance and upon wisdom, one should bestow the same praise. Yeah, wisdom, uh, that is good sense, yeah? And moderation in good sense, yes. And upon all the other goods, which he who possesses them can not only keep himself, but can share also with others. He that thus shares these should be honored as highest in merit, and he that would fain share them, but cannot, as second in merit. While if a man is jealous and unwilling to share any good things with anyone in a friendly spirit, then the man himself must be blamed, but his possession must not be disesteemed any the more because of its possessor. Rather, one should strive to gain it with all one's might. Let every one of us be ambitious to gain excellence, but without jealousy. For a man of this character enlarges a state, since he strives hard himself and does not thwart the others by calumny. But the jealous man, thinking that calum calumny of others is the best way to secure his own superiority, makes less effort himself to win true excellence and disheartens his rivals by getting them unjustly blamed, whereby he causes the whole state to be ill-trained for competing in excellence and renders it, for his part, less large in fair repute. So that is the third item. This is a moderation, good sense, and so on. I think one should translate by envy, not jealousy, to make it somewhat clearer of what he has in mind. And here, uh, what he doesn't speak here of punished, punitive activities, 
of the virtuous man, as he did in the case of justice. There is also a kind of caring for others, but this time in sharing the good things and not in sharing in the punitive activities of the magistrates. And of course it is important, this man who does, uh, does all these fine things mentioned here is not called either a great man or a blessed and happy. Yes? Yes. The implication then that the recent discussion of sharing occurs only here and not in the other two. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that is, uh, but there is a kind of sharing in, in the punitive activity, isn't it? I mean, he doesn't limit himself to abstaining himself from wrongdoing, but he prevents also others from wrongdoing. But uh, this is a, a negative kind of sharing, and here the emphasis is altogether on the positive side. Yes? Every man ought to be at once passionate and gentle in the highest degree, for on the one hand it is impossible to escape from other men's wrongdoing when they are cruel and hard to remedy, or even wholly irremediable otherwise than by victorious fighting and self-defense and by punishing most rigorously. And this no soul can achieve without noble passion. Yeah, but that is the word which he translates by passion is thymos, the spiritedness which you know from the Republic. But on the other hand, when men commit wrongs which are remediable, one should in the first place recognize that every wrongdoer is a wrongdoer involuntarily, for no one anywhere would ever voluntarily acquire any of the greatest evils. Lest least of all in his most precious possessions. And the most precious and in very truth, every man is, as we have said, the soul. We have not said this so very clearly, but uh, perhaps we have suggested it. Yeah. No one, therefore, will voluntarily admit into this most precious thing the greatest evil and live possessing it all his life long. Now, while in general the wrongdoer and he that has these evils are to be pitied, it is, permiss it is permissible to show pity to the man that has evils that are remediable, and to abate one's passion and treat him gently, and not to keep on raging like a scolding wife, but in dealing with the man who is totally and obstinately perverse and wicked, one must give free course to wrath. Wherefore we affirm that it behooves the good man to be always at once passionate and gentle. Yeah, spirited and gentle. Now, all crime is involuntary, and is therefore, of course, also the incorrigible criminal is involuntarily an incorrigible criminal. But involuntary crimes are matters of indulgence, of pity. But you cannot act on that in the case of the incorrigible crimes. There you have, uh, they have to be treated as incorrigibility demands. Um, you, uh, yes, and uh, there is, uh, let us um, read uh, this, um, the next part. Yes? I have, a, I have a question. Aristotle makes a distinction between the man who has bad habits and bad principles, and the man who has good principles and bad habits, and the man who has good principles and good habits. It seems that the one who, who uh, does involuntary crimes but is correctable would be a man that had bad habits but could have good principles. And a man who is incorrigible has bad principles. And it seems to me that, that one would have to have not so much gentleness 
with the ones that have bad habits and who could have good principles. I don't understand why the gentleness is emphasized, and I don't know what it would mean. Yeah, well, the, um, in the first place, uh, spiritedness and gentleness together, but more gentle than spirit. And that because it is more worthy of a human being, and not to act savagely. But aren't there different times in people's lives? And yeah, surely. Sure. With young people to act with more spiritedness, to establish the best habits and principles? Yes, and therefore they are they're supposed to become, former times to become soldiers in these young years, to use it against the public, uh, the former enemy. But still, this, when they are young, and when we speak of the virtue of man, we mean mature man. You know, oh, and beyond that. Right? Now, the difficulty, I think, uh, we come, uh, this will be taken up later when it comes to the penal law, but the difficulty is this. Uh, take the case of a man who uh, commits once a murder, and he will never do it again. So he, is, he can be corrected, rehabilitated, as you know. But then take, on the other hand, a man who is, com who is a petty thief and cannot kick that habit. He's incorrigible. Should this petty thief be exterminated because he is incorrigible, whereas a man who commits once a murder, who can be rehabilitated, should come to a kind of a reformatory, as Plato would call it, so from his theory, where he's made a mom, where he is uh, chastised, place of chastisement. We, and we come uh, then to a fifth in the secret. There is an evil great above all others which most men have implanted in their souls and, when he, and which each one of them excuses in himself and makes no effort to avoid. It is the evil indicated in the saying that every man is by nature a lover of self and that it is right that he should be such. Of self? Of himself? Is to himself and by nature of his friends, yes? But the truth is that the cause of all sins, in every case, lies in the person's excessive love of self. For the lover is blind in his view of the object love, so that he is a bad judge of things just and good and noble. In that he deems himself bound always to value what is his, his own more than what is true. For the man who is to attain the title of great must be devoted. Yeah, of a great man, again, the same expression as used before, the great ombre. Yeah. The, the man who is to attain the title of the great man must be devoted neither to himself nor to his own belongings, but to things just, whether they happen to be actions of his own or rather those of another man. And it is from the same sin that every man has derived the further notion that his own folly is wisdom. Whence it comes about that though we know practically nothing, we fancy that we know everything. And since we will not entrust to others the, doings, the doing of things we do not understand, we necessarily go wrong in doing them ourselves. Wherefore, every man must shun excessive self-love and ever follow after him that is better than himself and allowing no shame to prevent him from so doing. So this is the fifth and, as in a way, final item regarding the virtues. To repeat the truth, justice, the other virtues, gentleness and spiritedness, and finally the control uh, in regard to self-love. The last item, as you see here when he speaks, is uh, wisdom proper, just as it was at the beginning where he spoke 
of um, um, of truth. And there was something else. Yeah. Now let us for a moment um, consider which qualities mentioned in the Republic he omits here. Because many of them are mentioned there. Magnificence, for example, is not mentioned. Gracefulness, usefulness, memory and uh, facility of learning, they are here omitted, naturally. The point of view is different. We are here concerned not with philosophers, but with citizens who are not philosophers. And you see also in these five items the statement on moderation and good sense, since the central virtue there is flanked on both sides by statements on punishment, on the great man who treats, um, who helps the authorities in, puni in punishing criminals. And then here, on the use, how one must behave in punishing, the proper mixture of genderedness and spiritedness. This, I think, is also illustrative of the whole passage here. But he has one point to add, as he will see in the immediate sequence. And I think, and then we will make a pause after we have read that, yes? The precepts that are less important than these, and oftentimes repeated, but no less profitable, a man should repeat to himself by way of reminder, for there is a constant, e for where there is a constant efflux, there must also be a corresponding influx, and when wisdom flows away, the proper influx consists in recollection. Wherefore, men must be restrained from untimely laughter and tears, and every individual, as well as the whole state, must charge every man to try to conceal all show of extreme joy or sorrow, and to behave himself seemly, alike in good fortune and in evil, according as each man's daemon ranges itself, hoping that God will diminish the troubles that fall upon them by the blessings which he bestows, and will change for the better the present evil. And as to their blessings, hoping that they contrariwise will, with the help of good fortune, be increased. In these hopes, and in the recollections of these truths, it behooves every man to live sparing no pains, but constantly recalling them clearly to the recollection, both of himself and of his neighbor, alike when at work and when at play. Thus, as regards the right character of institutions and the right no, let us let us wait here. Now, this is said to be uh, of lesser rank, but nevertheless useful, no, no less useful than what went before, Equani equanimity in good and evil fortune. Here is the only, that's the only case in which in this section on the virtues, divine help is referred to. What is missing in this discussion of virtues altogether? I mean, what, uh, what one would expect in such a, a discussion, however provision of the virtue which is not in, without any reference to, um, to parallels like the discussion of the nature of the philosophers or so. But you, you know the so-called cardinal virtues. Yeah. Courage is missing. It's very strange. Although he speaks, he uses such uh, courage, Greek Andrea, manliness, and he speaks twice in this section even of a Megas an air of a great man. How would you account for that not mentioning of, uh, of courage? That would be a question. Well, there seems to be a suggestion of it in the an air, the opera. 
in his use of on air, on there seems to be a suggestion of courage. Yeah, and where does it occur? In the in, in the two cases, doesn't it? Justice part. Punitive justice, yeah. That was one, and the other was uh, that one prefers the truly noble, good and noble uh, uh, to one's own. And these two connections, I said. But in the first case, it is clear how this is connected with courage in the simple meaning of the term. And also when he speaks later on of spiritedness in the case of punishment. Yeah? Spiritedness is, as it were, the raw material of caste. So it, it is, but it is striking that it is not as such mentioned. And I think one must point it out. Now let us survey, before we go on what we have read, we have seen read first the wrong ways of honoring the soul, then a list of the things to be honored next to the soul, which included the duties toward other beings, other human beings, human beings, and then we had the virtues of the soul. And this is the discussion of what he will call immediately the divine things or the divine pursuits. And then he turns to the human ones. Now, is there any point you would like to raise regarding this? Just on the question of courage, about the unair, appears again in the Bible, the section on self-love. Yeah. And therefore despises death, and therefore, and yeah. Death, yeah. The smallest. Yeah. Here, the, the, the concern of the great man is not the totality of things, but rather what is just, and uh, uh, as a consequence, he considers himself and those things which belong to him as being of less importance than what is just. Isn't that perhaps a, a non-philosophic analog in the laws to the kind of contempt for the philosophy that has presumably been revoked? Yeah, well, he had spoken of that before when he spoke of the wrong ways of honoring the soul or of the ways of dishonoring it. There he had mentioned, as you have seen, believing to know what one does not know by regarding death as evil. That was mentioned, but this is not the reasoning given in the Republic. That was given in the Apology of Civilism. Uh, I have a question. Uh, it seems that, that there is an implicit discussion of friendship that runs through this, this last section. Beginning with the with the uh, with the section on page three thirty five at the top, where he speaks about the the man who winds up being friendless because he either loves the voluntary lie or because he loves the involuntary lie, and then the following section is about sharing good things, and I think that that's also an attribute of friends. I think that's brought out of the license. Yes, the, the, the very term philia occurs there, and uh, friendship love occurs there also in this third section. Yeah, that's quite correct. And the, the whole section about... The yeah, book but the whole itself. section uh, cannot be reduced to the... Uh, cannot be said to be devoted to friendship. No, I, I don't think it's devoted to friendship, but I think that, that here in particular, in the laws, there is an, there is an implicit uh, 
overtone of a discussion of friendship that's going on along with the, the, uh, the main discussion, which is of the virtues. I think that the, the, the argument about why a man should wish to not be foolish and love involuntary lies, or be bad and love voluntary lies, seems to boil down to, well, if you, if you are this way, when you get old, you won't have any friends, because bad and foolish people can never get together and share enough things with each other to become good friends. Yeah, I believe that uh, this must be seen a different way. This occurs in the price of trustworthiness hmm? or liability. And the liability is presented as a consequence of truth. Knowledge of truth, veracity, that is uh, both are implied in the Greek word for truth. Hmm? Now, truth is here praised very high. And the man who partaking of it is blessed and happy. But nevertheless, the truth is praised with a view to this effect, trustworthiness and therefore being having friends, not from the other point of view. Yeah. Uh, that, I believe, is the main vision, you see. This, this yeah. Isn't the section on the overcoming of self-love, is that sort of a description of uh, friendship? friendship? By implication, yes, but only by implication. But I don't see that it would be, the section as a whole would become clearer if we would say that subject here is friendship. It touches on various points on friendship, but that is not, not the theme. It is, I believe, simpler to say what he discusses here are the virtues. And that is what he says himself at the very beginning, of what quality oneself should be. The good qualities of course, of the soul, as it appears, that is to say, the virtues. And I do not know how to state positively what he says in a 731D following about excessive self love. I mean, which is a virtue which is here meant? Reasonable self love. Self love ca can, of course, also have a good meaning. Does he mean that? Fill out here? I do not know. Do you have any notion? I think a certain amount of self-love is unavoidable. Yeah, that goes without saying. No, yeah, but we are speaking not now of that, but whether the right, the right amount is not virtuous. does not des deserve to be called a virtue. With the, I'm now thinking about, about uh, a case where people have less than the right amount of self-love and were condemned as not being virtuous, and that is in the, in the Garden of Eden. I'm not sure that it helps us to understand this by bringing that in, but that just occurs to me as a case of the deficiency of the kind of self-love that would be involved in virtue. Yeah, but in this sense, you can say all uh, sinners are deficient in self-love involuntarily because they choose what harms them. You can say that, then... Um... Yeah, I was thinking more specifically of the fact that they made clothes to hide their nakedness, and in some sense they must have 
not love something about their nakedness if they wish to hide it. It's maybe their sin that they're hiding as well, but I think that that, that original lack of self-love, that deficiency of self-love, might be a deficiency. Yeah, but, Ben, did, I mean, when we speak to the idea, of course, of what uh, regard is possible, that a man is a deficient in self-love, in which way that he is completely sacrificing himself for others? Do you mean that by any chance? I didn't understand. That someone is sacrificing himself completely for others in an unreasonable way. That would be a, a, a deficiency of self-love. Yeah. Yeah, but still, Plato would deny that, that he is, uh, uh, would not see it in the way in which we do it. Um, it is a deficiency of reasonable self, of the right kind of self, but not, so to say, altruism, as we would call it, excessive altruism. <coughs> do I make myself clear? Yeah, you do, but... I wish you'd say something about about the Garden of Eden because that's I'm, I'm now saying something that's more specifically directed, I guess, against Plato, the denigration of the body, as as we see it in the Republic, the notion that the best part of man is the only part that's worthwhile. That might be a kind of deficiency of self-love in the fuller sense that we might learn of in the Bible? That is a very long question, and I think that Plato is not in favor of emaciation, extreme asceticism, or whatever. I mean, what, um, what is the basis of this judgment? Well, he seems to, at certain points, ignore part of himself, that is the body, entirely. And I was wondering if I believe that I would like to know an example so that I can follow you better. Well, I think that that in the Republic, I mean, as has been pointed out, Socrates seems to forget. That. Yeah, well, that is assuming that is true. That doesn't prove, of course, that Plato is underestimates the body, but that for for certain purposes, in a certain conversation, from a certain point of view, he abstracts from the body more than is wise to do. And you wouldn't no, call that a No, no, no. Uh, but I know that there is a certain traditional Platonism which can be said to be responsible for certain extremely ascetic yeah. tendencies in the West. Yeah. Yes? That's the, the most striking example of, of self-love here, of excessive self-love here, is if someone regards himself as knowing while he is ignorant. That is, I mean, uh, uh, no, and, and he doesn't mean particularly people who are greedy of food or of wealth or so, that these are relatively harmless forms of self-love. Really great forms are those uh, like the, mention, the one mentioned here, being blinded to one's defects uh, by, by, by self-love, by identifying the good with one's own. That is a simple formula for uh, 
self-love in the bad sense. Yes. In that connection, um, the very beginning of the book five, um, the soul is spoken of as a possession of a man. Yes. And one of the difficulties I have with the notion of self-love is what is the self of which which possesses soul, body, and all the other things. That there's a kind of language which speaks of the soul as Well, don't we speak of, uh, does a man not speak of my soul? And this pronoun is called possessive pronoun. So, and Plato says, possession, tema. Yeah? I mean, that the question, the deeper question, whether the, the possessor, the ultimate possessor, is not the soul alone, and that is a longer question. It is not raised here. But uh, in common parlance, I say, my body, my property, my soul, my eyes, my ears, my intelligence, and so on and so on. And it is said here to be, even the gods are called here a man's possession. And that does not mean necessarily any uh, statues of gods, of, say, of tutelary gods, of his family or tribe, which he has at home. And so that can also be meant, but uh, in the wider sense, uh, wherever you use a possessive, possessive pronoun to speak, grammatically speaking, of possessions. I think that is not more, meant more than this. Yeah. But the soul is nevertheless a particular, uh, uh, as a possession, because it is most, the highest degree, one's own, as is said here at the very beginning of Book 5. Yes, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Oh, no, are you, do you want to continue? You want to continue? Say then that getting back to your question about that, what the proper amount is for self love, or in what way one might think of self love as a virtue and you can weaken self love. Yeah. Might that not have to do um, with the proper love of that part of oneself, which is the soul, and its proper cultivation? Yeah. But it's not a virtue. Well, um, but if it is the proper cultivation, the activity directed toward it, is that not a price moving? No, I, I think that this common balance of my soul is the expression all right, but still, you, I see, then I misunderstood, I didn't hear what it was about. But uh, does it not make sense to say that the right kind of self-love is a virtue, although it is ordinarily not called so? I'm not sure. Well, I give you an example of which I can't help thinking. There is a well-known vice, apart from self-love, which is generally uh, regarded as very bad, and that is love of gain, philokardia. There is a, a Socratic, a Platonic dialogue called the Hipparchus, in which is shown that love of gain, rightly understood, is very good, i.e. a virtue. Because again, you mean, of course, something good. Yeah? I mean, if someone uh, losses, losses are no good. You want, uh, you want a gain. And uh, of course, you must distinguish between worthwhile gains and gains which are not worthwhile. 
and then uh, the law of gain is then law of the good, and to that extent, the virtue. But at that moment, therefore, cease. Yeah. Yeah. On the highest level, yeah. But still, that takes some time. This word? Yes, sure. That word's what he means, yeah. Now, uh, so are we, can, can we can any one of us uh, see the Supreme Being in this Yeah, but this, Mr. Burns, if a man has a sound estimate of his worth and perhaps of his great worth, is of course not vain. Yeah. He's magnanimous. Yeah. He has a sound estimate of his worth. And, and the worth is great. And the worth is great. And then yeah, it's yeah, but that seems to be what Mr. Carr No, is. no, that he cannot have. No, no, I, I don't like that. <laughs> Anyone is completely without that. Now, yeah, what? Yeah, complace, what self complacency. Self, you mean that? Yeah. Yeah, but that is a long question. Sipi ipsi placere to to be this for oneself as distinguished from deo placere, from pleasing God is from the biblical point of view terrible. Yes. But from the Platonic Aristotelian point of view, it's perfectly all right that one is pleased with oneself if one is rightly pleased. For example, if someone, uh, to take a simple and humble example, uh, someone uh, goes through high school and college and has always done his homework and uh, has received the proper honors, and his family are pleased with him, and he is pleased with himself. What's wrong with that? And one can apply this. Pun? Pun? No, there's nothing wrong. I mean, if he has a feeling that this proves that he is of presidential timber, as they say, then he is a fool. But if he is pleased with himself for that, uh, for, um, for with, the, with having achieved these limited goals, that's perfectly all right. I mean, and, and I don't see uh, I don't see how one can call that vanity. No, that I, I didn't mean that. Yeah, sure. I don't mean that, but I mean in addition to that, that is almost you know, all that we are saying, almost so so minimal. Yeah, yeah, but that is a real question. I mean, sibi ipsi placere, that is viewed very differently from the biblical point of view and from the Platonic Aristotelian point of view, very differently. 
And what you call vanity is, is something which has no proper status, I believe, in Pedro Aristotle. When they speak of shaunotis, well, to what does it refer? To a puffed up, inflated us. Yeah, no, that says that is a great effect. Is a, not a harmless defect, by the way, because in most cases it is ridiculous. But this kind of self-scrutiny, am I not unduly pleased while I should still think more of my improvement and of my past sins and so on, that is, they do not expect that. Yes, yeah, sure. That refers to that, uh, very clear to vanity in the uh, most radical th sense, namely to be enamored of one's opinions and uh, even more uh, of one's judgment than of one's yes. opinions. Yeah. And, and the question is whether it is possible to avoid that altogether. I don't. I don't know. I, I would say, I would believe, uh, believe Plato and also this is possible. It is always, when one sees an other human being, which is always easier, according to a famous word of the New Testament, uh, and who is vain, yeah, in an act of vanity, it is always amusing, is it not? Or, or, or annoying. Perhaps, yeah. But it ended a weakness, a weakness, a folly. Like, a, yeah, uh, I, one can observe it from time to time, and, and, and especially some famous people I have seen there, and it was extremely funny. Yes? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to try another formulation. Uh, what you seem to suggest is that. Uh, no man can ever really have justifiable pride. Because you seem to suggest that. No, no, I, I, I really don't think that. You can't think it is a difference between justifiable pride and, uh, and, and any kind of pride. There is a difference. No, what I really mean, and well, every man who would have it, according to you, must always have the suspicion that, well, is he perhaps would be vain in having any kind of pride. That's what you sort of mean, what I, 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 I don't think so. No, what, what is behind my statement is something much more, uh, much more fundamental. That is, uh, the, the, that is that which we, which we mean by the personal pronoun, I. I. Now, I, I, I do think that ultimately, uh, Plato knows about the fact that we can never forget that I am I. I didn't hear the verb, Plato. Mourns. I don't see that. Where do you find it particularly? Well, for instance, in the ninth book of the poem, when he, when he talks about the soul, which is a complex, then at one point he says, yes, but at a certain point, that complexity vanishes and it becomes sin. Now, at that point, there is no I. Yes, but but still, I would say, uh, then you understand. Uh, then uh, uh, you, it is hard to uh, recognize vanity in what you say now. I mean the the phenomenon phenomenon we generally call vanity. Well, I think that uh, 
self-love, yes, but, but not vanity. Not honoring, that's not honoring parents. No. In order to honor parents, there has to be some of the stuff, and you have to have some regard for it. You have to, in some sense, love it. Love that it's there, and, and think but, that it's important. But it in must be your parents whether, I mean, truly or legally is not so important, provided you are sure that they are your parents. Yeah? Yeah. But it must be yours. I mean, if you have a generally reverential posture toward people of the preceding generation, that's not honoring the parents. Yeah, that's yeah. not what's going Yeah, it must be people who can uh, command and forbid to you things. That's the real test of honoring parents. Yeah? How an example. Well, we will continue next time. first gives what I venture to call the second table, the second half of the prelude to the whole code of law, the first uh, table having been presented in book four. And here the following subjects have been discussed. First, the things or beings to be honored next to the gods and the dear forefathers. And first is the soul. And he does, discusses first the wrong ways of honoring the soul. Here we come across a question, is the legislator concerned with honoring the soul? Honoring the soul means improving the soul. Now this question is reinforced by the fact that Socrates discusses laws and obedience to the laws in the Crito. The term soul is studiously avoided. The second subject was the other things to be honored next to the soul. And this is First the body, then wealth, children, kinsfolk, friends, the city and fellow citizens, strangers and suppliants. And then he turns to what is in fact, although it is not so called, the right ways of honoring the soul. And this means the virtues. In this section, he is silent on the legislator. That's the virtues that transcend somehow the sphere of law. Now, here was a passage which was not 
well translated by Burry, and which we should perhaps uh, briefly read uh, again. That is 730b. As concerns a man's social relations toward his parents, himself, and his own belongings, towards the state also, and friends and kindred, whether foreign relations or domestic, our exposition is now fairly complete. It remains to expound next the character which is most conducive to nobility of life. Yeah, how he himself, of what quality he himself he should be in order to uh, live his life more nobly. Yes? And after that, we shall have to state all the matters which are subject not to law. No, yeah, this, after that, uh, is, that is, I think, uh, very misleading, because it means exactly the same what he, what he said earlier in what you read, that will be next. We, we have to discuss next. So then, what not law, praise and blame, through education makes everyone amenable to obedience to the law, this will next to what we have said be said. So it is not a matter of, of law, but of praise and blame, something which cannot be affected by law. Now then, among the virtues, the section which begins here, he speaks first of truth and calls a man who adheres to truth blessed, then justice, and of the just man he says, he is a great man in the city and, and perfect. Truth and justice are the two peaks of virtue, but is, as is indicated by the different epithets, two different poles of virtue. I think that is the same as in Aristotle's Ethics, where we have, if we look at it quite from the outside, the highest of the moral virtues, justice, and then the theoretical life, or the life devoted to truth, as a different pole, as a higher pole. Now, the third mentioned is good sense and moderation, then fourth, spiritedness and genderness, and finally, the right kind of self-love. The word self-love in Greek, philautia, does not occur in Plato, but it is perfectly legitimate to use that term here. Now the question is, why is this subject discussed here, and especially in this place? The reason I believe is this. The Athenian had suggested that the soul is to be honored to a higher degree than the friends and the city, to say nothing of others. That's to say the concern with oneself has a much higher status. And therefore, the warning of the wrong kind of self-love is particularly in order. Now, after we had reached that point, there was a discussion between Mr. Klein and me, and I would like to repeat that, at least as I understand it, and I could agree with it. And Mr. Klein brought up the, the relation of Self-love and vanity. Plato, of course, doesn't speak of vanity. Yet, what is vanity? One can say, considering what uh, the Athenian says here, to be pleased with oneself, with one's own, so that one prefers it to what is truly good and noble and on the ground that it is one's own. But to be pleased with oneself, to be self-complacent in the literal sense, pleasing oneself, if this does not go together with such 
irrational preference, and in addition, if it is well founded, it is all right. I believe we agreed up to this point. Now, there is a more subtle case, not discussed by Plato, and that is this that one is deservedly pleased with his own, does and does not disparage the deeds or speeches of others, which are equally good, but enjoys his own more than that of others. That, I think, was the case, wasn't it? Now, you said this is vanity. And that would imply, I think, that it's bad, but inevitable. Yeah? But inevitable. Yeah. yeah. That was the issue. I would say it is inevitable, but not vanity. And for the reason, because one cannot help enjoying one's own, which is that of one's own, which, which is satisfactory, which is good. Now, why did Plato not discuss it? And let us take an example. Someone has written a good page and is pleased with it. And let us assume rightly pleased. He necessarily enjoys that page more than good pages of equal merit written by others. That is inevitable. But here's the difficulty. The exhibition or the display of that feeling is petty and unbecoming, and therefore absolutely to be disparaged. Now, to make it to, Plato doesn't go into that kind of question, I believe because he is concerned with the becoming, with what in Greek is called euschemosyne, with uh, what is proper uh, uh, to, to exhibit, to display. And he prefers that to what we would call today psychology. He doesn't go into this kind of questions. Uh, uh, because uh, they they are not truly enlightening. Would you agree with that? Yes. Good. Now, yes, uh, they are not truly enlightening. I mean, and the uh, the impression which uh, many modern people have is that that the ancients, in particular Plato, were in a way naive because they did not have or use or show that psychology for which modern novelists in particular are so famous. I don't believe that is true. I think they knew that very well, but they distinguished between what is proper to discuss, useful to discuss, and what not. And a kind of morbid dissection of what is sinful and what is not sinful in one's feelings was wholly alien to them. And in the beautiful uh, sentence of Aristotle, the intentions or the feelings are immanifest. We, we take our bearings in judging by the actions or speeches of men and uh, uh, by the whole way of life and so on, but do not make this kind of psychology. Is there anyone who would like to take up this issue? Thank you. 
the best men have been more refined by this. Kind yeah, yeah, sure. Now, Nietzsche was, of course, a psychologist, perhaps more than anyone else. And that was even his boast to be such, you know, psychology. Yeah, but that is, uh, that is wholly alien to the ancients. And he spoke of the naivete and the superficiality of the ancients with a view to that. And a grotesque example of this you can find, there are many psychological remarks which he makes throughout his work, but what I found most uh, revealing is a speech in the Zarathustra called of the pale Greek criminal. And he is a man who has committed murder and taken the money from the murdered individual. And then, of course, he will be uh, is regarded as a man who murdered from greed or need, whatever the case may be. And Nietzsche says that it's a very superficial understanding, and he uses this, I think, abominable expression. They haven't crawled deep enough into the soul of that fellow. What he truly wanted was to see blood, but he did not have the courage to admit this to himself, and therefore he took away the money and in order to have a, a rationalization, as I think they would call that today. And there are many, many more things of nature, sometimes very impressive things, of course, of this psychology, revealing this psychology. What he says about many philosophers and poets is psychological in this sense, crawling into their souls. Yeah. But, but, but if there's a serious argument, I guess the argument might be that uh, the exploration of these things can allow uh, uh, the, the fuller explanation modern thinkers of these things could allow a man to discover more fully the obstacles in his own psyche to seeing things as they are. Yeah, but here you must not forget, I think Freud himself pointed out the fact that what he called the Oedipus complex was perfectly known to Plato. You know, in the 10th book of the Republic, where he speaks of what is going on in the underworld of the soul, and there are such desires, like those of Oedipus, and, uh, but they do not come to the fore, uh, because they are, uh, or they come to the fore only in dreams, or, uh, and not in, uh, when people are awake, and so Plato knew these kind of things, that there is such an underworld. But how revealing it is uh, regarding man and his ends, his destiny, and that is a great question. Now, if our destiny is determined, say, by our first three years before any education in a serious sense of the word can start, then of course uh, Plato is entirely wrong. And then all the other things uh, 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 which Freud explicitly or implicitly objects to are correct. But if uh, this is a kind of uh, prehistory of the individual, and the true history begins with his education, I mean, and not merely toilet training and such nice things, you know, and then uh, this prehistory will appear as of rather little interest, although it may accidentally be of interest. And in the case of, uh, of uh, sick people and so on. 
Yeah. You know, Yeah, we, uh, surely intellection by intellection, but the, the question of vanity would come up if someone is, say, the discoverer of some insight and this awareness, then of course the, uh, the I, as I call it, comes in. Yeah? But that is, that is accidental, it's not essential. I don't this would be for the the inappropriateness of this kind of role in psychology. This is one very It's true. Who, yeah, yeah. Who this way. But how it was found, that didn't belong to, to, well, to, to the discipline of the mind. And that's exactly what the models consider as the real. The, the, inve the inventive, the logic of invention. And the, the, the finding, the finding yeah. of the analysis, the analytical way. Yeah. Yeah, but I think here one would have to uh, distinguish, for example, uh, can one not learn something and not merely psychological from the history of a discovery? Of a discovery. Well, Show that something is so included. Yeah, sure. But let us t take this simple lesson, which one uh, uh, may draw from some observation, that it is impossible to say uh, which starting questions lead to discovery of important things, yeah? That is of some importance, I think, for every man, especially young people, yeah? That there are not, say, so-called important questions with which you have to start, that wherever you begin to dig, it may appear, uh, something important may appear. That is, I think, uh, useful and can be brought home by um, as a study of the lives of discoverers. That I don't think that this is psychology. You mean it's not psychology? No. Right. Yeah. But it is not... Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not speaking now of a, of a logic of invention, but simply of some notion of how infinitely various ways are 
the possibly profitable ways to go about one's inquiries. Someone told me, maybe you were, that Heidegger said once to a student who wanted to have some notion of a doctorate thesis or so, and Heidegger, perhaps he didn't know enough of the subject, but he said, try whether you succeed. That was, I think, a wise advice. Yeah? The only way to... And this is, has something to do. One cannot know in advance. No, of course it is not psychology, but it has it derived some insight about the complexity of investigation, of understanding. Yeah? So then, shall we continue? At 732D, at the end. Thus, as regards the right character of institutions and the right character of individuals, we have now laid down practically all the rules that are of divine sanction. Those that are of human origin we have not stated as yet, but state them we must, for our converse is with men, not God. Yeah, now let us talk about regulations of, of, of human origin. Uh, that is perhaps, uh, we have said about, the, about these uh, pursuits, we have said about everything insofar as they are divine. But the human things uh, have not yet been said. Now, this distinction with divine and human occurred before, especially in this first long speech of the Athenian Book One, 631b to d, in which he distinguished between the divine goods and the human goods. Now, there the divine goods were the virtues. That corresponds roughly to what he means here also. But the human goods there were the body and wealth, which have been discussed already, as we have seen. So he means here something else by the human things. And what they are, we will see it once, uh, um, to mention only the main point, the so human things he has here in mind are pleasures and pains pleasures and pains, and these are uh, phenomena belonging to the soul. So the subject is here, as it was in the section on the virtues, honoring the soul, but now from a human rather than from a divine point of view. Now what does he say about the pleasures? Pleasures, pains, and desires are by nature especially human, and from... Yeah, to the highest degree, human. Uh, I mean, not, not that other animals have, don't have that, but uh, to the highest degree, it, they are not... Uh, that distinguishes men uh, from gods, not from animals, yes? And from these, of necessity, every mortal creature is, so to say, suspended and dependent by the strongest cords of influence. Thus, one should commend the noblest life, not merely because it is, is of superior fashion in respect of fair repute. Sanction? But is it of superior? Fashion. Yes, one could even say stateliness. In regard to good repute, yes. But also because if a man consents to taste it and not to shun it in his youth, it is superior, likewise, it is superior, likewise, in that which all men covet, an excess, namely, of joy and a deficiency of pain throughout yeah. the whole of life. So the noblest life is at the same time pleasant, and that is to support the recommendation of the virtues which preceded, yes? that this will clearly be the result, if a man tastes of it rightly, will at once be fully evident. 
But wherein does this rightness consist? That is the question which we must now that is the question we must, which we must now, under the instruction of our argument, consider, comparing the more pleasant life with the more painful. We must in this wise consider whether this mode is natural to us and that other mode unnatural. So in other words, the question is, is not the noble life by nature pleasant? And the ignoble life, an ignoble life by nature unpleasant, apart from considerations of nobility. Yes. We desire that pleasure, pleasure should be ours, but pain we neither choose nor desire. And the neutral state we do not desire in place of pleasure, but we do desire it in exchange for pain. And we desire less pain with more pleasure, but we do not desire less pleasure with more pain. And when the two are evenly balanced, we are unable to state any clear preference. Now all these states in their number, quantity, intensity, equality, and in the opposites thereof, have or have not influence on desire to govern its choice of each. So these things being thus ordered of necessity, we desire that mode of life in which the feelings are many, great, and intense, with which of pleasure predominating, but we do not desire the life in which the feelings of pain predominate. And contrariwise, we do not desire the life in which the feelings are few, small, and gentle, but if painful, predominate. But if the pleasure predominate, we do desire it. Further, we must regard the life in which there is an equal balance of pleasure and pain, as we previously regarded the neutral state. We desire the balanced life insofar as it exceeds the painful life in point of what we like, but we do not desire it insofar as it exceeds the pleasant lives in point of the things we dislike. The lives of us men must all be regarded as naturally bound up in these feelings, and what kinds of lives we naturally desire is what we must distinguish. If we are, if, but if we assert that we desire anything else, we only say, so through ignorance and inexperience of the lives as they really are. So Plato, or the Athenian claims here, they have laid down the limits of our wishes or desires. And within these limits we move. You must have observed the emphasis on, what, on nature and what is natural. Uh, more emphatic here uh, than in the preceding sections. And after these limits have been laid down, the question will now be answered, which life is by nature more pleasant, the noble or the ignoble one? Is there any point you would like to raise regarding this longish statement about the various factors involved in pleasure and pain. This is a subject which is taken up by Plato in quite a few dialogues, for example, in, in the Protagoras, where there is a kind of um, calculus of pleasure suggested, and something like this seems to be here also implied by the, a very complicated calculus, so that it would perhaps not wise be wise to call it a calculus. No, let us go on then. What then, and how many, are the lives in which a man, when he has chosen the desirable and voluntary in preference to the undesirable and the involuntary, and has made it into a private law for himself by choosing what is at once both congenial and pleasant and most good and noble, may live as happily as he can? Yes, yeah, blessedly as he can. I mean, to a somewhat stronger expression. Or he must make it a law, must make it a law to himself. Uh, private uh, is an addition of burning. This is a law which each man uh, gives to himself. It's not left to the decision of the legislator, 
because the guiding consideration now is pleasure and the legislator is not concerned with our pleasures as pleasures, but with what should be done to our pleasures or pains, that we should, how we should control them and so on. And therefore it is, yes, yes. Let us pronounce that one of them is the temperate life, one the wise, one the brave, and let us class the healthy life as one. And to these let us oppose four others, the foolish, the cowardly, the licentious, and the diseased. You see that it is, uh, the first three are interchanged. Uh, that means interchangeable. Moderation or uh, temperance, good sense, and courage. Uh, healthy is kept separate, distinct in both cases, because it is obviously something very different. Yes? He that knows the temperate life will set it down as gentle in all respects, affording mild pleasures and mild pain, moderate appetites and desires, void of frenzy. But the licentious life he will set down as violent in all directions, affording both pains and pleasures that are extreme, appetites that are intense and maddening, and desires the most frenzied possible. Yet this, uh, the word desire here is eros, erotis. So the least one would have to say passionate desires, huh? to distinguish it from desire in general. Yeah. And whereas in the temperate life, the pleasures outweigh the pains, in the licentious life, the pains exceed the pleasures in extent, number, and frequency. Whence it necessarily results that one life must be naturally more pleasant, the other more painful to us. And it is no longer possible for the man who desires a pleasant life to voluntarily to live a licentious life. But it is clear by now, if our argument is right, that no man can possibly be licentious voluntarily it is owing to ignorance or incontinence or both that the great bulk of mankind live lives lacking in temperance. Here, let us stop here. You see, he makes, he makes here a point of some importance, apart from the general thesis. Those who prefer the dissolute life do it either from ignorance or from incontinence. That is, it differs from what is usually called the Socratic view, when Socrates tried to say that incontinence is ignorance. Plato makes it, or the Athenian stranger rather, makes a distinction between the two. Yes? Is incontinence the same thing as compulsion? No, not the same thing. Well, I mean, for example, if uh, you uh, may be compelled by hunger uh, to steal a roll, you, know? you wouldn't call such a man dissolute, would you? But or you may be compelled to jump out of the window because the house is on fire. You couldn't call a man who does this dissolute. So uh, the, uh, the most you could say is this dissoluteness is a kind of compulsion. But isn't there some cases, for example, in the case of an alcoholic who has been drinking for 10 years and then yeah. suddenly one day realizes that drinking is very bad and yeah. has the right principle, but because he has a habit that is bad and because yeah. he's not not measurably strong, he can't break the habit. He knows that drinking is bad, but he cannot act on it. Yes. Yes, that is common sense, and therefore we all would make a distinction between ignorance and incontinence, or however we call it. But Socrates seems to have said the opposite. That's the minor difficulty here. Yeah? Yeah, because it looks as if it might be possible 
for a man to act in a licentious way voluntarily, not voluntarily in the sense of deliberate choice, but voluntarily in the sense that he has a habit that he's not able to break. And even though he knows something is better, he voluntarily... Yeah, we, I understand that, but uh, still I think we must also consider the fact that this is a, on the face of it, a very unsocratic assertion, which is made here, the distinction. Perhaps Socrates didn't mean it as simply as it is understood, and as, for example, Aristotle presents it in the ethics. That could be. But as for the argument itself, uh, this Athenian says, uh, makes uh, an important uh, qualification. He says, if what has been said now is correct. So, he, in other words, he does not claim that this has been proven simply that the moderate life, the temperate life, is more pleasant than the intemperate life. He has made a case for it. Yes? Could you uh, say something about why, when in three, there are three of the four cardinal virtues I mentioned to you, uh, they seem to be indicated that justice is left out? Yes, uh, it did not escape me. But I believe we can discuss it more profitably at the end of this section. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you observed it. Yes. So, and now he does something, perhaps we get some light on the difficulty here, is that this is not said to be firmly established and unqualifiedly established from the secret. Yes. Similarly, with regard to the diseased life and the healthy life, one must observe that while both have pleasures and pains, the pleasures exceed the pains in health, but the pains the pleasures in disease. Our desire in the choice of lives is not that pain should be in excess, but the life we have judged the more pleasant is that in which pain is exceeded by pleasure. Yeah, that is elementary that the healthy life is more pleasant than the life of sickness. And this is therefore no qualification occurs here. But what about disease? Is, has disease anything to do with ignorance and incontinence? I mean, in all cases. Say, if someone has, has suffers from cancer or... Uh, pardon? Yeah, but not necessarily through ignorance or incontinence, yeah. So that is a very different case from... Uh, and the question is whether something of this might not be true, as it were, retroactively, of moderation. Uh, perhaps this would fall under incontinence, maybe. I mean, such cases in which uh, a disease of the organism uh, leads to uh, certain forms of dissoluteness. One couldn't call this, surely not, uh, one couldn't ascribe this to ignorance, but it would also might be wrong to ascribe it to incontinence. But it's the same word which I, uh, is ordinarily translated by incontinence, but one can also translate it by dissoluteness. It all depends on the context and in opposition to what it is used. Uh, but the example which, which Mr. Gary gave is perfectly correct. The, the, the alcoholic is incontinent, not ignorant. I mean, at least he doesn't have to be in a, in a moment. Yes? I just missed it earlier. Uh, when, which, which would be classified the alcoholic who realized that drinking was bad? Pardon? The alcoholic who realized that drinking was bad, 
If he drank, was that ignorance or incontinence? You know, if he realizes that it is bad, then it is not ignorance. Earlier in the book, uh, uh, the Athena asked the question, what is the greatest ignorance? And he answered, uh, that which we see in a man who hates instead of loving what he judges to be noble and good, while he loves and cherishes that which he judges to be evil and unjust. And you brought the example of cigarette smoking. And that seems to be now fairly close to what we're calling incontinence. Yes, I mean, that, uh, it is good you remind, remind us of that passage. But then you would perhaps understand also, uh, in the first passage, if I remember it well, the disharmony between desires and one's thoughts is the greatest ignorance, is it not? Is this not what he said there? Where is the passage? It's uh, 689. Yeah, the dissonance of pleasure and pain with the opinion according to the Logos, I assert to be the utmost ignorance. And if this is so, then clearly the alcoholic uh, would, would be an ignorant man, and Socrates would be right in reducing incontinence to ignorance. Yeah? So the difficulty occurs within the laws itself that you have this way. And one would have to figure out what the reasoning is leading up to the assertion that incontinence is ignorance. As a long question. It would probably be not be sufficient to say that the alcoholic was originally, uh, was originally able not to become an al alcoholic. That is one of Aristotle's arguments. Yeah. Um, it was a kind of original ignorance which led to the incontinence. That is a bit uh, forced to explain it that way. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, a man who sees uh, a very powerful position for the most Exactly, I'm thinking about the man who seeks the most powerful position. Say, a man who wants to be, uh, say, president of the United States. It seems that uh, he's, if he's close enough for it all to be a feasible endeavor, and close enough to the position and the possibility of attaining, he must understand, it seems he would understand that this life is not the more pleasant life he's choosing, but a life that is going to be involved in. Uh, frenzy of activity almost seems to me reaching uh, activity is almost at madness where there are many things happening. Uh, he's always making the most important decisions. Uh, he's always subject to the, the most, uh, uh, the strongest attacks on a, on a person. Uh, and yet he chooses, it seems to me, that in the less pleasant life, <coughs> Uh, for the sake of the power, the position that he had, that, that he will have in some instances, right? Yeah, but it's good that there should be such people. The question, of course, is whether he does not derive uh, pleasure from the power, as you call it. I mean, if you would, if you would think we, we, uh, I think we all have some inkling of how hurried a man lives who is president of the United States, especially in our age. But when we would think of miserable people, 
who lead a miserable life, that the President of the United States, I think, would not occur to us as the most obvious example, because there are many comforts going with that, that kind of misery. Hmm? I mean, uh, he can, if, if he ne needs a retreat into a placid environment, it is for no one easier than for the president uh, to get it, uh, to say nothing of other pleasures. And uh, there are some people who derive pleasure from the mere fact that there are universally known in the country, yeah? and on the whole, treated with very great respect. I mean... Uh, I'm just thinking more of the, of the fact that, it, that he obtains the presidency must stem from a very immoderate desire or passion uh, for the position, so otherwise it could not obtain. That is not true. I mean, if we... Uh, are there no considerations other than those of pleasure? Yes. Uh, could a man not think in a given situation uh, that he, he is the only man with a, a chance to be elected who could give the policies of this country a sensible direction? Yes. And would he not as we say, for reasons of duty, as the Greeks might say, because of its nobility, choose that and say, and, and prefer it, even at the price of considerable discomfort. That's a different question. I mean. Yeah. As some people thought that in 1968 of Senator Eugene McCarthy, you know, that he was such a man. Now, Senator Eugene McCarthy appeared in this light to many people in 1968, if you remember that. I mean, such, at any rate, such human beings are thinkable, are they not? So, uh, pleasure is surely not the only consideration, and of course that is, all the, that is understood here. That is how the human uh, motivations as distinguished from the divine ones of which he had spoken before. Now we only wish to show that the noble lives at the same time the most pleasant life. And he has shown it hitherto only with a view to, let us say, temperance that a man who is very moderate in his desires for food, drink, and so on, and doesn't go in for exciting trips, has a rather placid, has more chance of leading a placid and a serene life and pleasant life and than the one who goes in for this kind of thing who has uh, paroxysms of uh, infinite, uh, indescribable pleasures, but bought at, a, at the price of terrible pain. That is the only consideration here. Yeah? Isn't that in the sense a, isn't that in the sense a form of, uh, maybe the wrong word is pleasure, but if the right thing is to do uh, in the situation we just proposed of the man who is the best man to be. So yeah. uh, isn't that in the form of, of pleasure since he is uh, doing what is right? Yeah, but this is a different consideration, is it not? Yes, it would be a different kind of pleasure. Is that you know, no, Plato, Plato would say that, uh, and implies here, uh, that these are two different considerations, nobility on the one hand and pleasure on the other. Uh, but if we want to have some unity or harmony in our life, we would surely wish that the noble life is also preferable from the point of view of pleasure. 
and that is what he is trying to establish here. I beg your pardon. Are all pleasures to be considered as bodily pleasures? Uh, no. Uh, presumably, in the case of moderation or temperance, the bodily pleasures are primarily meant, but it is not. There is no explicit limitation to bodily pleasures. That's to say, pleasures going with hopes and pains going with fears would also be considered, and they are not strictly speaking bodily, although they may refer to bodily pleasures or pains. Well, with regard to hopes, and then with also with regard to objects of desire in general, uh, can these objects of desire, seen from the standpoint of desire, be seen as, object, be seen as pleasures, a pleasure of state? Now, what I'm going to speak about is, is it possible to speak of, of intellectual pleasures? Yeah, well, the intellectual pleasures surely would be, that is implied, be in favor of the noble life. So we have to think more of the better known pleasures. Yeah. Yes, now let us uh, continue that. We will assert then that since the temperate life has its feelings smaller, fewer, and lighter than the licentious life, and the wise life than the foolish, and the brave than the cowardly. And since the one life is superior to the other in pleasure, but inferior in pain, the brave life is victorious over the cowardly, and the wise over the foolish. Consequently, the one set of lives ranks as more pleasant than the other. The temperate, brave, wise, and healthy lives are more pleasant than the cowardly, foolish, licentious, and diseased. To sum up, the life of bodily and spiritual virtue, as compared with that of vice, is not only more pleasant, but also exceeds greatly in nobility, rectitude, virtue, and good fame, so that it causes the man who lives it to live ever so much more happily than he who lives the opposite life. Yeah. But you see, no attempt is made to show in any detail that the superiority of pleasure applies also the, to the sensible life, life of sensible men, and to the life of courage. Now, when he speaks of courage, in here first, uh, in, in C5, uh, then he changes the expression. He doesn't say the courageous life, but the life of courage. And also the opposite, the life of cowardice. There is a, a certain change in, of the expression, which may be due to the fact that the relation of courage to pleasure and pain differs from that of the other virtues. That is at least the case according to Aristotle's analysis. Aristotle says courage has, is painful. In all the other virtues, the being in act is pleasant. For example, acting, eating moderately, yeah? eating moderately, drinking moderately is pleasant. But exposing your life to the enemy, that's the classic case for Aristotle, that is not pleasant. The imminence of death and wounds is necessarily painful. And therefore, there is a question whether, in the case of the courageous and cowardly man, the cowardly man might not lead, within certain limits, a more pleasant life than the courageous man. So this is a, is a difficulty here. Whether this has anything to do retroactively 
uh, with the case of the moderate man, uh, that is a question which I cannot answer. Now, the difficulty here is this. As someone has said, nothing is said about justice. And he has four lives or four virtues, just as in the Republic, but the fourth is health, bodily health, replacing justice. Why does he do that? Now, the question of the relation of virtue and pleasure had been discussed before in the second book, in 660D to 663A. And there the Athenian stated what the legislator must persuade or compel the poets to say. And they are compelled to say that one cannot separate the just from the pleasant. And how does he prove it? He, in this way, and only in this way, that justice is accompanied by good repute. And, and good repute is something not unpleasant, as he puts it there mildly. Yeah, but good repute is precisely the thing from which he abstracts here explicitly. And therefore, abstracting from good repute and thinking only of other pleasures, he cannot say that the just life is more pleasant than the unjust life. What does that mean? What's the difference between justice and the other virtues? And in, with particular reference to good repute, there are, in the case of the other virtues, the pleasure deriving from their exercise or from their possession is independent of other people's knowing. In the case of justice, the pleasure deriving from uh, one's being just uh, depends on other people's knowledge. Uh, therefore, he is, he is silent here on justice. So the pleasure deriving from justice is, in a precise sense, less natural than the other pleasures. And that is... I think the reason. You see, he said here explicitly at the end of the passage which you just read, that is the noble life excels the others by an excess of nobility and correctness and virtue and good repute. That we admit. But in addition, the new thing, it excels it also in regard to pleasure. So pleasure and good repute are two very different things here. They were uh, treated differently in that earlier section. This, the status of justice among the virtues is from this point of view unique. So, and now we are at the end of the prelude and come to the law or to the laws. Mr. Sitter? Uh, I'm not sure of the, uh, of the role of the discussion of uh, the populace of pleasures plays, because it seems that it raises many issues which are not necessary for the later discussion of the comparison of lives. As in comparing the lives, all we ask is, which life is more, has an excess of pleasure, more pleasure than pain, and which life has more pain than pleasure. But the discussion of the calculus of pleasures raised such other issues as the degree of intensity, the frequency, and so forth, yeah. which uh, seem to be unnecessary 
for the accurate assessment? No, that is being considered, uh, as he makes clear in, in the discussion of moderation. The moderate man's pleasures cannot be compared in their intensity and vehemence to the pleasures of the immoderate man. Cannot be compared. But the, he says the gentle and quiet pleasures, in these respects, the moderate life surpasses the life, the immoderate life, the dissolute life. It has been considered. In the case of the discussion of the capitalism pleasures, uh, we're also confronted with such possibility as there is an equal balance between pleasure and pain, let's say, a neutral state. Yeah. But in one case, the, both the pleasures and the pains are violent, and in uh, the what? Other case, uh, are violent, are strong, intense. Uh, but in the other case, they are uh, both mild. And in that case, it's that is what he said. I mean, at least no, no reasonable preference possible. That is what he said. And that the sort of case is not required for the further discussion of the comparison of lives. Because in the comparison of lives, we have the simple case that uh, pleasures predominate in the good lives and pain in the good Yeah, but what shall he do if the two lives are equal? in respect to pleasures or pains, then there would be no ground of preferring one to the other on the ground of pleasure. But we are fortunate enough that there is such a balance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a certain difficulty which I have not been try and not succeeded in enucleating, and that has something to do with the fact that Moderation or temperance is followed by health, uh, where that case is obviously different. I mean, uh, let us assume a man has all the three human virtues discussed, uh, but suffers from a very painful, long-lasting disease. What is, I mean, how does his life come? here in regard to pleasure, with the life of a crook who enjoys perfect health. And that is a point which would have to be discussed and which is not discussed here. Yeah? Do you see that? Does the discussion of capitalism of pleasures give one any grounds for proceeding with such a discussion? Yeah, well, then if you have in the one case many Varied pleasures, and in the other case, uh, um, uh, a continuous, very intense pain. Which life would you prefer? And could it not very well be that the virtuous man uh, uh, might have this? It's a very painful disease. And how to make the choice in this case? And uh, what would the man, uh, from the point of view of the calculus of pleasure, the, 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 the sick man, uh, would he know, if he can, could get rid of his sickness by virtue of an abominable action, and, and then live, um, uh, uh, restore his health and live in pleasure. What would be the situation? This is, uh, of course, not discussed. But the immediate reason why he can avoid it is because he replaces justice by health, and therefore a certain disharmony, a certain lack of balance comes in. I beg your pardon. Uh, no, that he he doesn't bring in justice, and instead of it, he brings in health. 
and health has nothing to do with the three other things, at least not necessarily. Um, I mean, a man may be, uh, may be a coward and uh, intemperate and rather senseless and yet have an excellent physique and perfectly healthy. So we were talking about the alcoholic and the problem of uh, why he introduced uh, yeah, the, the alcoholic was not a plate of Zexon, was it? Or, or the thing in Zexon? Uh, uh, I mean, the, the example wasn't, but the, the word, wasn't anything that sort Yeah, that was a certain kind of intemperament. But we, uh, that's, I think, of the other case of a case of a man who is intemperate, uh, but not to the extent that it ruins his health, as would be the case of the alcoholic, but in other ways intemperate. In, uh, in, in intemperance doesn't have to go uh, to the length of alcoholism or something similar. Hmm? I was wondering why he brought him over the economy, why he... Uh, Bitched the economy. Uh, yeah. when, when, he, when he introduced the, the idea of uh, someone that be incontinent, uh, their health might be incontinent as well as the... Uh, as well as the, or the, as well as the Well, that we are speaking now of the healthy life and the diseased life. That's a different case. And the healthy life is obviously, everyone would admit it, superior from the point of view of pleasure to that of disease. And now the question is, cannot a healthy life go together with the vices here mentioned? And then would not a healthy crook a lead a more pleasant life than a decent man living in the most terrible agonies. So that in this case, the virtuous life is not, not uh, pleasant. But of course, uh, what, what the Athenian means is that other things in itself, the mother life is superior. But accidentally, the virtuous life may be unpleasant because of the crucial importance of health, for example. Could be other things, too. Now, shall we read the transition to the, the beginning of the next point? Thus far, we have stated the prelude to our laws. And here, let that statement end. After the prelude must necessarily follow the tune, or rather, to be strictly accurate, a sketch of the state organization. <clears throat> now, just as in the case of a piece of webbing or any other woven article, it is not possible to make both warp and woof of the same material, but the stuff of the warp must be of better quality, for it is for it is strong and, ma and is made firm by its twistings, whereas the, wo the woof is softer and shows a due degree of flexibility. And from this we may see that in some such way we must mark out those who hold high offices in the state and those who are to hold low offices. After applying in each case an adequate educational test for of state organization, there are two divisions, of which the one is the appointment of individuals to office, the other the assignment of laws to the offices. Yeah. Now, is this uh, what he calls here is he wants to speak first about the laws of the political order, the laws of the regime. A modern equivalent would be the constitutional law but that is not quite the same. And as regards, now, there are two kinds of things involved 
in any regime or political order. And the first is the establishment of offices or magistrates, and then the laws which have to be administered or enforced by the magistrates. And the magistrates come first, uh, come first. And that is, Aristotle says the same thing. And regarding the magistracies, he makes a distinction. There must be like the distinction of warp, warp and woof. Uh, there is a, str some, a stronger ingredient, and these are uh, the men who should have uh, occupied the high offices, and the others would be those uh, who have only a little education, um, people who cannot um, occupy no, um, any office to speak of, except perhaps uh, something like dog hatches, so that he will discuss. But it takes a very long time it takes it, uh, until he takes it up. Only in the sixth book does he discuss the magistracies. And the next sentence here is, before all this, one must consider things like the following. And these things like the following take up the rest of book five. What are they? What is a politeia? A regime. The simplest answer is it is an order of the inhabitants of a city. There is a multitude of people live in a city, and they uh, must be and are always in one way or the other ordered. In, with, um, in order of rank. The first question is, who belongs to the citizen body? Who is a citizen and who is not? In other words, the first question is the composition of the citizen body. That is a more fundamental question than the question of the matrices. This he takes up first. But there is one closely linked to that, and that is the question of the, uh, closely linked with the question of the composition of the citizen body, because there are in all societies, I mean, even, even literally all up to the present day, uh, uh, two kinds of people whom one can call, with old-fashioned expressions, the rich and the poor. And that is crucial for the character of the city. What is to be done regarding the rich and the poor, and which has also some subdivisions, what kind of rich and what kind of poor, of course. Now, this is the second question which the Athenian takes up in the rest of Book 5. These questions would be called perhaps today, at least the latter one, a social question. And, but this is, of course, an wholly unplatonic distinction between political and social. It is a political question. But the whole character of the political society depends on how these arrangements are made. And so the first question then is the composition of the citizen body. And that he begins to discuss here. We postpone this detailed discussion of the last time, but for next. What he discusses here would have its uh, contemporary equivalent in immigration laws. 
in in Austra- in Australia, I believe, they spoke in former times, not so long ago. They want to admit only the right kind of settlers, whatever that may mean, and that is the issue which the Athenian raises. What kind of colonists should be admitted, and uh, uh, what should be done about those who are, cannot be admitted? That is the first question. And the second uh, question which comes then up is, the, is, pres- is the question of the rich and the poor. The, the conflicts between the rich and the poor, that the poor want land and want remission of debts, mm-hmm. and the rich say no. They want to have their debts, uh, they want to pay their debtors, they have the debtors pay them the debts, and they want to keep their land. In a new city, uh, they are, we can assume there are not old debts, and the land is distributed from scratch. So these great sources of, of civil unrest uh, will not be there. And so the question arises, what, how shall they distribute the land? But this leads to a previous question. Should the land be distributed at all? And should not the land be owned in common, farmed in common, and should not also be the dwelling places, the dwellings be common? You, you know the teaching of the Republic in this respect, and this is here repeated. Naturally, uh, Plato doesn't quote the Republic, and Kleinias and Megillus cannot presuppose to have read the Republic. This is a minor difficulty here. But still, he repeats that this would be the best solution the absolute communism of the Republic, community of property, women, and children. Uh, But it is said here, this is feasible perhaps among gods and sons of gods, but not in, uh, among the present people who are not sons of gods. And therefore, we must be satisfied with the second best solution. And that would require private property, but in a severely uh, limited way. A division of the land into uh, so and so many plots, and these plus uh, the land plus the dwelling place, and uh, farmed privately, by each part by itself, and the plots must be preserved forever, only one heir, a son, will be admitted. And the question arises, uh, of, naturally, if a man has uh, more children than one, or even female children, who cannot become owners of a plot, because then they cannot be defenders of defenders of the land. And uh, this he will be discussed. The question, yeah, and the, he, this number he explains, 5,040 because it is so eminently useful because it is divisible by all numbers up to 10. And so all kinds of, of divisions, say for tax purposes, for division of the population in armed units, uh, that uh, is uh, easily possible. There is one passage there, if I may ask Mr. Klein, which I do not, cannot answer uh, because of my insufficient knowledge of Greek mathematics or of mathematics in general. In 739, 738a, a, yeah. Uh, he, uh, after he said that this uh, number 5040 is so wonderfully uh, frequently divisible. 
and it has the greatest number of uh, continuous uh, division, meaning by two, by three, by four, by five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then he says, in how many day pass I spanta passes the Thomas Eilishan. What does that mean? The whole number is um, is susceptible of all divisions in all respects. Does it mean the totality of numbers? Or does it mean every number? Yeah, yeah. Because it cannot mean every number because of the prime numbers. Yeah? Uh, so I do not know what it means by that. There is another uh, difficulty here which has something to do with the question of numbers, and that is in 739 uh, uh, D, where he says, such a city, meaning a perfectly communist city, whether gods dwell in it somehow, somewhere, or sons of gods, but more than one. Now, why does he add more than one? Uh, does he emphasize the fact that any city, any community, is a community of at least two people, two beings, does it need emphasis? Uh, the latest commentator of whom I know, and I suppose others before him, uh, just bracket that because I think it is not necessary. I do not know. D, D, D. I don't know. Is there any other point you would like to raise? Do you have a notion? But when a practical political question, in the sense in which you mean it now, is a question arising in a political society already established. This already established political society may be bad, good, or something in between. Is not the most important thing that this established order be good be constructed well. Wise political action presupposes a framework that does not prevent wise political action. And with that he is concerned with the questions which arise, say peace and war, and that is probably the most pressing issue, which arises in a way in which it cannot be anticipated but also others, they have to be dealt with as they arise. The best thing one can do is to take care 
that there is a sufficient number of men available, able to handle political situations well. And that is, that is the meaning of the question of the establishment of magistrates or offices, ruling offices. Plato was aware of this question which you raised in uh, the beginning of the time years. The question is raised, we have now heard a city, a perfect city in speech, but at rest. Now it be, we would like to see it in motion. That is not what Socrates says, but somebody else. But at any rate, that is what you mean, a city in motion. And that means, uh, as appears from the context, at war. Uh, but how the city will conduct itself in war, as regards morale and as regards strategy and whatever else may be important, uh, that depends on how the city is addressed prior to war. And therefore, one has to uh, study that first. In every actual society, there is so much accidental, which of course is, has to be taken for granted when you act in it, but which is irrelevant to the question of excellence. And here, Plato concentrates as much as possible on the question of excellence or and on the most likely conditions of excellence, you know, like the territory and uh, the other questions which we have discussed. The question then remains how you arrive at excellence in but I mean, if he understands the distinction between motion and rest in the way in which parents and is there, yeah, but if it is excellent when at rest, it will also be excellent when in motion. Well, but, I mean, it's somewhat curious that, I mean, it seems to me that that Plato felt that such a state didn't exist. Yes, surely, otherwise he wouldn't have to found it. No. Otherwise he could merely have described a state existing. But of course, even that could not be done without previous proof that some existing state is excellent. Take a man who, like Cicero, who on the basis of Plato, identified the best regime with the Roman regime as, well, as, as it existed prior to the Roman civil wars, let me say. But of course he had to prove that, that this was excellent, yeah? So one cannot start from the given as given one must first show that the given is good. I mean, according to the ordinary view, that is, of course, the great advantage which writers like Thucydides and Machiavelli have, who do not deal with this kind of imagined principalities and republics, but with the real stuff. But the question is whether they are not compelled also to imagine republics and principalities, you know? I mean, for example, how um, Thucydides knows that Athens under Pericles was much better than after Pericles, yeah? on the whole. But that one very short-lived regime, for, uh, which lasted only a few months after Pericles, the 400, and this was the best regime that Athens had during Thucydides' lifetime. So he does raise the question of the best regime, if only in that limited way, the best regime in Athens. But you cannot answer this question. You cannot even raise this question clearly 
without raising the question what is the best regime simply, because there is only an additional limiting factor, the best regime, say, in Athens, presupposes clarity about the best regime simply. This is a simple thought underlying Plato's politics, and I believe it has never been refuted. Um, it does not mean that Plato's answer is the last word, but the question. Well, see, but the, the problem in a certain sense to me seems to be that, well, at least in the Republic, it's, it's a, I think, a question as to whether or not the best regime can be actualized. And if we are to understand that the laws is a practical guide, or more practical guide to political life, uh, fact that it too begins with a, with a regime in theory and a new regime uh, introduces that question anew whether it can be actualized. Yeah, sure, even, surely even that is rests on conditions, but not on such very unlikely conditions as a republic. There the key condition was philosophers become kings an expulsion of everyone older than 10. And nothing of this kind happens here, so it's much easier. It's difficult enough, nevertheless, as Plato knew. The only external guarantee we have is that Megillus and Kleinias are likely to be much more practical than Glaucon and Adamantus. So that if the Athenian had stated to them something which was is absolutely preposterous, politically speaking, they would not have gone along. And they would not have had such a respect for the Athenian as they show very frequently. Shall we leave it at that for the time being? Good. Then let us turn to the uh, fifth book. Uh, where we left off. Uh, and now, after having completed the prelude to the laws, it begins with the laws. And first, with the laws regarding the regime. And here he makes a distinction. There are two classes of things involved in the regime. First is the establishment of the ruling officers, and the second, the laws given to the ruling officers for enforcement and for their guidance. The so ruling officers come first. That is not the same as a distinction between constitutional law and ordinary law, as we know it, but rather a distinction between the whole governmental setup and the laws. So if you had in the Constitution a detailed a statement about how many secretaries, cabinet ministers, and all this kind of thing, if, and a little bit more even than that, then you would have a modern analog on of that. But then he says that this something else must be discussed first, prior to everything else. And this is the composition of the citizen body and the question of the rich and poor. And the reason can be stated more simply in the words of Aristotle, the regime is a certain order of the inhabitants of the city. And the most elementary distinction within the inhabitants of the city is that between citizens and non-citizens. Therefore, we have to know who is to be a citizen. More generally, it's the composition of the citizen body. And in this respect, the question of the rich and poor is of decisive importance, and therefore we must raise the question of the rich and the poor. And in this way, he begins where we left off. And uh, Mr. Gary, do you have it? Can you read it? Before we deal with these matters, we must observe the following. 
In dealing with a flock of any kind, the shepherd or cowherd or the keeper of horses or any such animal, will never attempt to look after it until he has first applied to each group of animals the appropriate herd, which is to separate the sound from the unsound and the well-bred from the ill-bred, and to send off the latter to other herds while keeping the former under his own care. For he reckons that his labor would be fruitless and unending if it were spent on bodies and souls which nature and ill-nurture have combined to ruin, and which themselves bring ruin on a stock that is sound and clean both in habit and in body. Whatever class of beast, unless a thorough purge be made in the existing herd, this is a matter of minor importance in the case of other animals and deserves mention only by way of illustration. But in the case of man, it is of the highest importance for the lawgiver to search out and to declare what is proper for each class, both as regards purging out and all other modes of treatment. Yeah, yeah, I don't know whether it means each class, whether it means for each. Yes? For instance, in respect of civic purgings, this would be the way of the many... Uh, how does he translate that, purgings? Civic. Purges. Civic purging. Yeah, purging. This would be the way of the many possible modes of purging, some are milder, some more severe. Those that are severest and best, a lawgiver who is also a despot might be able to effect. Despot means always tyrant, yeah. But a lawgiver without despotic power might be well content if, in establishing a new polity and laws, he could effect even the mildest of purgations. The best purge is painful, like all medicines of drastic nature. The purge which hails to punishments by means of justice linked with vengeance, crowning the vengeance with exile or death, it, as a rule, clears out the greatest criminals when they are incurable and cause serious damage to the state. A mild form of purge... No, let us first discuss that for one moment. First he speaks of a case of a legislator who is at the same time a tyrant. And he can use the best kind of purge, which best kind is at the same time painful. Now, on an earlier occasion, he had spoken, addressing the legislator, uh, the absent legislator, and the absent legislator had replied, we would get the best arrangement in the easiest and best way the easiest and best way, if the legislator has the support of a tyrant. Now here, the legislator was separated from the tyrant. But still, one point we must first make clear, these procedures are easy from the point of view of the legislator. They are painful from the point of view of the individuals who suffer from these easy measures. That, I believe, is not difficult to understand. The question is, why does he speak here of the legislator who is at the same time a tyrant, whereas before he had spoken of a legislator who has the support of a tyrant? What would you suggest? I beg your pardon? Unless he's suggesting that he's speaking of a, uh, a tyrant who is a democratic tyrant of sorts, the tyrant of the orator. He didn't call him a tyrant. No, I mean, I, I mean, he, he isn't, but. Perhaps he's referring to, to that. Well, the simplest answer, which is perhaps not sufficient, would be this. At that time, he said, the, the absent legislator said, 
give me a city ruled by a tyrant. Now, he, but here we do not yet have a city, and therefore it cannot be a city ruled by a tyrant. Yeah? But there is probably also this implied, that if the legislator and the tyrant, if supreme wisdom and supreme political power are not united in the same human being or human beings, you will not get the best regime. A statement made before in the fourth book. Yes. But at any rate, it is clear, I believe, what he means by the best, if painful, ways in which a purge could be made. The purge is, of course, a very ominous sound, in our age, a slightly less ominous sound it had in the 17th century, when, what was this English colonel who, who purged the house? Pride's purge. Colonel Pride, Pride's purge. But that was a very mild thing, he just did not admit certain members of parliament and nothing else was done on that occasion. Here the term has partly the cultic and partly the medical meaning. Purging, purgation. And now we come to the more gentle. A milder form of purge is one of the following kind. When, owing to scarcity of food, people are in want and display a readiness to follow their leaders in attack on the property of the wealthy, then, the lawgiver, regarding all such as a plague inherent in the body politic, ships them abroad as gently as possible, giving the euphemistic title of emigration to their evacuation. By some means or other, this must be done by every legislator at the beginning. Yeah, now, let, now one moment, let us consider this milder matter. The milder matter of Perch is to send out he doesn't say now those corrupt in body and soul, but the have-nots who are under their leaders prepare to attack the haves. So it seems that these nasty people are as undesirable as those corrupt in body and soul. Whether that, that was their fault or the fault of what they call now society. That's a question which is not a practical question and therefore not raised by Plato. At any rate, uh, yes, this is... Uh, it, 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 of course, uh, this makes one wonder whether the present colony which is sent out by the Cretans is not such a colony. You know, not like the colonies exactly as a, as a penal colonies, which became later on flourishing uh, parts of the British Commonwealth. Uh, but this kind, the excess, uh, not have not in the ship to another place where they can do no harm. Yes. By some means or other, this must be done by every legislator at the beginning. But in our case, the task is now even more simple. We have no need to contrive for the present either a form of emigration or any other purgative selection. But just as when there is a confluence of floods from many sources, some from springs, some from torrents, into a single pool, we have to take diligent precautions to ensure that the water may be to the utmost possible purity by drawing it off, in some cases, and in others by making channels to divert its course. Which is not very revealing, because it is purely metaphoric, and we do not know what the political equivalents of these things are. But he gives now a reason, I think, also for this somewhat evasive speech. Yes. Yet toil and risk, it would appear, are involved in every exercise of statecraft. Since, however, our present efforts are verbal rather than actual, 
let us assume that our collection of citizens is now complete and its purity is secured to our satisfaction. For we shall test thoroughly by every kind of test and by length of time the vicious among those who attempt to enter our present state as citizens, and so prevent their arrival, whereas we shall welcome the virtuous with all possible graciousness and goodwill. Yeah, it is clear that if he can persuade them, the undesirable ones, to stay away, we will do that. And the good ones we will heartily welcome. So the Athenian is obviously a very humane man, but as we have also seen, he is not completely blind to the tough side of politics. And what is the general lesson is, of course, there must be a certain sifting of the citizen body at the beginning of political society. What can be done in this way later on, when the city is established, that's a long matter, but then you have arrangements regarding punishment and rewards, which is a kind of sifting, you know? There is even the loss of citizenship, possibly, for particularly bad crimes. So that was the first issue, the composition of the citizen body. And now we come to the other question with which he deals at much greater length. And let us not admit to know that this piece is good luck, that just as we said that the colony of the Heraclitae was fortunate in avoiding fierce and dangerous strife concerning the distribution of land and money and the cancelling of debts, so we are similarly lucky. For when a state is obliged to settle such strife by law, it can neither leave vested interests unaltered, nor yet can it in any wise alter them, and no way is left save what one might term that of pious aspiration and a cautious change, little by little, extended over a long period. And that way is this. There must already exist a supply of men to effect the change, who themselves, on each occasion, possess abundance of land and have many persons in their debt, and who are kind enough to wish to give a share of these things to those of them who are in want, partly by remissions and partly by distributions, making a kind of rule of moderation and believing that poverty consists not in decreasing one's substance, but in increasing one's greed. Yes. So uh, the question is here, yeah, that uh, corresponds to the issues we know now today from domestic politics, uh, say, um, under the headings, the problem of welfare and everything else, unemployment and whatever goes with that. Here are the key issues, debts and landlessness. And then the have-nots demand distribution of land and the mission of debts. There are certain places on the globe in which these things still are major political demands. You know? Agrarian reform is called. And, and now Plato gives his answer to this question. This can work only if the decent men among the haves take the initiative. And they, from a sense of decency and moderation, distribute part of the land and remit the debts. Yes. Sir. Yes. Um, Makes a comment on the relation of this solution to the problem of have nots compared to the solution just offered under the heading of the mild form of purge. Yeah, but here the question was they have have nots led by demagogues. And that is something very bad from Plato's point of view. For however critical he is of the, of the wealthy, he is more opposed to demagogues. That will come out clearer in the sequel. He has a certain bias in favor a certain very mild bias in favor of the wealthy, and that's the reason why Aristotle 
accuses him, with special regard to the laws, of oligarchic tendencies, you know, oligarchic, as to say, plutocratic tendencies. There is an element of truth in that, as we will see, and as we have in a way already seen. Yes? For this is the main foundation of the security of a state, and on this, as on a firm keel, it is possible to build whatever kind of civic organization may be subsequently built suitable for the arrangement described. But if the foundation be rotten, the subsequent political operations will prove by no means easy for any state. This difficulty, as we say, we avoid. It is better, however, that we should explain the means by which, if we had not actually avoided it, we might have found a way of escape. Be it explained, then, that that means consists in renouncing avarice by the aid of justice, and that there is no way of escape. Yeah, I mean, it is stronger, I believe, and not to do lot money even within the bounds of justice. I think that is the meaning. In other words, avarice, as he translates, that is altogether bad. Yeah. Yes. I mean, even if avarice goes together with honesty. Yes? Yeah? And that there is no way of escape, broad or narrow, other than this device. So let this stand fixed for us now as a kind of pillar of the state. The properties of the citizens must be established somehow or other on the basis that is secure from intestine disputes. Yeah, and it cannot be called into question because otherwise you will have troubles all the time. Yeah. Otherwise, for people who have ancient disputes with one another, men will not of their own free will proceed any farther in political construction if they have a grain of sense. But as for those to whom, as to us now, God has given a new state to found, and one free as yet from internal views, that those founders should excite enmity against themselves because of the distribution of land and houses would be a piece of folly combined with utter depravity of which no man could be capable. Yeah. So that, I think, is clear. I mean, if you have... Uh, an inher inherited trouble of this kind, then it's bad enough. But if you can start from scratch and introduce these troubles, then you are the lowest and most despicable kind of legislator. That seems obvious. Yeah. Uh, what then would be the plan of a right distribution? First, we must fix up the right total, the number of citizens. Next, we must agree about the distribution of them, and to how many sections, and each of what size they are to be divided. And among these sections, we must distribute as equally as we can both the land and the houses. An adequate figure for the population could not be given without reference to the territory and to the neighboring states. Of land, we need as much as is capable of supporting so many inhabitants of temperate habits, and we need no more. And as to population, we need a number such that they will be able to defend themselves against injury from adjoining peoples, and capable also of lending some aid to their neighbors when injured. These matters we shall determine, both verbally and actually, when we have inspected the territory and its neighbors. But for the present, it is only a sketch, an outline of our legislation, that our argument will now proceed to complete. The, the two points of view, the two points to be considered are and then the land and the neighbor. And then we can say, we can determine on that basis the number of citizens the city could best have. Citizens who live um, temperately, moderately, that's to say neither in luxury nor in penury. And 
But this cannot be determined without prior inspection of the territory and the neighbors, and therefore he can give only a, an outline which will have to be revised on the basis of the inspection after that had been made. And now he comes to the provisional proposal, the most reasonable proposal, if it is feasible. Yes. Let us assume that there are, as a suitable number, 5,040 men to be landholders and to defend their plots. And let the land and the houses be likewise divided into the same number of parts, the man and his allotment forming together one division. First, let the whole number be divided into two, next into three, then follow, then follow in natural order four and five, and so on up to ten. Regarding numbers, every man who is making laws must understand at least thus much what number and what kind of number will be most useful for all states. Let us choose that which contains the most numerous and most consecutive subdivisions. Number as a whole comprises every division for all purposes, whereas the number 5,040 for purposes of war and in peace for all purposes connected with contributions and distributions will admit of division into no more than 59 sections, these being consecutive from one up to 10. Yeah. So that is, is the number 5,040 5, is chosen, of course, it is a decidable size of the citizen body, but also it is so wonderfully divisible in, as it is, surely by all numbers up to 10, and all together in 59 ways. Mr. Mann was so good to, to check on it, and this is correct, isn't it? Yes, yeah. including one. Including one, yeah. This is for all kinds of purposes, of peace and war, very useful. Yeah. And we will find later on some proofs of that. Yes. So, 5,040 lots or plots and 5,040 citizens, let us say, for the time being. And these are, of course, people who must be able to defend their land, it is implied. Yeah. Owning a land and being a defender of the land are here understood to be inseparable. It's a question which arises when a man is too old for military service, is here not yet discussed, but it is clear. His son will, or son-in-law, whatever the, whatever situation may be, will have to be defender. Yeah. These facts about numbers must be grasped firmly and with deliberate attention by those who are appointed by law to grasp them. They are exactly as we have stated them, and the reason for stating them when founding a state is this. You know, that is uh, important. The reason for stating them has not been stated yet. That will be stated now. Yes? In respect of gods and shrines and the temples which have to be set up for the various gods in the state, and the gods and demons they are to be named after, no man of sense, whether he be framing a new state or reforming an old one that has been corrupted, will attempt to alter the advice from Delphi or Dodona or Amos or that of the ancient sayings, whatever form they take whether derived from visions or from some reported inspiration from heaven. By this advice, they instituted sacrifices combined with rites, either of native origin or imported from Tuscany or Cyprus or elsewhere. And by means of such sayings, they sanctified oracles and statues and 
altars and temples and marked off for each of them sacred leaves. Yes, the legislator, the new city, is of course under no circumstances a founder of religion. That is clear. He simply accepts the established religion, whether domestic or foreign. It may, be, may have been borrowed from the Tuscans or from any other place. It doesn't make any difference, provided it is accepted in the community. But what has this to do with the question of the division of the land? That question has not been answered. It will be answered in the city. Yes. Nothing of all these should no longer be altered in the slightest degree. To each section, he should assign a god or deity, or at the least a hero. And in the distribution of the land, he should assign first to these divinities choice domains, with all that pertains to them, so that when assemblies of each of the sections take place at the appointed time, they may provide an ample supply of things requisite, and the people may fraternize with one another at the sacrifices and gain knowledge and intimacy, since nothing is of more benefit to the state than this mutual acquaintance. Yes, so he speaks here of the sections of the city, not of the city as a whole. And regarding the section, it seems the legislator has a greater freedom. He can appoint either a god or a demon or even some heroes as a eponymous, as a, as a being which gives its name to the tribe. Now, if we assume that there are 12 tribes, as a later sense it would be, then there would be 420 landholders in each tribe. And that is quite a large number of people for being able to know one another very well. If you take the whole city, 5,040, they cannot know each other well. The maximum of what is possible is that every citizen of a police knows an acquaintance of everyone else. I mean, if everyone knows everyone else reasonably well, that's a village. But the village is too small. In a city, it is enough if there is some indirect knowledge, namely, then you can ask others who know him and others whom you know and get some, some kind of knowledge. And why this knowledge is so important is stated in the sequence. Yeah. For when men conceal their ways one from another in darkness rather than light, there no man will ever rightly gain either his due honor or office or the justice that is befitting. Wherefore every man in every state must above all things endeavor to show himself always true and sincere towards everyone, and no humbug, and also to allow himself to be imposed upon by no such person. Here. Yeah. So that is this high degree of mutual knowledge, everyone an open book for everybody else, presupposes a small society. And that is, in this case, it will be 420 people, and who uh, will not only be on their farms, but they will meet at periodic festivals, and which will increase their acquaintance and hopefully their friendship. Yes. The next move in our settling of the laws is one that might at first hearing cause surprise because of its unusual character. Like the move of a drugs player who quits his sacred line. You know, that is very... So what comes now is... Um, first he had said we must stick very strictly to the old established sacred. And now he suddenly suggests a deviation from the sacred line. And the sacred line is here, as you will see immediately, the best regime. Now, why does he do that? 
Yes. Begin the paragraph. Yeah. The, the next move in our settling of the laws is one that might, at first hearing, cause surprise because of its unusual character, like the move of a drugs player who quits his sacred line. Nonetheless, it will be clear to him who reasons it out and who uses experience that a state will probably have a constitution no higher than second in point of excellence. Probably one might refuse to accept this owing to unfamiliarity with lawgivers who are not also despots. But it is, in fact, the most correct plan to describe the best quality and the second best and the third, and after describing them, to give the choice to the individual who is charged with the foundation of a set of a settlement. This plan let us now adopt. Let us state the qualities which rank first, second, and third in excellence. And the choice let us hand over to Kleinus and to whosoever else may at any time wish, in proceeding to the selection of such things, to take over, according to his own disposition, what he values in his own country. So, in other words, the intelligent legislator, even if he has to no chance except to establish a rather mediocre regime, <coughs> must know the best regime, because otherwise he does not know what he is doing. You see that one that refers to your question at the beginning, and therefore we must we must do he make his choice with his eyes open. And therefore, it must be made clear what the best regime is, and then what the second best regime is, at least. And the third, that we can easily figure out on the basis of the difference between the first and the second. Yes. The state and quality come first, and those laws are best where it is observed as carefully as possible throughout the whole state, the old saying that friends have all things in common. As to this condition, whether it exists anywhere now, or ever will exist, in which there is a community of wives, children, and all chattels, and all that is called private, is everywhere and by every means rooted out of our life. And so far as possible... No, wait, first one. And, and by every device, the so-called private is from all sides are taken out of life completely. The so-called private, that is what is by convention private, by law private, whatever that may be apart from possessions. Yes? And it is Contrivance have been made, go on. And so far as possible, it is contrived that even things naturally private have become, in a way, communized. Eyes, for instance, and ears and hands seem to see, hear, and act in common. And that all men are, so far as possible, unanimous in the praise and blame they bestow, rejoicing and grieving at the same things, and that they honor with all their heart those laws which render the state as unified as possible. No one will ever lay down another definition that is truer or better than these conditions in point of super excellence. So we know now, at least in the roughest outline, what the best regime is, as complete as possible communism of possessions, women, children, and even in the limits of the possible of what is by nature private. And by nature private, that is, as is here indicated, in the Republic it is said explicitly, the body. The body is the private. And that, now, the body cannot, strictly speaking, Communize. No one can feel one's toothache as oneself.
fields. And yet, the maximum in this direction should be established. Pleasures and pains should be the same for all. The distinction between natural pleasures and pleasures which derive from others knowing of them, which we came across, a distinction um, which we came across last time, that is of course completely out. All pleasures and pains should be as much as possible and be common. Body is a private. But he had said earlier, the soul is the most familiar, the most what a man's own. How does this go together? Is the soul not more one's own than the body? For instance, at least parts of the body. A man can easily lose without a change in his soul, but he cannot lose a part of his soul without ceasing to be the same man. So uh, one's own and private, these are two different considerations. The opposite of the private is the public. The opposite of one's own is the alien, what, the, what does not belong to oneself. These are two very different distinctions. The soul is not the same as what is now called the self, because the self, that's to say the man himself, that is of course the soul and the body, the soul in the body, as Plato indicates very simply, by beginning his dialogue on the immortality of the soul, or having it begin, the speaker, is it a Socrates of Phaedon, I do not know the moment, saying, yourself were present at the last conversation of Socrates, or have you heard it from someone else? Myself. And this means, of course, bodily presence. This is a very dark thing, but one thing one can, I believe, see. Thought is essentially not private, but public, because it is concerned with the truth, which is common. Accidentally, thoughts may, of course, be private, because they contradict the opinions praised by the law and so on. But as such, thoughts are common. The body is the seat of privacy. In the Middle Ages they said that matter is the principle of individuation. And that I think is based on this. But it is hard for us to understand. And there is something in us which rebels against it, I believe. Yeah? that our most intimate things should not be the by nature private, but rather the body. But I believe that Plato implies these most intimate things are bound up with the body, and therefore they are as private as the body are for the, for the reasons that they are bound up with the body. Well, let us and perhaps end this paragraph before we go on with the discussion. Such a state. Such a, let's say, the absolute, absolutely communist city, yes? Be it gods or sons of God that dwell in it, they dwell pleasantly, living such a life as this. Wherefore, one should not look elsewhere for a model constitution, but hold fast to this one, and with all one's power seek the constitution that is as like to it as possible. You remember on an earlier occasion, in 713 or 14, he said that what we must take our bearings is a, by is the age of Kronos. 
That means a life of obedience to gods or demons. Here we must ask to take our bearings by the divine life itself, not by obedience, but by imitation, which is a very different thing. Yes. That constitution which we are now engaged upon, if it came into being, would be very near to, Im to immortality and would come second in point of merit. The third we have, we, the third we shall investigate hereafter, if God so will. For the present, however, what is this second best polity, and how would it? come to be of such a character. Yeah. Now the second best we can say is the regime on which the Athenian and Kleinias will agree. But Kleinias is only one of ten men commissioned. And Kleinias has to clear his project with his fellow commissioners. And one could say that the most desirable compromise between Kleinias' project, or the Athenians' project, and what the other men commissioned to frame the laws will agree upon is the third person. That's the simplest solution, I think. Mr. Blanc? is very true. So one's own par excellence is the public. To oikayotaton, the most one's own, is the good, as is said in the license. That's, that is, of course, what better. But there is nothing private about that, except accidentally. And then, of course, this accidental is always very important practically, and hence also here. But in itself, it is public. Yeah, well, I mean, if one moves up the lower level, yes. there seems to be a tremendous confusion, say now, in, uh, well, uh, say, take a, uh, a low problem, the problem of pornography. Yeah. Yeah, you sure. Yeah, but that is, as you say, on a lower level of uh, abstraction. Yeah. There are certain things which are by nature not fit to be displayed. Yeah? And in this sense, by nature, private. But there's an other distinction on here, although it is connected with it. And just in the case we discussed last time, what was called vanity, is also to the point. Yeah? The display of certain feelings of self-complacence is also unbecoming, while the feeling itself is, under certain conditions, inevitable. Just as it, it is in its way as indecent as to 
have one's excretions in public. Yeah? Everyone knows that everyone who uh, takes food in must uh, give it out again. Uh, and uh, we can, every bio biographer uh, describing the life of the greatest hero can assume that this always took place in that grand life. And yet, uh, it is, of course, utterly irrelevant. That is absolutely private. We would have to make a distinction between what ought to be private even if there is no communist society. Yeah? Oh, no, I'm sorry. What ought to be private in a non-communist society? And that, uh, surely, these kind of things would uh, play a very great role in them. Yeah, yeah, even in the community. Yes, I swear. Because even there it would be unbearable, I think. Mm -hmm. So we know now what we have to do. We know what the best regime is, and that is beyond human possibilities. Only gods or sons of gods could inhabit such a city. And therefore, we must have a non communist society. And that means, of course, on the most visible level, private property. And that will be demanded next. First, out the land and No, only one thing, I believe, which I mentioned last time, but I think it bears repeating. We are too much inclined when we read that. To know, of course, this is a reference of the old Plato to the Republic, which he wrote at a much earlier age. But we have read the Republic. But it must also make sense in the context. Kleinias and Megillos, who have not read the Republic. And the Athenian regards it as necessary to tell them this extreme thing, which he insists is the best, but indeed too good for human beings. Yes. First, let them portion out the land and the houses, and not farm in the house, since such a course is beyond the capacity of people. With the birth, rearing, and training, we assume. And let the apportionment be made with this intention. But the man who receives the portion should still regard it as common property of the whole state, and should tend the land, which is his fatherland more diligently than a mother tends her children, inasmuch as it, being a goddess, is mistress over its mortal population. And in other words, it is not his absolute property, uh, his plot. And this means somewhat more than the right of eminent domain, which uh, the state preserves also according to modern doctrine. Yes? and should observe the same attitude also toward the local gods and demons. And in order that these things may remain in this state forever, these further rules must be observed. The number of parts, as now appointed by us, must remain unchanged and must never become either more or less. Yeah. This will be securely effected in the case of every state in the following way. The allotment holder shall always leave behind him one son, whichever he pleases, as the inheritor of his dwelling, to be his successor in the tendency of the de deified ancestor, both of the family and of the state, whether living or already deceased. As to the rest of the children, when a man has more than one, he should marry off the females according to the law that is to be ordained. And the males he should dispose of to such of the citizens as have no male issue by a friendly arrangement, if possible. But where such arrangements prove insufficient, or where the family is too large, either in females or in males, or where, on the other hand, it is, on the other hand, it is too small through the occurrence of sterility, 
In all these cases, the magistrates, whom we shall appoint as the highest and most distinguished, shall consider how to deal with the excess or deficiency in families and contrive means as best they can to secure that the 5,040 households shall remain unaltered. There are many contrivances possible where the fertility is great. There are met methods of inhibition, and contrarywise, there are methods of encouraging and stimulating the birth rate by means of honors and dishonors, and by admonitions addressed by the old to the young, which are capable in all ways of producing the required effect. Moreover, as a final step, in case we are in absolute desperation about the unequal condition of our 5,040 households, and are faced with a superabundance of citizens, owing to the mutual affection of those who cohabit with one another, which drives us to despair, there still remains that ancient device which we have often mentioned, namely the sending forth in friendly wise from a friendly nation of colonies consisting of such people as are deemed suitable. On the other hand, should a state ever be attacked by a deluging wave of disease or ruinous wars, and the houses fall much below the appointed number through bereavements, we ought not of our own free will to introduce new citizens trained with a bastard training, but necessity as the problem runs. Not even God himself can compel. Yeah. So uh, that is clear the excess population should be sent into colonies and the deficient population should be replenished must be replenished, undesirable as that is, by immigrants who have a bastard education, that's to say who are not truly fit to become members of that city, but with necessity, even a god is unable to fight. What did you want to say? Uh, I just wondered, he left the uh, decision as to which son should inherit the property. Arab. It's left to the father, yeah. What? It's left to the father. Right. Um, I wonder if there was any tradition of primogeniture in the Greek society, because it would, it would seem that leaving it up to the father could set the basis for disruption in the family. Yeah, but on the other the hand, but on the other hand, one has to, um, primogeniture is not uh, a guarantee of the best succession, is it? I mean, but it eliminates that kind of competition. Yes, but then the consequence would also be that you would have, on the highest level, hereditary monarchy. And we have already learned that Plato was against that, you know. There was no, Plato had no sympathy for that, for the rights going simply by inheritance. And you, have, you have to interject some reason somewhere. Surely the father can act arbitrarily, but the chances are that he will uh, pick that son who will be most able to preserve the family property, you know, and all the obligations going with that. And that is surely implied. I was, I was referring more to the effect on children rather than fathers who are sent. That? I was referring more to the effect on the children, on the sons. Yeah. Now, well, the, the, the son is uh, who gets the estate may be improved by the father's choice. Well, I was talking about the sons competing with each other for the father's favors. Yeah, well, if the, fa the father would uh, can be presumed to see through that, there are various devices. He can postpone the decision. I can change a will. I, I, we have not yet come to that section. But at any rate, the point is clear. No primogeniture. That's clear. Yes. But it doesn't completely eliminate hereditary monarchy, would it? I mean, it still is primarily within the family. You mean the gains, the clan to which the monarch belongs, would still remain the monarch? Only 
the other the reigning monarch or some council of elders would pick the successor, not necessarily the oldest son. Well, in Sparta, they had something of this kind. Yeah. But would be from the king's family, would be, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. No, they had something. That was the way in which Agesilaus became king, because the other, his competitor, Agesilaus was limping. And there was an oracle that if you have a limping kingship, that is the end of Sparta. And then, of course, that spoke against Agesilaus. But the competitor was suspected to be the son of Alcibiades, who had an affair with the queen of Sparta, and that lady was said to have called the boy little Alcibiades. In other words, that he was a bastard. And then there was a decision by the, uh, by the Council of Elders that the claim of Agesilaus was less, less questionable than that of this other fellow, I believe, Ag Agesilaus. I forgot his name. And therefore, Agesilaus became king. Sure, he became him. But here is another point which I thought is quite interesting. This is what should be done in the case of over and under population. I read to you what Hobbes has to say on that subject in the 30th chapter of the Leviathan. The multitude of poor and yet strong people still increasing. They are to be transplanted into countries not sufficiently inhabited, where nevertheless they are not to exterminate those they find there but constrain them to inhabit closer together and not to range a great deal of ground to snatch what they find, the Red Indians, but to court each little plot with art and labor to give them their sustenance in due season. And when all the world is overcharged with inhabitants, then the last remedy of all is war which provideth for every man by victory or death. Now, Plato's statement is somehow different from Hobbes's. And Hobbes doesn't speak here of a war. On the other hand, he doesn't uh, reveal any particular concern for aborigines, as Hobbes said As the aborigines would be barbarians from Plato's point of view, and as it is said in the Republic, these are the natural enemies of the Greeks. So there would be no, um, not the kind of inhibitions which, strangely, for those who do not know Hobbes, Hobbes had. Yeah. And now. Well, preaching of continents uh, being probably in, insufficient, yeah? yes. uh, there must be some kind of abortion. I do not remember now whether Plato speaks in the laws explicitly of abortion. Aristotle does. Early abortion, uh, you know, before the child is presumed to have any sense, any feeling, is allowed, according to Aristotle. And as I don't see any reason or principle why Plato should decide differently. But I don't know. Let it, I haven't looked up. Yeah, that I think that he must mean that. And perhaps also other, there can also be other uh, difficulties. For example, how shall I say, strict separation of dormitories, if you understand what I mean, and other obstacles which can be can be made to prevent too great fertility. Yeah? Mm. Good. And now let us read the next speech. Let us then suppose that our present discourse gives the following advice. 
My most excellent... Yeah, now that, listen, that is uh, something very strange. The now said logos, I mean, logos in me proceeding, should now give advice, should make now a monetary speech. Yes? My most excellent friend, be not slack to pay honor as nature ordained to similarity and equality and identity and congruity in respect of number and of every influence productive of things fair and good. Above all, now, in the first place, guard throughout your lives the number stated. In the next place, dishonor not the due measure of the height and magnitude of your substance as originally apportioned by buying and selling one to another. Otherwise, neither will the apportioning lot, which is divine, fight on your side. Now let us stop it. Up to this point, he had always spoken in the second person plural, and he stops that now. So the exhortation does not necessarily go beyond this point. Now, an exhortation and monetary speech, that would seem to be a prelude. And that would be very strange if we had first the, uh, the law and then the prelude. The word law occurred, did not occur in the preceding section, but it occurs in, in the sequel. And also he hadn't spoken of punishment in the preceding section, and he speaks of punishment in the sequel. So the relation of the preceding speech to the present admonition is not that of a prelude to law, must be different. Now, what can be the relation? I believe it is this. This admonition is addressed to the citizen, citizenry. And the, by as the previous speech was addressed to the legislator or founder, Kleinias in the first place, or any other legislator founder. And this speech about the distribution of the land and the number of plots, the preservation of plots, this was linked up with the introductory remark, as this is only the second best solution. And this is not fit for the citizenry. If they are told the order under which they live is only second best, this is upsetting and in no way enlightening for them. And therefore, it is a fittingly addressed to the legislator founder and not fittingly addressed to the citizenry at large. Yes? Where you stop? For now, in the first place, the law lays on the disobedient this injunction. Since it has given warning that whoso will should take or refuse an allotment on the understanding that First, the land is sacred to all the gods, and further, that prayers shall be made at the first, second, and third sacrifices by the priests and priestesses. Therefore, the man who buys or sells the house plot or land plot allotted to him must suffer the penalty attached to this sin. The officials shall inscribe on tablets of cypress wood written records for future reference and shall place them in the shrine. Furthermore, they shall place the charge of the execution of these matters in the hands of that magistrate who is deemed to be most keen of vision, in order that all breaches of these rules may be brought to their notice, and that they may punish the man who disobeys both the law and the God. How great a blessing the ordinance now describes when the appropriate organization accompanies it, proves to all the states that obey it, that is, that is a thing, which as the old proverb says, none that is evil shall know, but only he that has become experienced and practiced in virtuous habits. 
For in the organization described, there exists no excess of money making, and it involves the condition that no faculty, no facility, should or can be given to anyone to make money by means of any illiberal trade, inasmuch as what is called contemptible vulgarity perverts a liberal character, and also that no one should ever claim to heap up riches from any such source. Furthermore, yeah, that is, I mean, that is a new, uh, the additional law which is now made, you know, that no citizen may engage in vulgar trade, and that was, uh, of course, also in Sparta, but not in democratic Athens, and it was also in other in aristocratic cities like Thebes in, her demo, in the aristocratic time. And the plot cannot be sold, no plot can be sold or bought. That was also mentioned, yes. Furthermore, upon all this, there follows also a law which forbids any private person to possess any gold or silver, only coined for purposes of such daily exchange as it is almost necessary for craftsmen to make use of. And all who need such things can pay wages to hirelings, whether slaves or immigrants. For these reasons, we say that our people should possess coined money, which is legal tender among themselves, but valueless elsewhere. As regards the universal Hellenic coinage, for the sake of expeditions and foreign visits, as well as of embassies or any other mission necessary for the state, if there be need to send someone abroad for such objects as these, it is necessary that the state should always possess Hellenic money. But if yeah, let us stop it and skip that because uh, that is not. Here there comes a more urgent passage a little bit later in 743. And since this is so, I would never concede to them that the rich man is really happy if he is not also good. While if a man is superlatively good, it is impossible that he should be also superlatively rich. Why so? It may be asked. Because we would reply, the gain derived from both right and wrong is more than double that from right alone, whereas the expenditure of those who refuse to spend, either nobly or ignobly, is only half of the expenditure of those who are noble and like spending on noble objects. Consequently, the wealth of men who double their gains and have their expenditure will never be exceeded by the men whose procedure in both respects is just the opposite. Now, of these men, one is good and the other not, and the other not bad, so long as he is niggardly, but utterly bad when he is not niggardly, and, as we have just said, at no time good. For while the one man, since he takes both justly and unjustly, and spends neither justly nor unjustly, is rich, and the utterly bad man, being lavish as a rule, is very poor. The other man, who spends on noble objects and gains by just means only, is never likely to become either superlatively rich or extremely poor. Accordingly, what we have stated is true, that the very rich are not good, and not being good, neither are they happy. Yeah, so this is... But we must consider this figuring out. The bad man uses fair means or foul, and hence he acquires twice as much as a good man who uses only fair means. Secondly, the good man spends money nobly for noble purposes. But the bad man doesn't spend money for either noble or ignoble purposes. Therefore, he saves twice as much. So, since he acquires twice as much and saves twice as much, he will become much richer 
than the, the, good, than the good or just one. There are some intermediate complications, and that is a, a man who is just in acquiring, but stingy in spending. This is one case which is not discussed, and also the case of the man who is just in acquiring and stingy in spending. Which of the two is likely to be... No, the, no uh, excuse me. The unjust and liberal man, on the one hand, and the just and stingy man on the other. Which of the two is more likely to be richer than the other? The question is not raised, let alone answered, and it complicates the situation a bit. And, of course, there is no question of a, the supremely just man who lives in thousandfold poverty, like Socrates. That is also not discussed, and this has nothing to do. Um, it's hard to, to fit him in here. Although Socrates is, one can say, the uh, prefiguration of the ruler in the best regime, and we must surely think of him. At any rate, the stingy man is assigned a higher place than the wastrel. This is not surprising. That has nothing to do with what they now call Protestant ethics or so, with which Plato had nothing to do but simple common sense. I mean, the man who is a, can at least control his lower desires for the sake of preserving and increasing his wealth is better than the completely dissolute man. And in the Republic, in the eighth book, where he discusses the oligarchic and democratic man, that is explicitly stated. And so that is, uh, uh, shows an interesting moral implication of the um, admission of wealth, of private wealth, which has um, been uh, done here, uh, has been affected here. Yes. Yeah, I think we won't be able to get beyond that today. So. Uh, but I hope we will finish our reading of the fifth book next time, and perhaps we can begin with the sixth book.